All right, so in this stream, we are going to get a, a full Windows guest running inside of um, our chocolate milk uh, hypervisor kernel bootloader, whatever you want to call it. So to get this to work, we're going to need to implement EPT, which is extended page tables. That allows us to basically isolate the guest physical memory from our host physical memory. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, honestly, we should right now. Do, do. Any good recipes lately? Oh, I made steaks today, and my steaks are fucking fire, dude. My steaks are so unbelievably fucking good. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just next level. It's insane, man. Alex, uh... okay, we've got. We're gonna have physical memory here. This is physical memory. This is a host physical memory. We'll zoom in a bit so that's readable for y'all. Okay, so what we what we're typically used to when we're running on an x86 processor is a paging mode where we have virtual addresses, and virtual addresses basically allow us to split memory up into uh, four kilobyte chunks. That technically varies with large pages, but whatever. That allows us to split up memory in four kilobyte chunks. And what that allows us to do is we can kind of sparsely map things in. So we can have a situation where like this chunk is mapped in and this chunk is mapped in, but they are physically contiguous. So let's say that this points to here and then this one points uh, like directly after it. So it allows us to have large gaps in virtual address space and map that to host physical memory. Um, as part of that translation, we have permissions on that, whether we can read or write the page, whether we can execute that page, um, whether a user land application can access that page. And this is basically the core of memory protections uh, as well as, I guess, paging uh, on x86 by allowing you to split up this memory and have host physical memory can be as fragmented as possible. You can have a physical page, uh, with kernel contents on one, and then right next to it, you can have Chrome Sandbox contents on the other. But virtually, you can make sure that those don't end up in an address space. Um, sous vide? No, I actually, um, I do it on the grill. I, I'm not too convinced on sous vide yet. I like a little bit of the, the char, the smoke. I think uh, sous vide is too pure. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add another layer in here. So if we have a hypervisor, the, the guest, whatever's running inside of there, is going to wanna have virtual addresses. So we're gonna call this guest physical addresses. And the way this works is EPT is literally just multi-level page tables. So in the same way that this, the guest sees host physical, uh, guest physical, and thinks that that is its physical address space. The guest has no access to anything else, and then that means that the those addresses can then be translated into host physical addresses using a completely different table. And let's say those satisfy from completely different areas, um, and that allows us to basically have virtual addresses in like a user land or a kernel, uh, whatever. This is your CR3, right? This is your CR3. This is your like actual physical DRAM sticks. So this is like your actual memory that you have in your system. This is your CR3. This is what determines your page table. And then that CR3 is a physical address, but not necessarily guest or host. It's a physical address, a guest physical address. And this is to the nested CR3, or this is the EPT, the extended page table. So this allows us to translate the guest has its own physical memory that it doesn't know what it is. Um, and then that gets translated into host physical memory. And that's how you can have multiple VMs. So in, in a real world situation, you're going to have multiple CR3s and an EPT. You're going to probably have multiple EPTs for host physical memory. And that allows you to have multiple VMs that don't have direct access to physical memory. Cause you don't, you don't want to do that. I'm telling you that right now. Um, but yeah, so what we're going to implement is we, we already have uh, CR3 parsers for 64-bit code. What we're going to do is we're going to implement an EPT parser. We're going to implement something that allows us to translate a virtual address into a guest, uh, 
a guest physical address into a host physical address. So we're going to walk this layer right here. So this boundary here is what we are going to, um, uh, this is the layer that we're going to look into and figure out today. And it should be pretty easy, and I don't know how to make this into an oval. How do I make that into an oval? OK, well, anyways, that's the layer we're going to focus on. <laughs> so we have to implement something. It's going to look almost identical to the um, CR3 that we have. But we're going to have to re-implement it because it's just slightly different enough that I don't think it's worth reusing the code. It's just not, not quite worth it. So if we take a look at the Intel manual, which is going to be our um, what we're going to read a lot today. And the sections that we care about. So we have the old paging model, which tells us how virtual to physical is done, which is really easy. Um, OK, and let me get some music going. Yeah, I can make this work. OK. So the old tables that we had, and they're still relevant, but the ones that we already implemented were, were these four-level paging structures. And these allow you to translate a linear address, a virtual address. Technically, a linear address is different than a virtual address. But it allows you to translate a linear address into the physical address that backs it. And in our case, that's going to go to the guest physical address. And then we'll go through the guest page table to get into the um, to the host physical memory, which we can actually read and write. Um, technically, we might just map in the entire guest physical memory into a contiguous chunk in the host address space so we can directly access it for performance. So we're probably going to take a look at that. But once we have that working, um, all we have to do is really get a snapshot and put it in there. Um, getting a kernel running in a hypervisor is really not difficult. Uh, so we're going to just get this going. So that's the old paging. And then the new paging that we have to implement is going to be, um, they probably have a section on it. Probably a VMCS. There might be an EPT section. Ah, here we go. So this is the EPT. And VPIDs basically allow you to ca uh, cache and not cache information. So if we do 0, that's the current VPID. Um, if it's a non-root operation and enable VPID is 1, current VPID is this. So I think we can ignore that. So next there is EPT. And this allows us to translate. Um, this is basically saying if the guest has uh, paging enabled, then the linear address is directly the guest physical address or if they don't have it enabled. If they have paging enabled, the guest physical addresses are derived from the CR3 and all these paging structures. Basically, the guest sees a new version of physical memory that we can control. So EPT translation is done through these. Um, and I think these are pretty straightforward. Um, you can have one gig pages, which we're not going to use. And I think all we really care about is making these tables. So in this case, it's going to resemble a lot of what we have in our existing tables. One thing that's really cool is that you can actually uh, disable execute um, on pages. Uh, or you can disable read on pages and then have execute only memory, which is an EPT specific thing. We're probably going to use that to implement a coverage mechanism today. So all we have to do is we just have to um, make a way that we can create these tables. And we'll start booking it. <laughs> So it's, it's really that easy. Um, so I'm going to shift that over, because we're not going to be testing too much of this code right away. We're just going to write it. So in the kernel source, we're going to make an EPT.RS. Here we'll do a, from main, I guess, we'll reorganize this stuff, pubmon EPT. And this is um, routines for uh, creating and mapping. Um, extended page tables. OK. So then we're going to do a struct EPT. This is going to be a page table. This is a root level EPT uh, a page table. Extended page table. And then this is going to have 
page, or this is table, and this is just a physical address. Um. Yeah, we'll just do a fizz adder on this. This is gonna be a physical address of the table. So this is a physical address of the roots level of the page table. So coverage on page fault handling, not quite. We're gonna do page faults, um, or we're gonna do coverage based on um, breakpoints. So we're gonna set breakpoints on every single byte in the guest address space. And then every time we hit a breakpoint, we'll decode one instruction, record that instruction as handled, and then we'll restore it to the original instruction and continue. Um, that's at least the plan. <laughs> and it should work just fine. Hey, Cryptos, how are you doing today? All right. Um, impl EPT, pub FN new. Let pmem is equal to mute mm physical memory. Use mm. Get access to physical memory. And we'll just take a look at how we do it in our current paging. Shared page table source. And we're going to mimic a lot of this behavior. Um, I'm trying to think if it would be too difficult to overload this. And I think it would. All of those bits are zero. Those are from the EPTP. And those are from the guest physical address. Yep. OK, so I think we just start off with a. I do like how I did the translate in the other one. Um, all right. So, what I should be able to do is I should be able to make a new empty page table. And a lot of this code is going to be the same. So, create a new empty extended page table. This doesn't need fizzmem. We can just get pmem directly since we're in the kernel. mm physical memory. All right, run. Okay. Oh, and that's not page table. That's a self. This should actually return a self as well. There's no reason to say return page table. It's something that I haven't always done in Rust, and I'm trying to get better about it. Okay, and then this is, of course, the EPT. And we're going to be able to get rid of that tracking structure as well. Fizz adder we need to get from use page table fizz adder. 3 mm crate. Okay, layout we don't have. Uh, use core alloc layout. All right, so we're going to allocate some zeroed physical memory from pmem. And that's going to be the root of our table. Um, ooh. I guess I use that trait. We'll continue using that trait because I think it's good. All right, so now we can create EPT. Now we have to actually make the tables. And we're going to do that, I think, in the same way that we do it here. So first of all, this is a way of getting access to the page table. Then free, we'll probably implement free later. So I'm going to just steal translate and map raw. Because it's, it's going to be so close. It's still a four-level table, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, could be, I could be mistaken. So here, this takes no arg. So that does translate internal. This, same thing. We want the ability to dirty memory if we modify it. Um, Fizzmem we don't need. Oh, one line? Not quite. Okay. 
Okay, and these are not vert adders. These are fizz adders. Um, physical address. Um, translate a guest physical address. Should I make guest fizz adder a distinction from fizz adder? Mm, no, I don't think so. I think that's just going to get really confusing. Eh. Yeah, that's going to be confusing. So we'll just use a uh, physical address. So we'll call this the guest physical address, GP adder, fizz adder here. Guest physical address, guest physical address, guest physical address, translate the guest physical. And this is a fizz adder. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't here earlier. I understand uh, page table translation stuff is happening now, but what does fuzz a full system really mean? It means that we'll be able to run the entirety of Windows inside of um, inside of this hypervisor, and that'll allow us to then gather coverage and inject things and mutate things, uh, and ultimately, just very quickly, uh, reset the virtual machines and uh, kind of toy around with the state of the VMs. So that's basically the plan. Will we succeed? Uh, hard to say. I think we will. So we're going to make a new concept from mapping. Okay. Uh, for a extended page table mapping set uh, text width 79 okay so i think pml 4 e pdpte oh they they call it the same fucking thing all right so in that case we'll just do the same thing <laughs> Easy. Okay. Um. If we level extended page table, we allocate the page table. Then we need a way of translating it, and then we'll do read, const page read. Uh, we'll do EPT read to differentiate a little bit. So one shift zero, EPT write. Um, if the mode-based execute control for EPT, VM execution control is zero, execute access. If that control is one, execute access for supervisor linear addresses. Indicates whether instruction fetches are allowed from supervisor mode linear Okay. I see. So it's always execute. Okay, that makes sense. So the bits in EPT are actually read write exec. And this allows us to have different permissions on each level. So this is um, page table entry is uh, readable, uh, page is readable, page is writable, and this is page is executable. Beautiful. 
Now, these tables, I think, are basically the same shape. We have accessed here. Um, const ept accessed. U64 is one shift eight. Const execute access for linear, for user mode. If that control is zero, this bit is ignored. Okay, and then we have ept... Um, EPT dirty. I don't know what dirty is. Nine. Okay. Uh, page has been accessed. And this is a uh, page has been dirtied. Pretty easy stuff here so far. Now we just need to do the uh, translation. It looks like it's the exact same layout. They don't show the nice summary view here, unfortunately. Do they? Oh, they do, beautiful. Okay, so this is really all I care about. We have the execute write read. We have the execute user, but we're not gonna set that. Then we have the page table entry here. We're going to start off with an empty mapping. We're going to make sure that this value, make sure that the address is valid. Uh, top, I think, we'll dupe this. I think the top 48 bits have to be null or zero. Or 48 to the top bits. Um... EPT paging uses only bits 47 to 0. These 48 bits are used for this. So that's the table. So do I ignore the top bits? I think I just ignore the top bits then. OK. So then what I need is. If we get that nice summary, and we don't, fortunately, I'm pretty sure it's the same uh, bit patterns for all the levels. It's just a four level, same shape, same layout. So get the address of the page table. We need access to physmem, which we'll get here. Um. Let's do a, huh, let fizz mem is equal to mm physical memory. Make that mute. So this is get access to physical memory. Okay, we get all the indices, we go through the table, we get the physical address of that table entry. Fill in the address of the entry we are decoding. It should be the same. Get the virtual address <coughs> for this entry. Update the dirty bits if requested. We'll just say a panic. Uh, you know what? That's not too hard, to be honest. I think those bits are ignored. Yes, it's ignored. Yes, the dirty bits are ignored. So we can set those. So this is going to be EPT. And then EPT present. I guess there's no concept of, of presence. I guess presence is if... Um, if it's any one of those. EPT present. U64 is equal to... EPT read or EPT write or EPT exec. And this is um, EPT is accessible in some way. It's present. So here we can say if EPT present, if all those bits are zero, we're going to set, then we're going to break out because we don't have a translation there. 
Um, otherwise, we're going to update the dirty bits. We're going to write to the VAD, which we translated. We then get the uh, pointer to the next level. If the page size bit is set, uh, fuck it, we can do that. Const EPT page size u64 is equal to one shift. What's this bit right here? Seven. So this is uh, a large EPT page. Okay. So use mode linear addressing standard in bit 10. I don't know what you mean by that. Okay, so if EPT page size, and then here we can do page under, we can just search for this constant. Okay, EPT page size. And this is the same. We can have one, two, one meg, two meg. Uh, GP adder. I think that's like basically it. Uh, 28, EPT present. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So these things we still have to fix. We'll just comment this out for now. Let's make sure this builds. It's probably very close. Probably not 100%, but it's probably very close. Um, Vatter.0. This is guest physical address. One forty nine page type one gig. Uh, we'll pull that in. Size of we don't have. Uh, use core mem size of uh, seventy two fizz adder adder. Yep, that's just a typo. One sixty one. Guess physical address. Okay, there should be no more vatters. Perfect. Um, this is the guest physical. Do, 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 do. Okay. Get rid of this shit. This is the guest physical address, which is a fizz adder. This allow us to create a new mapping. Um, tracking. Tracking is going to go bye-bye. Okay, fizzmem, we gotta get access to physical memory. That's easy. Do that here. So now you can access physical memory, you can perform this translation. And this is pretty straightforward. I'm just trying to bang this one out real fast because this is boring code, to be honest. GP, 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 GP. Probably pretty close. Uh, 294, page under. Yep, this is... um. Page EPT user exec EPT exec uh, oops EPT write or EPT read and we'll add that support for the user exec EPT. Okay, user executable executable writable readable. And then here we'll add that user exec, which is this execute user bit 10. Um, page is executable as uh, user land, um, only used when um, mode, mode based execute control for EPT is set. 
is set in the um, VM execution controls. Okay, and that's EPT user exec, and then we can or EPT user exec. All right, page under. If EPT present, EPT page size, EPT page present, uh, EPT present. Oh, that's just the same thing. So we had all possible permissions. And that's it. We're probably getting pretty close now. We're gonna have to change anything that references a virtual address to kind of polish that stuff up. But honestly, we're uh, booking it. <laughs> 202, uh, yes, no fizz mem. Uh, tracking. All this tracking stuff goes away. Tracking stuff goes away. Tracking stuff goes away. Well, son of a bitch. Oh, I just built. God damn, we're good. Pub struck this, pub these. Pub this, pub this. Pub this, pub this. Fuck yeah. Okay. Um. So now we want to search for virtual. Got the uh, guest physical. Um. Get the virtual address. Yeah. Get the map virtual address for this, or the physical address. Um. Canonical. Okay. We don't need that. Uh, this returns none. In this case, no modifications were made to the page table. Guest physical address. No virtual vert. Wow. Wow. That cleaned up quick. So that should allow us to make EPT tables. Wow. If EPT present is zero or that... Return none. Translate. Um, update the reference count. Do we have those bits for use? 52 and beyond for an entry. Ignored. 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 So we can use that for our metadata, so we should be able to free these tables as well. Wow. Wow. No fucking way. All right, let's test it out. Um, if core ID is zero, then we'll do let mute EPT is equal to EPT, EPT new, make a new page table, EPT dot um, let's do a translation. Fizz adder lx leet. Leet leet. We'll print this. Okay, and this should work. Uh oh, oh, that did work. It was just getting a DHP lease. Took a while. Okay, that looks great. Yep. There's a PML4 entry associated with it, but there's no page yet. And I should be able to do EPTE.map raw at fizzadder leet the physical address. And I think the alignment is all checked for me. All right. If I do map raw. Page type, yeah, I think that's handled for me. So, EPT, um, page table, page type, page for kilobytes, 
and then raw in this case will be EPT EPT present and then we'll try and translate that address now okay that's unsafe Here we go. And we got a mapping now. Nice, and let's pretty hex print those. But yeah, that's working. Easy peasy. Yep, and that's the physical address for that. Okay. Making a hypervisor. Uh, don't have the knowledge of that. I see a lot of bare bone code. Will he boot that up or run it as a driver? This is this is running as um this is a whole OS, so this just runs on bare metal. So I wrote all this code in this whole OS chain myself. It's not a driver at all. All right, and then that translates to here, and we created all those page table entries. Oh, that is golden. So what that means is I can grab the page table stuff and I can map some things. So, what we'll do is this will be, honestly, we'll get free as well. Shouldn't be too hard to add. It's basically the same code, but with slightly different bits. I maybe could find a way to template this and reuse, but... Okay, so at this point, uh, GP adder, fizz adder. GP, this doesn't need a fizzmem, doesn't take a fizzmem, we have no initialization, read, write, exec, and exec user, exec user, um, Okay, and we just are polishing fizz gp exec user. Read is actually used now, which is fun. We'll format this a little bit better. Okay. GP, GP, GP. I don't want to find and replace here. I'm a little bit scared. GP, 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 GP. Lots of gold pieces. Okay, then we got this. Got to do GP adder. GP tracking is gone. So this will allow me to free all this shit. Beautiful. We don't have to invalidate ever. Okay. Page NX. Yep. So if exec, this will be um, page exec, ex exec. No user. There is a read though. So I'll have read, a page read. I'm super excited for this stuff to work. Super excited. Um, user exec. User exec. adder fizz adder fizz adder fizz adder v adder ooh gp adder no more v adder references no more vert references oh or the the guess physical memory is already mapped 
This will return none, and the page will not be modified. Save off the original guest physical address. Make sure the guest physical address is aligned to the page size. Compute the end guest physical. Free the guest physical. Um, guest fizz. Guest fizz. Guest physical. Um, yep, those are actually doing virtual. If we made it to the end of all guest physical memory, or maybe we made it to the end of this free request, okay. Fail to translate guest physical address during free. Guest physical guest physical these are actual address vert 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 I think we're good and that should ah uh, fizz mem so we got rid of fizz mem on all of those so I need to get access to physical memory as I do in these. Bloop. Bloop. Uh, this one, bye bye. Okay, page size. Ah, yes. Ah. We will have EPT read, EPT write, EPT exec, EPT user exec, EPT page size. We're really fucking close. Exec user. Fixed. Okay, uh, 144. A couple of these things use pass fizzmem. Basically, any place that we have fizzmem with a comma, we can get rid of. And we're basically there. Uh, 137. Hey, that's easy. Not an actual problem. Done. Okay, in map init, we're going to make sure some permission is set. Assert that read or write, read or write or exec or exec user. And this is uh, no permissions set for uh, EPT mapping. Okay. So make sure that we have at least one permission set, which then will cause us to indicate that that is a present page. And yeah, this should still work. But now I should be able to do ept.map fizz adder leets. And now I can do page table page type page 4k and then read write non-exec for both user and kernel. Expected seven arguments. Um, page type size. Oh yeah, that probably matters. We'll just map that many bytes. Oh, page type then size. Yes. So this should build, and this should also create that mapping. This one will be valid. The fizz adder will be something that's allocated. 
Those all look good, and yeah, that's a valid translation. We did it. Um, and how are you going to do Windows inside of it? So we're going to actually take a snapshot of Windows. So we're going to take all of the physical memory and register state from a running version of Windows, and we're going to transplant it into RVM to continue execution. Um, what emotes are you planning to have? I have no idea yet. I have no idea. <laughs> Is the one going to be uh, of your code deletion catchphrase? Bye. Do I say that? Bye. <laughs> bye bye. I like deleting code, man. Deleting code is good. So I think we made EPT tables. I think we have a way of making EPT now. Um, so now we have to figure out how we want to do VTX. So all the shit right now is to make new user. And that concept's gonna go away. Poof. Poof. Create a new virtual machine. Poof. Bye bye. New user, now gone. Snapshotted app. Let's see if I can just nuke that whole thing. As long as I get rid of the snapshotted app and the test fuzzer, I should be able to comment that out. Yes! It means we can start doing some testing right away. What about I.O. devices? Just let the fuzz case run until it wants to do I.O. and then end it? Yep. Hitting I.O. will be a, a, a terminal, um, terminal condition. Okay. Do, do, do. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna set those features, gonna get access to VMX, um, then we allocate a VMCS region, great. We then point to load to switch to the VM context, that's all good. So the only thing that we're gonna change is we're going to add exits on, um, we need, well, now we need to change our um, control structures, execution control, and I think it's in the secondary execution control. So we're going to have to enable the secondary controls. Um, right? So we have execution fields, preemption timer, blah, blah, blah. This is uh, processor based, and then this is activate secondary controls. So this is entry on, entry off. Exit on, exit off. And do I not set proc controls at all right now? I do not. So we've got proc based and proc two based. Proc based, proc based. Proc on, proc off. Proc two based, proc two based, proc two on, proc two off. And we'll tab that in just so it's a little bit more clear. Okay, then those, we're just gonna say we need the processor controls. We'll say let proc on is equal to, um, We're going to want to do exits on secondary controls. So this is uh, um, processor controls on. And we'll do activate secondary controls off none. Let proc off. So we're basically saying the features that I want out of the VM. So we're going to expand these features, and we're going to say proc controls, processor controls, uh, to on enable EPT. And that's bit one. That's it. That's all we got to do. So that should enable EPT. And these are proc2 on, proc2 off. 
And let's see if this succeeds. Oh, we gotta make a VM. So we'll do, uh... Fuck yeah. Uh, let mute VM is equal to VTX VM new. And I think I have to execute. I have to do dot run for this code to get hit. Yeah. So I'll just do a VM dot run. And I'll print the VM exit result. Now, hopefully, we can have nested EPT inside of this VM. If we can't, then we're going to have to switch to doing all our dev on physical hardware. And we're fine. We're getting a page fault. Wow, that entered the VM. Did it? EPT. We have to enable that. I would expect that to fail. Oh, because that EPT. That EPT page should be non-present. So let me put in an empty EPT temporarily. Um, and I don't have a drop handler, I don't think, for these. I do not. So we will make, uh, we'll grab um, use create EPT EPT. Um, so I want to make a new page table and I want to get the table and I want to set that in one of these fields. I'm guessing it's a natural width. Nope, 64-bit. Page fault, error code, mask, match. Um, came hell. Okay, it's probably unnatural with one of these. EPT, let's just fucking search. Don't need highlight all. Oh, EPTP index. Oh, that's, okay. EPT pointer, here we go. 201A. Noise. Okay, so this is the EPT pointer, OX two zero one A, and this is the extended page table pointer, two zero one A, and that should be seven. Only exists if enable EPT is set. Okay, so then VM writes. We establish all these things. So I'm going to VM writes. Um, at this stage, VM write VMCS EPT pointer, and then let mute EPT is equal to EPT new EPT dot table. That's a physical address. Beautiful. So that will set up the EPT base, and then hopefully we'll see like an unexpected exit code. No. Um, because I think we'd get an EPT VM exit, don't we? Unless we just, no, we don't just get a page fault. Um, EPT violation, that's what I want. Attempt to access memory with a guest physical address that was disallowed by the configuration of the EPT paging structures. Okay, so we probably didn't enable EPT then, correctly. Oh, oh! Um, uh, proc on, proc two on. We did it! 
pin based controls. So this should now get an EPT violation, which will show up as an unhandled exit code. Oh, that's negative one. Ooh, okay. Um. Yeah, that's negative one, isn't it? Um. And I think that means the structure is maybe bad. Hmm. Uh, what are the other fields that I can extract? Disable interrupts, enter the guest. Enable interrupts, mark that it's launched. Hey, Quantum, how's it going? All right, so what do we do? And let's say I don't set this EPT. Maybe I have to do VPID. EPT violations, blah, 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 blah. Memory typing. PML, we're going to actually use that. Um, I've never used it before, but we're going to use it. Okay. I'm pretty sure we just set that. PG is one. PDPTs will contain that. Is a secondary. We have to set that, and we do. If fix one reports that PG must be one in VMX operation, it can be zero. And non. Uh, if yep. If only if that. Shit. VMCS link pointer set to. Not zero. Unhandled VM exit code. And that's just negative one. I'm pretty sure. So what do I do? I enable EPT, which is bit one. Activate secondary controls, good. And enable EPT. Yup. So what does it not like about that? Um, we can see on VM entry what it checks. VM entries, okay. Checks on the house state area, TPR shadow, okay. Uh, all we care about is EPT. If that is one, that field must satisfy this. The memory type, two to zero, must be valid. Oh, one less than the EPT page walk length. Must be three. See that section. Bit six, enable access and dirty bits. Must be zero if that is that capability does not support access and dirty bits for EPT. So we have to or in three shift three or one shift six. They'll turn on all of that tracking and then the memory type. We don't really care about right now, but this should work. 
That was easy. Okay, that wasn't easy. Um, supports execute only. Um, if it 21 access and dirty, we, we will eventually want to check those things. Um, EPT type, I think the type can be fine at zero, one shift six. Maybe it doesn't support this. We'll say that this is four level paging. Okay, sweet. It's not that good. Um, let's just take a look at orange slice kernel. And let's see what we do here. EPT 201A, allocate a uh, page, copy that shit in, or in seven RWX, one shift seven, one shift seven or seven. What's that? What's bit seven? User read, page size. Oh, I'm doing large pages. Now we set the EPT pointer to that three shift three. Um, table. Yeah, that gets the table. That's a physical line zero dot thing. Okay, let's try it. Let's try it on hardware. 48. EPT violation. Okay, um... I guess, can we not use EPT inside of a VM? This might be the end of all VM development. We might be done now. We might no longer be able to do this in a VM. I guess EPT is just, we can't do EPT in a VM. We would have to fall back to the shadow uh, pages. Okay. So you can't do... Huh. Really? So I mean, I think, I think this is fine then. So we'll do uh, or one shift six and I think we're, uh, we're done with um, we're done with VM development. We'll have to do this all on real hardware. Okay, no problem. I guess that's done. Wow. Kind of wasn't expecting that. Um, huh. Okay, so we'll create a new page table. Um, yeah, and I'll just put this on the VM. So the VM, this is going to be the, um, uh, extended, uh, guest physical to host physical translation. And that's going to be an EPT. Okay, 768. This is self.ept.table. Um, set the EPT table as uh, read as a four level EPT with uh, accessed and dir dirty bit tracking. Sysec, what's up? 
618, then EPT here. We'll just do EPT is a VM uh, EPT new. Thanks for the raid. Hell yeah, man. How was your stream? All right, beautiful. We got a 48. That's all I care about. Fuck yeah. Now we don't care about page faults anymore. Page faults are now user land constructs. Um, wow. So we should be able to map in... Well, I can do unrestricted guest. <laughs> um, although I do set this up to run in long mode right now. Okay, so I guess we have the snapshot at app. We'll bring this back online. And then we just, we gotta do some weird shit. Uh, test fuzzer we don't need. Snapshot at app. Okay, here we go. New user. Make a VM. Make a VM. Page table. Holy shit. Okay. Core ID is not equal to zero halt. Um, this is not going to work. Just very, very strong heads up. This is not going to work. But it's going to... Uh, oh, test fuzzer. We can pull that in. We're close here. So we'll get this. Wow, this, is, uh, this might go pretty fast. This might go 0 to 100 real quick here. Uh, nice. Unhandled VM exits. And this is happening because I have paging and snapshot at app where I manage my own page tables. And those are going to go away. Where the fuck do I put those page tables? I guess I map those on this. Ah, bye bye. Gone. And vert adder I don't think I'm using anymore. Okay, maybe I am. Where am I using that? Oh, making page faults. Okay, then a lot of stuff is broken. 618 page table doesn't exist. Uh, 847. We don't have a page table. Guess CR3 is zero. Two forty one. Oh, this is on snapshot app. Okay. Um. Um. Okay. Currently, we can't reset VMs yet. So we don't have a way to. So um, we'll need a way to handle VM resets. Of course, that's going to be relatively important. All right, y'all, I'm out. Have a have, get some good sleep, Sysec. Physical memory not needed in VTX anymore. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. 562, page table unknown field. Correct. These are no longer going to be on a page fault. No longer do this on a page fault. Page faults are now just fatal. And then these, 556, all these translations are now going to be on physical memory. So this is on ept.translate. I think like this is going to get us very fucking close. Um. I don't need PMEM. Oops. Yeah, I think I only passed that as an org, so I think I should be able to get rid of that now, which is sweet. Same with this. And, oh, technically I'm using PMEM here. Uh, 
556, expected one argument. Yep. And it's not going to be a virtual address. We're going to change a bunch of these things. Luckily, we strongly type that, so that will all fail in a nice, clean way. This is going to be EPT translate dirty, align virtual address. And anywhere that we do page table, get access to the host page table. Um, yeah, I think that's still correct. Yeah, that still should be correct. Um, this one, yep, that's still a real page table. Self.page table. VM.page table. Okay, this goes away. And then these bits are invalid. Nice. Noise. Okay, map raw, not found a VM. Yep, EPT dot, EPT dot this. All right, we're close. Okay, virtual address. Um, basically, these things are all gonna go away. Vert adder. Um, this is fizz adder. Um, G patter, guess physical address, read into from rip, yep, read, yep, those are vert addresses, read, yep, so these are all broken, so we just gotta, we just gotta break these. Okay. Read into 344. Yep, syscalls are going away. Um, syscall. And now everything's broken. So we will pull in use. Oops. Use crate EPT, EPT read, EPT write, and EPT exec um, page under. So this is EPT write. Oops. That's the existing one. Um, yeah, I guess we just comment this out. Yeah, like all this shit, we gotta comment out. We gotta, we gotta redo a lot of this stuff. A lot of this stuff has to change. Just trying to get it to build. 855 vert to offset. Um, I don't think vert to offset is gonna be a thing anymore. So we'll just get rid of it. This is where we parse that file. We're going to change our snapshot format, so we'll change that. So that doesn't exist. Net backing. Just all physical memory. Raw guest physical memory backing. Okay, test fuzzer. Basically can't have this reading and writing right now because we don't, we don't have a way to do that. Which is fine and dandy. And we have no way to inject. Fine and dandy. Okay, and then get module list. Just comment this out for now. Vert to offset, 838. Let's delete it. Okay, um... This is not going to work. We're going to... Oh, we actually exit. New. We make a new fuzz session. Oh, we are able to parse that file. But we don't... Okay. So we're getting a 48. And let me parse 48 in VTX. So EPT gives an EPT violation. 
And then here we can search for EPT violation. Um, writes the value of the field. Okay. This field is used when the VM exits due to EPT violations and EPT misconfigurations. Okay, so we want the guest physical address. Um, page modification log full. Exit information. Search for EPT. EPT. EPT violations. Exit qualification. Um, move DR, IO, APIC. EPT violations. Okay. Read, write, exec, instruction, fetch, logical and of the bit zero. Indicates whether it was readable, whether it was writable, um, whether it was executable, whether it was user mode executable. Set if the linear address field is valid. Uh, it is valid for all EPT violations except those from loading guest PDPTEs as part of a move CR due to tapped. Okay. If this is one, set if the access causing the EPT violation is a guest physical address that is the translation of a linear address cleared if it is as part of a page table walk. Okay. Um, if bit seven is one, bit eight is one, and the processor supports this, Oh my god, blah, 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 blah. Guess physical address. Okay, this is really all we care about. So we'll grab uh, enum vm exit, and we'll do a, this will be a um, EPT violation. And then we'll just have right now an address of the address that was the, caused the violation. Okay. Then if we have a type 48, then we have a VM exit, um, EPT violation. And we'll read VM read VMCS um, guest physical address. All right? Guys, I think we're going to have this running in like under two hours. Like, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Guest physical address. So, right now, we're trying to. We're trying to figure out uh, when a guest physical translation failure occurs, I'm trying to parse out that information such that I know what page I have to fill in. So this is a guest physical address used in EPT violations. And read only guest physical address. OX2400, OK. So what we're going to get is 501. That takes a fizz adder. And then down here, oh, I don't have fizz adder. Uh -huh. Fizz adder. So we'll pull in the physical address. 
And we've got the virtual address. We'll go to 1098. Then we're going to read that and wrap it in a fizz adder. And now we should get a EPT violation message, which will be nice and clean. And it will say, I want to get a DHP lease. Oh, is that running in a loop? I think it is. Um, yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I don't print the unhandled. So here I can print the reason why we had a VM exit and we could not complete a fuzz case. And it's going to be a translation fault on zero because that is the um, uh, page table. Uh, 7F8. So it's trying to translate 7F8. That is... That's going to be the offset into the page table that corresponds. That's the PML for E entry corresponding to the uh, RIP. So if I change RIP to zero here, we'll see an EPT violation of zero because it's trying to read the top level page table uh, for address zero. So there's the reset, and it's zero. Um, OK. So this is working exactly as expected. So now. All I have to do is I, well, all, simply, um, basically everything that we commented out in here, which is a shit ton, we have to re-implement with EPT. Um, so we have to implement uh, guess physical memory reads and guess physical memory writes. Then on top of that, we can build guest virtual memory reads and guess virtual memory writes. And then from there, um, from there we're, we're pretty set, I think. So if, here, we're going to say VM exits, and we'll do an EPT violation. Fault address is this. And, and here we'll say self.translate uh, get page. Get, uh, no, translate. We want to translate for reading or writing. I need the right bit. I got to get that right bit. But that's simple. We can get the right bit from there. So we will say, um, if it's 48, then this is what we're going to return, blah, 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 blah. And then we'll do let's is read is equal to, oh, and this is uh, exit qual is equal to vm read unsafe. VM read VMCS exit qualification. <laughs> Gabble, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Fuck yeah. Now we'll go right into the server fund. <laughs> right into the server fund. Um, get the exit qualification. So we're going to get the exit qualification and then the exit qualification. We will end with bit one shift zero, and this is set if the access was a read. Set if the access is a write. Set if it's an instruction fetch. One, two. Third one. Um, this is a user. Was executable O. Oh. Um, indicates whether that. Logical and a bit two. Value of the bit is undefined. If this is one. Well, that's fine. We'll just set this. We'll set these. So this will be an address is read is right exact i don't need the is uh extract information about about the type of ept uh violation okay and then that's the parse structure oop fizz adder this is a fizz adder Okay, and then all these get tabbed in, and then EPT violation is 
curly. And we'll just do unsafe around the outside of this. And we're close. That's ballpark. Everything in this channel is not simply. Hey, if, th if things work for us, it, they are. <laughs> EPT violation. And we'll have an address. A read bool, a write bool, and an exec bool. Okay, missing token, just need a comma there. Okay. Yep, now we have, it's trying to read, it's trying to write. Okay, that makes sense. Um, get the physical address of that. Vroop. How are you switching to the physical machine, accessing it from your desktop? Yeah, it's just IPMI. It's just a serial port over IPMI. So that's get module list. Don't care about that. What I care about is translate. Translate is the big, the big one. Uh, and I guess we also need get page. Uh, guess physical address. In host addressable memory. So this is get page. This is a guess physical address. There's a phys adder. This will return a virtual address. Okay, that's the way we did it. Validate the alignment, GP, um, guest physical. So anything vert or vatter or anything we want to change. So here we're going to slice up, attempt to translate the page. We're going to translate the guest physical address. That'll give us a translation. If that page exists in the EPT, then we can just return a slice to it. And then we get the physical or the virtual address of that. Otherwise, get the page from the master. Otherwise, if there's network memory, um, get the offset from there. And the offset in this case will just be the GP address. Cause Wix, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Fuck yeah. Thanks everyone so much. Holy shit. What server are you looking to buy? I already bought a server. Um, I'll do an unboxing when it comes. Until then, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a little secret, just so I can have a surprise. <laughs> but I bought a fun server. I think I think I made a fun server. We'll get the guest physical address dot zero as u size, and that's just it just directly indexes that memory. Fuck yeah, hell yeah! Thank you so much, crazy 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 Wix. Um. I guess we need to be able to handle memory holes. Yeah, we, we will want this concept. Mm. But do I want to do that in a better way? I think so. We will revise this. Panic page in from network. The new server is a prototype from Oxid Computer. I'll write a new OS for it. Ooh, that would be fun. Okay. Virtual address, that page in for network, no one can provide the memory for us, it's not present. Translates a physical address for the guest, the physical address on the host. If the physical address is not valid, this will return none. This translation will only be valid for the page that virtual address resides in. Um, the return physical address will have an offset from the physical Address supplied. Uh, 
physical address this. So this is a guest physical address. We got a physical address. Align the physical address. This is a GP. This is a fizz. GP. Okay. We first translate it through EPT. And then if we need to promote it, uh, oops, panic netmem. I can actually do self dot get page here, I think. Um, virtual, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll rewrite that stuff. Translate the guest physical address. Oops. Mapping virtual address into a physical address. We then smash that in. Um, alias the guest uh, physical memory directly into the network mapped page. And this is return the physical address of the uh, return the host physical address of the requested guest 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 physical address vatter gp 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 GP. It's my build now. Um, oh, these pages aren't good. Page user. Uh, EPT. EPT write. EPT read. EPT exec. EPT user exec. Those are some good permissions. Let's basically go and fuck shit up. All right. 689. Um, map it as RW. EPT, pre um, EPT read, EPT write, EPT exec, EPT user exec. Um, this is read only. EPT read, EPT exec, EPT user exec. Mismatch 687. Huh. Okay, 299, unexpected token. Oh, yep, bye-bye. Uh, 297, yes. So we're gonna have the address, and then write, and then the rest we don't care about, and then we'll do a self.translate address. Expect filled to translate EPT violation, and this takes a write bool. So if it's writable, then we pull that in as writable memory. Okay, unnecessary unsafe block. Yep, that's fair. PMEM 540. We'll add that back if we need it. Vert, a, vert adder. Currently not using, but we will. All right, this should run. Page in from network. So we're hitting this because we want to get a page from the network. So we're at the point where we now need to make a snapshot. 
Are there any servers built entirely in the U.S.? No. Shipping is haphazard lately. Who can predict? I think I think it should pretty easily come come here. I'm not too worried about it. We'll see. Um. Okay, so now we have EPT set up. We I think we need a snapshot. <laughs> we need something that we can actually map in. So how do I wanna do this? Um I'm going to, okay. So unfortunately, I think we are uh, officially at the stage where we actually have to have something that we can run in this. Obviously, there's more code that we can like dev and we can theorize and try to get stuff working, uh, but we're pretty much at the stage where uh, we're really just, we're just writing the code. It's pretty, f uh, getting the snapshot going. Like uh, all the EPT stuff, this should be able to run an arbitrary ring zero virtual machine if I need to at this stage. Um, those aren't the permissions I currently give the guests, but we'll, we'll have to parse those out and it'll get a little bit more complex. Um, but yeah, let's see. So I've got a, um, we gotta go make a, a full memory dump of something. So to do this, um, I'm going to just get rid of this snapshot, just testing shit, and yeah, so I just need to find a, a good snapshot. So we're going to debug this guest. Um... Okay, make their test. Okay, so we're gonna try to get, um, I'm gonna get a kernel debugger up and running on a target. So let me go find, let me go find a, a VM quick. Um, Do, do, do. Okay. I'm going to snap test and we'll copy this from 64 here. Okay. I'm just waiting for a, a copy of a VM. It's going to take probably a minute here. But how's everyone's day is going? <laughs> Can you DD dev Cayman on a Linux box? Not quite. I need to know which ranges cannot be mapped or should not be mapped. Um, I also need to know the register state. Although you could probably get by with a, a kind of fucked map. What we're trying right now, I've never done before. I'm going to try to get a um, kernel full memory dump, and I'm going to try and get that kernel full memory dump to, I'm gonna try um, to resume that kernel memory dump in a VM. I've never done it before. Typically, I, I do a snapshot from the VM itself. I run, I boot whatever's on disk under my hypervisor so I can control it. Getting access to things like MSRs is gonna be relatively difficult, um, but I'm hoping that we can probably, we can probably guess what some of these values are gonna be. So we'll see. We'll see. The main thing is I want to get some translations working so I can practice read and writing uh, memory in the guest. And once I can read and write things in the guest address space, then I'll be able to actually try and do some research.
or try and get things actually running. So first we need to make a file format for a snapshot and then we need to page in pages as they are folded, um, folded in from the network. So we're gonna make a file format that we're gonna use. It's gonna look similar to our fault dump format. Um, and we're just gonna change it ever so slightly to work with um, the kernel information. So we're gonna need some more th stuff. We're gonna have like the syscall entry point, the C, um, uh, those MSRs, we're gonna need the GS bases. We're gonna need all the segments, which we currently say we don't care about. Um, but now we're gonna start caring about those. So, so I should be able to make a VM. And we'll just start this VM here. And here we go. So, oh, we'll do KDK net ports 5,000, 50,000 key 1111. Uh, one. So this will get us, okay, so now we have a kernel debugger into this VM. What is fuzzing? Fuzzing is the process of basically uh, randomly generating randomly generating inputs to an application to attempt to get an application to crash. In fact, I might even have a bang fuzzing. I do. <laughs> I do. I wrote that a long time ago. Is it good? I think it's good. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, we're probably gonna write a test application here. So let's just write a hello world. Um, I hopefully have Visual Studio, and I do. So uh, x64, probably have Rust as well. So we're gonna go into um, make dir, um fake app, fake app, notepad, gvim, vim. Okay, notepad fake app dot c, uh, int main void, return zero. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see if we can cause this to break into the debugger by doing an int three. And then inside of here, what we'll do is we'll just return out. This will actually be sufficient. Um, so we'll do a uh, debug break from here. CL fake app dot c. And we'll do ODZI ZO fake app. So debug uh, information and everything. This should trap into the kernel debugger. So at this point, the context in the kernel debugger is equal to what we're currently running. So we're about to do that. Then we're going to return zero from the function, right? So what we can do is we can make a full memory dump here. So we'll do a dump slash f for full memory dump. And then we'll dump this to. Um, full dump dot dump. And this is gonna take a while. This is gonna take about five minutes. Um, but what this is gonna do is this is going to save the context of the, basically everything um, at this location. Now, taking the memory dump actually requires that the kernel is running so we can send the packets back and forth. So there's a chance, and this is why I've never done this before, there's a chance this can fail. There's a chance that the machine is in a weird state because it is kind of being used while we're dumping it, but I'm hoping that won't matter. We're gonna parse out this context structure. We're gonna drop that context structure into a um, into our VM file format, and then we'll change it to use uh, pages rather than uh, physical memory, rather than virtual memory, and then we'll be able to page these things in, and then hopefully, we will be able to read and write memory and we'll be able to see the code that we're running here. So that's the goal. Um, I never actually ran the fake app, so hopefully things are all paged in on this system, but they should be. I don't know how much RAM I give this, but we might have to take more snapshots, whatever, it takes time. Um, taking these snapshots is instant from inside of the VM. Uh, so unfortunately this is a lot slower, but it means you can use the standard development environment to set these uh, breakpoints and stuff. So we'll see. So now we just wait. Honestly, let's let's write the code. Let's uh, let's write this uh, let's write this code right fucking away. I'm not scared. 
Um, we won't make any mistakes here. So this is a parser for dumps. And that dump format is here, and I will show you that in a bit. So this is um, get the number of memory regions, the number of physical memory regions in the full memory dump. This is get the total number of pages in the full memory dump. Pages start at this offset in the file. It's a fixed size header. Go through each, each memory region in the uh, full memory dump. This is get the corresponding, um, I forget the format of this, but uh, physical memory region for this run. This is get the base page and page count for this region. And then this is going to um, print. We don't need to comment that. And then we're going to advance the page offsets. And then at the end, this is just um, make sure we consumed the entire file. If we did not, there's some extra trailing data we did not expect. And that was just doing a search. I was doing a test earlier. So this is going to load in a snapshot. We're going to call this full dump, I think. Full dump, full DMP. Whatever the name of the file we're saving is, wherever we're saving that file, seven, full dump. So then we're going to parse that. And we'll basically see if we're able to parse all those regions. That file doesn't exist, of course. That's failing right away. So then we're going to convert these. Um, we're going to convert all of the memory from that dump, right? We're using an existing format and using built-in existing WinBag tools just to make it easier to kind of do this process. Hell yeah. How's everyone doing? I might get a snack here in a minute. I, I guess we're just waiting for this. Uh, let's keep going. I, I'm not fucking scared, man. We're just going to get this first try. Uh, so we're going to convert this into a new file. And we're going to make an output. Um, wow, I almost I almost typed C there. Let me an output is file create. And this is going to be a full dump dot falk dump. And OK. Uh, create the output file and to be honest I'm just gonna convert this I don't even need to put this in a parser team so I'll probably change this in a minute we'll have well if those pages are all aligned I can actually just load that I can just load that dump file directly into I can load that dump file directly into the kernel, and I can parse it in the kernel, because this file format's so fucking simple. Yeah, I think we're just gonna do that. I don't, uh, since these are page aligned, uh, we can actually just directly use a dump in the kernel. <laughs> Trying to figure out some good software for auditing C++ code bases, like reading the source code. Understand is a good one. I just use Vim and C tags, but a lot of people swear by understand. Had to put my dog, uh, had to put my last dog down today, unfortunately. Holy shit, man. So sad to hear. Hope you're doing well. Lived a nice long life. That's good to hear. Yeah, but C tags and C scope? Yeah, I just use C, C tags. Guten Tag. Oh my god, that's why it's called Guten Tags! It's Guten Tags! Holy shit, I never realized that! That makes so much sense! <laughs> Holy shit, is it a Swedish developer or do they are they just a fiend of puns? Okay, so now we have this fake app running. Everything is good, fine and dandy. All right, we're just gonna kill this VM because we don't care about it. And then we'll grab this snapshot out of my domain VM. 
Oh, it's German. I thought that was. Why did I think that was Swedish? I don't fucking know, man. You're not. You're not here for culture. That's for damn sure. <laughs> um, we'll scoop over from. Uh, 192, 168, 122, 21, and this is test full dump dot dump. Uh, up. Oh. No, that's good. Uh. Uh, is this, uh, this is not 122.21, is it? The fuck is my IP? What's my IP here? One twenty two one ninety eight. Woo! All right, so now we just are pulling that down from that domain, but we can check what that looks like. Um, CD, um, KDZ full dump. This will open the full dump. And we can do reload, reload. We'll just do uh, reload all these symbols. I'll make sure that I have all the symbols downloaded for this. Um, premise with C-scope, you can't deal with function overrides whenever, yeah, you can't deal with function overrides in any way in C, uh, C++. Welcome to auditing C++. It's miserable. The way I audit C++ code is I look for where the C++ code calls C code, and then I audit the C code. <laughs> I mean, obviously I'm forced to audit C++ sometimes, but C++ auditing blows. It's miserable. If you have a language server, you can do it. Yeah, but that typically requires you can build the code. Yeah, exactly, which is like, uh, that never fucking happens. In what reality can you actually build your code? Uh, we're not really waiting on the symbols. We're just waiting for this copy to complete and then we'll start parsing this out. Would you rather use C over C++ if Rust is unavailable? Any day of the week. I think C++ is a fucking abysmal language. I think C++ is just a feature dumping ground from the past f four decades of work. It's just people shoveling shit onto the shit heap. And there are 50 different ways that you can do literally everything. It still has all the same amount of undefined behavior as C. No, com for, for the past, like, 15 years, no C compiler or C++ compiler actually implements the full C spec. So every, compile, every compiler implements a slightly different subset of the C, standard or C++ standard specification. It's just a fucking shit show. It's a completely unusable language. How about D? I've never written D. Not to mention template metaprogramming. The whole concept of overriding things is is ludicrous to me. It's the stupidest fucking concept ever. Such a such a bad idea. Tell us how you really feel. I'm just sick of that language, man. It's just trash. Absolute trash. It is any code that is written in C++ is unreadable, regardless of how well it's written, because you have no idea what anything does, because everything has 50 layers of hidden abstraction. You put a parenthesis somewhere, oh, that, well, that invoked eight functions deep <laughs> off something, and invoked a function which invoked another function which made a constructor which allocated something off the heap, which caused a new smart pointer to get allocated, which caused a new stack allocation. Like, you have no idea what the fuck is going on. The only way that you can write C++ code is if you truly don't care what your code does. If you're, if you're like oblivious to the fact that you have no idea of what's going on under the hood, then sure, it's easy to write in because you just write random things and then the compiler kind of figures out for you. But as a reader of code, it's unreadable. 
Like, reading Chrome Source is basically fucking impossible. Because everything extends the same things a million times, and you have no idea where it calls actually end up going to because everything is just automatically cast to random types and invoked. It's just, it's just so fucked. It's so fucked. This is not a language problem. It's absolutely a language problem if the language allows you to write like this and every single language material promotes this way of writing code. It's absolutely a language problem. <clears throat> we need to baby developers. Developers aren't smart enough to make decisions like this. We need to force developers to do the right thing. They're going to do the wrong thing if it's slightly easier or it saves them three minutes of time or it, it makes them not have to think about something. They're just going to do it the wrong way. They're going to cast a pointer to whatever the fuck they want. They're not going to check whether or not things are undefined behavior. They're not even going to know if things are undefined behavior. Developers cannot write in C++. Just full stop. We can't use a language like that. <laughs> You can code in C++ without doing OOP if you want, just, then just write C. <laughs> What's the right thing? No undefined behavior. Step one, no undefined behavior in a language. Full stop. No budging on that. Uh, and then after that, do whatever the fuck you want. I don't care. <laughs> Okay, um, so this should print all of the regions in that dump, and it does. So here are all of the physical address regions. So there's a physical address here for this many bytes, physical address here for this many bytes, physical address here for this many bytes, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, you can't get much easier than that one. Unsafe Russ as UV, does that make it a shit language? See his problems though, uh, it's hard to return an array from a function not built in a resizable array. I mean, yeah, I would say if you want to be able to return arrays from functions, you probably should be using a higher level language than C++ anyways. Like, just use Go or Rust or Python. I don't like C++ also, I code in C++ at work, and I code in C uh, in my programs. We say the language is gar garbage and blame the way people program. I mean, I, I, I still stand by that. I still stand by that. Like, the language is a guide, right? Could you have protobuf in C? Can't, isn't that already a thing? Oh, you mean like write protobuf in C? You'd have to architect it differently, but absolutely you could. It would look a lot different. I don't know. Access to the code? I'm not too familiar with uh, how it's all done. The way you would write would be way worse and more boilerplate-y. I mean, I think C++ is already really boilerplate-y. Um, but yeah, it's not as bad. Lugit bindings. Um, <laughs> witness the huge nuclear slag heap of security vulnerabilities. Know if people are doing the right thing with a given language. Enforcement is the right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, developers just need easier languages to write in. They shouldn't, they, they shouldn't have the level of control that they have. They just shouldn't. We wouldn't, we wouldn't design a nuclear reactor where the fucking janitor can, like, spin it up and down. So why the fuck are we making coding languages where literally the, the worst developer in the world has all the keys to the kingdom? I just don't understand why we're, why we're doing this. It's just a big-ass mistake. And it's going to take about 30 years to undo. Sucks, man. All right. <laughs> I like the nuke reactor and janitor analogy. It's a bit extreme, but it's, it's how I view it, right? Because I'm a security engineer, right? To me, I see this shit all the time. I have never read C or C++ code that isn't riddled with fucking bugs. Everyone loves to say that they can write C and C++ without bugs. Like, oh, well, but my code, but I'm not lazy, but I don't do things unsafe. 
Bull fucking shit. I guarantee if I solve a thousand lines of your code, I could find multiple exploitable bugs so fucking easily. Every single fucking code base I've ever looked at. Chrome, easy as shit. Bugs all over the place. Linux kernel, Windows kernel, Android, iOS, all fucking easy. It's a complete joke. OpenBSD, still a joke. They write really good code. They write about some of the best C code that you can possibly write, but it's still a fucking joke. <laughs> And it shouldn't be. It's not their fault. It's not the developer's fault. It's the language's fault for being way too fucking easy to make mistakes in. Rust has no bugs? Rust has no exploitable bugs by default. No race condition exploitable bugs. Obviously, there's always logic bugs. <clears throat> but yes, it eliminates basically 80% of all the bugs that are out there in the world right now if you wrote things in Rust. I would say that's a pretty big fucking improvement. <laughs> if your goal is no bugs, then just leave programming because that'll never happen. But yeah, you'll have no memory corruption bugs. You'll have no disclosure. You'll have none of these issues. Until you start avoiding the borrow checker and doing unsafe because Rust limits you too much, it doesn't. You're just being lazy. If you're using unsafe code, you're either A, optimizing things for performance, in which case, pay fucking attention to what you're doing and do it correctly, and you have a much smaller amount of code you have to audit. And two, if you're not doing performance, you probably don't need any unsafe code. <clears throat> like, unsafe is not, oh, I'm lazy. I mean, unsafe is a lot of fucking work, but a lot of people use unsafe to just cast things around because they're like, oh, I don't actually want to like, check the alignment of these things. I'm just gonna fucking read whatever this thing is, and I, I know the shape of this is fine. Unsafe is, oh, the compiler cannot verify what I'm doing, so I have to, yeah, yep. But a lot of people use it when they're lazy, right? I don't think you're disagreeing with that. <laughs> The answer is C. I, I like the C language. I just think it's not a good language for us to be writing stuff in. I think C is a, a beautiful language. I have a safe program right here. I don't know. You don't know if your libc is safe there. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're, you're undefined on what you're returning back. So what you returned is undefined. <laughs> <laughs> Debated. <laughs> you can use unsafe and be attentive to not have bugs, and that's how bugs occur everywhere. You're not attentive all the time. Um, I mean, I think there's a big difference in always having the keys of the kingdom and getting the keys of the kingdom only when you need it. It means that if I were auditing Windows and it were written in in Rust right now, I would probably have one one thousandth of the amount of code that I have to audit because there'd probably be a thousand lines of safe code for every one line of unsafe code. So the amount of unsafe code that I would have to read is astronomically smaller. And if you, if you really want to make the point that that is easier or really no different than having to audit the ho whole code base, uh, then we just don't really have a conversation going here because I just think you're fundamentally wrong there. It's mitigation. That being said, the average developer does not need unsafe code. If I were writing, if I had a team of 10 engineers and we're writing a fucking application, guarantee fucking tee it, I'm gonna have a pass on the Rust code. If there is unsafe, PR rejected. Instant fucking taneously. Do it in safe Rust. If you're doing it in unsafe Rust, then get some principal engineers involved and they will help you architect it. But I don't need fucking junior engineers writing unsafe code. <laughs> Full stop. Have a fucking meeting with multiple engineers thinking about how to architect this thing. Think about, is this actually something that needs unsafe? Maybe there's an API that works without unsafe. Maybe you're overthinking the problem and you can do it using simple byte manipulation. Maybe you're being lazy and you're trying to bypass serializing something manually. Maybe, like, there's so many fucking options here, right? Writing unsafe code should be a big event. It should be a weekly event of like, holy shit, 
Here are the things that we want to add unsafe code to. Go through the PRs, figure it out, have the senior principal architects of the fucking code base who know what's going on work on that rather than some random fucking junior engineer who's adding a new extension for a new file format parser and they decide to add a gaping security hole in the middle of fucking windows because they have no idea what they're doing. I can absolutely reject a PR because it has unsafe code or I can at least know that a PR has unsafe code. You can't do that with CMC++. You can't do that. In theory, you could write a parser that would make sure everything's a smart pointer, but that's so fucking hard compared to just having Rust code and I could say, is there any unsafe in this PR? If there is, then it needs to be escalated. If there is no unsafe, then I don't give a shit because it doesn't implement any new bugs except for logic bugs, which you'll still audit during the PR phase. <clears throat> Does Rust protect about integer overflows? Um, uh, in production code, not in debug mode. Uh, it's Yeah, it's only in debug mode. You can turn it on. So there is a way that you can set that. If you just set like debug equals true or whatever, or there's like overflow checks is true. You can explicitly turn it on. That being said, those integer overflows uh, in SMB led to memory corruption due to going out of bounds on arrays. It basically meant that the validation of the bounds. I can't remember if it was for writing or reading or whatever, but those violated uh, a bounds check because of the integer overflow. In Rust, you maybe overflow and then you'd still be in bounds of the buffer. And if you're not in bounds, you're still getting a panic. So, um, but yeah. Please stop telling people to switch to us. I need to keep my job. Don't worry. Plenty of people out there don't think they need a safe language because they think they can develop better. Or they think since Rust doesn't fix every single po problem that possibly can happen, that it's not worth switching to. The same people who argue against mitigations because, well, it's theoretically possible that there's still a security bug. So fuck all mitigations because none of them can do anything if it's possible that there's one bug. <laughs> it's just like... Um, <laughs> I love I love his talk about the downfall of technology. Hey, I think we're getting better. It's just a slow process. And you want to talk about the performance? Rust actually outperforms C++ because in C and C++ you need so many fucking mitigations to make the code even remotely safe. And in Rust you don't need those. You don't need to heap cookies in Rust. You don't need stack cookies in Rust because you're not overflowing your fucking stack. So now you can get rid of prologues and epilogues and checks and balance, like all these fucking things that you can eliminate from your entire code base. You can get rid of overhead. You can get rid of uh, memory utilization. You can get rid of uh, address space randomization. There's like so much shit that you can do if you have uh, full Rust code bases. It's beautiful. It's, it's, just, it's just great. <laughs> same with Go or same with Python. I don't give a fuck what language. Just pick a goddamn safe language. Can still lead to logic bugs yeah for sure yeah, you gotta it's it's still weird um okay anyways that was a good rant so we're gonna parse out from this mini dump we're going to parse out the b-tree map uh use alec collections b-tree map um and this is Fizz ranges. Somehow Rust is better in all ways, safer, faster. Something is missing, missing there, right? Yes, adoption, training, education, learning, getting your workforce to be able to use it, integrating into existing build environments, legacy code bases that can't integrate with it well. Like, billions of fucking reasons why it's not the solution right now. It's an exceptionally hard language. It's one of the hardest languages to write. I would actually say it is the hardest language to write in. So 40 years from now, we'll have a perfect language? Yeah, that's, that's progress. <laughs> Welcome to reality. 
We've got fucking power plants deteriorating all over the place, all over the world. And you know what's going to happen? We're not going to repair and fix them until we need to. Until everyone has agreed that it's worth the money to switch and do these things. So yeah, it's going to take time. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm upset about it, but it's going to take time. But one way that we can make it take less time is starting to change what we're doing as soon as we can. Um, if you don't like Rust strictness and compile time guarantees, there's better seasons. Yeah, I don't know why people are writing Rust other than systems devs. It's way too hard of a fucking language. It's an exceptionally difficult language. The perf is great, but most people don't need perf. See, see the fact that everyone's writing Node.js, so no one cares about performance, right? Just use Go. You, you, you fucking use Node.js. I hate JavaScript. I think it's a terrible language, but like, still, still better than than C and C plus plus. I think. Um. Have you seen ATS code? I have not seen it. Okay, so we're gonna have the physical ranges. This is a B tree map. This is the. Um. Uh, U64 U size. My hangman kissing game is gonna be memory safe. Woo! <laughs> no security boundaries. Um, what do you think about framework development? I've never been the biggest fan of framework development, but that's because I don't use libraries. So I don't, I don't really. I don't know. I think frameworks are are really dangerous. I think, I think frameworks really promote a lot of code churn and they promote a lot of specialized knowledge where like you don't actually know how to write JavaScript, you know how to write Node.js. <laughs> like if someone asked you to set up some like file structure or database, uh, data structure in JavaScript, you'd have no idea how, but you do know how because you know Node.js and it provides it for you. And then you get situations where people bring in Node.js in every single environment because they don't know how to sort a fucking string without Node.js. I know that's not a realistic case because you can do that in Java, but you understand my point. <laughs> um, this is mapping from physical address bases into their size and mini dump offsets. <laughs> I know the MongoDB web skill meme bear fit if that's what it is. Said no chance. Okay, so that's gonna map those. And here we're just gonna say um let mute fizz ranges is equal to B tree map new um create some new physical ranges technically we could do this like after we set all this shit up doesn't really matter because if we fail we fail but we'll do this and then we'll say fizz ranges dot insert base page times 4096 then we're gonna have oh I just, I can slice that because I'm, I'm in Rust. As long as I have the lifetime satisfied on this, which is probably fine, we'll do this. This will just be mapping for physical address bases into their contents. E, Z, P, Z. So we got a base page here, and then here we'll do buff.get page offset to um page offset that's true it is uh page offset plus page count times 4096 um put a question mark on that and then add this range to the mini dump database okay and then here we'll return uh mini dump fizz ranges so far that's really all i care about i'm of course going to care about the register state and stuff uh lifetime and this needs to be an a ref 
Okay, and this returns a self. Um, I just looked, looked as good as C++ on the stream. Stream, uh, or on the screen, yeah. I do like how C looks. I don't like how C++ looks, but I do like how C looks quite a bit. Um, try into... Okay. So we're going to convert this into a, a U size. Try into that, and then wrapping mole 4096, or checked mole. Oh yeah, check all those bounds. Base page is U64, and here we'll do a checked mole 4086. Okay, base page. Base pattern, and this is the region size. There we go. And then the page offset is from there, and then here we'll just do this is equal to page count. Yeah, this is equal to page offset checked add. Region size. Um, not found an option. Oh, we'll put a little question mark on that. Mini dump, B tree map. Oh, extern crate, Alec. Lead plant. Thank you so much for the tier one. Fuck yeah. I like the way Rust looks more than C++. I agree with that. Try into U size. Oh, you can't do that. Mm. That's U size. Can I do that? No, I, uh, that's stupid. Um, let region size is equal to region size. Checked mole 4096. Region size. That little rant deserved a sub. I ain't definitely go on a lot of rants. That's for damn sure. Um, at a static lifetime? No, that's getting an A. Um, and this can be a B, which outlives A. Just so we can be a little bit stricter there. Or more relaxed. Okay. So that's now parsing a mini dump, and I should be able to print those regions uh, for sequel to this for patter data in mini dump fizz ranges dot iter print o sixteen x o sixteen x, and then we'll do patter and then patter plus data dot len. Minus one. Mini dump, mini ump. Half hour to learn Rust. That's a, that's a stretch. Starting with Rustev and uh, Cargo is really helpful for stars like me. I love Cargo. I love having a build system that is slightly standardized. Um, I can't, I can't stand just like random ninja make file C make files. Okay, so here are all the memory ranges, and that looks good. And then let's print just a, a smidge. O two x. We'll print a small amount of the contents. We'll do data. We'll print the first eight bytes, and then we're gonna validate that it seems as if that data is correct. 
so let's take a look. So now I can, over here, on my debugger, I can say dump the physical memory as bytes starting at this address. And we see E940.06. Looks great. And then let's do it here. Uh, we should have a 3 in there. Yep, we got a 3 there. And let's try it here. Uh, 70B285. Okay, I think it's safe to say that I've parsed the memory out of here. And we're, that's all we're going to worry about right now. We're, we're not going to worry about anything else. So we're going to move this. Um, we call this project Mini Dump. So we'll go into chocolate milk, shared, make sure mini dump, mini dump, move from dump dump star to here, move full dump to server files, cargo lock, cargo clean. Okay, now that's part of this project and we'll just pull that in as a dependency. Uh, um, kernel, kernel, cargo toml, atomic vec, s atomic vec, replace that with a, what are we going to replace this with? Do, 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 um, Uh, mini dump. That's what we called it. Whoops. Ugh. Okay, so this should now build. We pull that in as a dependency, which is great. Shared mini dump source. I don't think I need EPT anymore. Folk TP, snapshot it app. We already have open page table. Test fuzzer, that's fine. Okay, so we have a mini dump here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass in a mini dump. Um, is there a creator pattern you'd recommend to translate a, a C bit fields, a C bit field struck into Rust? You can try Rust bind gen for that, um, but it is a pain. <laughs> C makes sucks ass, makes sucks ass. Yeah, I mean, I like them because they're, it's obvious what's going on, but then people don't, people use genius specific extensions and that pisses me off. And then your make files aren't portable. Now they're dependent on a specific GNU make version. Uh, I just don't understand how people like use bleeding edge features in a build system. Come on, it's a fucking build system. It's not, it's not, not that fucking hard. Just write your write your dependencies. Write your make files. It's part of your code base. Have like your make files shouldn't just be automated bullshit. Like I, I don't know. I never I never really understood that mindset. Every time a library says it supports Windows, it requires make. Oh yeah, I get that Sigwin fired up or whistle fired up. Oh, Okay, so we're gonna download uh, full dump dot dump. I think is the name of the file. Uh, ls server files. Okay, we have a full dump dot dump. Yeah, I think we'll only. Right now we'll just fuck around with the mini dump. Extern up uh, use mini dump mini dump. Okay, and then um this creates a new net worker. I wanna do that. I wanna make a net backing here. And I move that net backing in there. So we'll do a let net backing is equal to arc new net backing memory. We'll do this net backing. And then we should be able to parse that now. We can do uh, 
Mini dump, parse, net backing. Let's dump is this. Um, and we just got to clone this. And as long as we ref that, this might just work. Oh, duplicate lang item. Uh, yes, yes, yes. This has to be uh, no standard. So this is a, a full system mini dump parser for Windows kernel dump f dump name uh, commands. Pretty descriptive. Okay, mini dump is not pub. Okay, make that pub, make this pub. It's a non-mutable reference, so not a big deal. We can get that pub. Um, 8.57. Yep. Okay, so we are where we want it. We just got to ref deref this. Shoop. Oops, on this. Shoop. Okay, I found net backing. Oh, um, double DRF. What? Oh, because that has the memory in it. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Net backing memory. Ref that. That's a vector. There we go. I was about to say. Okay, so this should parse that mini dump, and um, I'm gonna stash that somewhere in the fuzz session. So this is the mini dump. So this is the parsed mini dump. Lives for as long as A. We already have an A ref on this structure. Uh, mini dump. This is gonna be Windows specific. Right now, we'll change that in the future, but for now, I mean, I honestly might just convert things into mini dumps as part of the dev process. Dump. Uh, expect failed to parse mini dump. So this is um, parse the mini dump uh, from the network memory. Okay. Netbacking is borrowed there, and then we, yeah, we gotta stash that. So we'll do uh, netbacking, netbacking. Um, arc net. Let's whack this in here, and then that should take care of that lifetime, I think. Uh, eight. Oh, netbacking. Eight ninety four. Um, that's guaranteed. I think that should do the trick. Move out of net backing occurs here. Bar of that happens there. Move happens there. Is there no way for me to express this? Um, I don't think this works because it doesn't know the lifetime. Yeah, because it's temporarily created. So I'm going to have to move that into the mini dump. But I don't have access to the net mapping in the mini dump. So I might just move this out of the library and then I don't have this problem. Let's take a look. Um, kernel source mini dump. This way I can have the net mapping in here. Under, uh, arm RF shared, oops, shared mini dump. Okay, and then we'll split kernel cargo toml, get rid of mini dump, pub mod mini dump. Now, that means I'll be able to put a net mapping inside of there. 
Okay, 28. And this. Crate, mini dump, mini dump. Oh, I don't think I can have a reference to an arc that I have inside myself, can I? Well, I could move that. Yeah, I guess I'm just not going to have that reference, am I? Um, yeah, when we move something, the, the owner won't know that it's borrowed. So I think we'll just have to do this then into their, um, uh, into their, into the file offset and size. Into the, that. So this is a uh, parsed mini dump, and this is um, parse a full Windows um, mini dump generated by dump f dump name in wind bag. Okay, no longer use this. That's fair, and this is just gonna have this. And then when we store this, we will store the offset and the region size. I think they're both U sizes at this stage. Okay, 766, parse mini dump. Um, checked add, 56. Uh, 56, checked add. Strongly type that as U size because it doesn't know. Okay. Unused attributes. Okay. Nice. So now what we can do is when we have a fault, um, that'll look through CR3, and then we have to set CR3. We'll we'll just manually set some of these things shortly, but we'll see, uh, we'll see what we can find here. Um, cause this is hitting filled in that map. Failed to net map. Full dump dot DMP. Full dump dot DMP. Okay. Full dump dot DMP. How is that failing? Seven eighty. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, we don't have any of this shit. We'll have an info. This will just be the dump. Read only. Info we're currently not using. Which means we don't set any of the register state. Regs. Okay, and then we never create registers. That's fine. We're going to need a way of communicating that soon, but it's not a big deal. Boom. Page in from network. Okay, so we're hitting that right away. 552. 
And at this stage, what I want to do is I want to figure out what page I belong to. And this logic is the, um, where's Desu when I need him? Um, we'll split this. It's the same logic that I use in, in this module list. Resolve module, okay. So what I want to do is I have a physical address. And I want to translate, and this is a aligned physical address. So I'm going to align that GP by doing self dot mini dump dot fizz ranges dot range inclusive of the address next back um, expect. Uh, physical memory not present in network. Oh, and I can just return none here. Yep. So this is um, offset size is equal to this. And this should be print resolved x2 offset and size, gp enter dot zero offset size. Um, oh, that's on self. This is um, um, so that's going to be network back memory. Only if we have network back memory, then we'll back out to um, session is equal to this. So this is what I want. I want to get access to the fuzz session. Then from session, mini dump. Um, that's going to get the nearest thing that satisfies the allocation. And... Oh yeah, this is uh, it's the physical address, offset and size. Okay, so this should now, ooh, unwrap on none. Oh yeah, because I'm mapping in null. Okay, so let's set some registers. We'll set CR3, we're gonna hard code CR3. Temporarily, guest CR3. We're going to set that to whatever it is in the mini dump. This is the CR3 of the mini dump. So I'll set this to this. Okay. Unwrap on a none. Oh, I don't set RIP, do I? We'll set RIP. Once again, we're just hacking this stuff in. We're just testing. I'm gonna grab this. I think this is still gonna fail. Yep. And this is at 553. Prints the GP adder, the guest physical address. So this is wherever the fault occurred at. Wait. Oh, I don't have a session. Um. Net mapping. This is going to be the mini dump. Uh, parsed mini dump of the network mapping. Mini dump. Don't need this net backing. Boop, 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 boop. 
So here we're just going to parse that memory. And then we'll pass that. Oh yeah, before I make the net backing, we're going to parse the memory. Um, and here we'll have memory and mini dump. And just put a reference on that. It's a net mapping, so 559, mini dump. Perfect, that's no longer in session. Okay, I was about to say this makes no sense, and now it does. So this is going to be netmem.minidump. This will find the first region that the access belongs to. Deadlock, deadlock. Is this an actual deadlock? 558. I'm inside of a print. Get page. Yeah, I've got a print lock held. Because this. Let VM exit is equal to worker fuzz case. Couldn't print in that case. Fixed. Yeah, you can post a link of what you're working on. I'm fine with that. Page in from network. Okay, resolved this to this region. Ho, 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 ho. Then we're going to say if GP adder is greater than or equal to the fizz adder and GP adder is less than or equal to. Uh, if it's greater than or. If that is greater than or equal to the fizz address, we'll say the fizz base. If it's greater than or equal to the fizz base and the GP adder dot zero minus fizz base is less than the size. Um, if, if this is less than the base or this is greater than the offset is greater than or equal to the size. If we have 4K and we're accessing 4K and we find this as the nearest thing, yeah, if it's, this is correct. So if the GP adder is less than the fizz base, it's invalid, which should never happen. I technically don't need that check. Or if the physical address minus the fizz base, so the offset into that region, if that is greater than or equal to the size of the region. So make sure our address falls in the region. I love this next back. I'm going to use this a lot. So this is find the uh, region near it, uh, which may contain our address. Then we're going to resolve that. If it's greater than or equal to, yeah, if the offset is greater than or equal to the size, equal is fine. And then we just got to put some, sprinkle in some DRFs here. Oh, expected U64 fund U size. 64. Just cast that shit. Fizz base. Done. Okay, so we should still see the print. Now, what we should see is let data is equal to net mem. What's up? Uh, memory dot, we'll go from the offset in the memory plus the offset of ourselves in here. Uh, let's um, intra, eh, let offset is equal to offset plus, eh, checked add, because we can, it's free, who cares, um, as u64. Question mark. So this is compute the offset into the memory based on our offset into the uh, region. So take the region offset and then add the offset into the region. And this will be offset to offset plus 4096. And I'm just going to assert offset and 
Uh, offset and FFF is zero. Whoa. Um, page offsets. No, we know that's aligned. Uh, not aligned. We'll fucking panic anyways. Who cares? Um, this is going to get the memory corresponding to that. Uh, get a slice to the memory backing uh, this requested region. And then at this stage, I will then be able to print the data. And we can see O2X. That should be roughly the uh, 568. That should be roughly the... Oh, yeah, that didn't fit. Back to U64. That's true. This is as U size. Okay. Oh, that's the full page. Let's just print the uh, start of that page just so we can reference that and we'll see if it's valid. So we know the physical address that's being requested to be accessed. In this case, we are trying to read this. So in my debugger, I can, we'll send the debugger over here. Um, we're going to dump the bytes here. 678815B2, a Okay, I think this works. So we were able to find the region, we found our offset into the region, and then we found the bytes that need to back that page. So at this point, I can then re return a virtual address of the data. Data as pointer, as U64. So at that point, we have found that region. Um, okay. Um, how are you using KD in your uh, custom kernel? I'm, I'm not, this is not on my kernel. That being said, I can add KD support pretty easily. Oh, we're paging stuff in. Wow, we did a whole translation, and then we're looping. Um, wow, okay, I was, um, wow, that happened fast. Uh, panic, done. <laughs> we had an EPT violation, we paged that in. And then we panicked at done. Oh, EPT. Get, um. We tried to translate, and then if this is sum, if we successfully translated, then we continue the VM loop. So that's going to page it in. Okay, so this should work now. Wow. So we should have a couple EPT violations. Print handled this. Uh, VM exit. So we'll print the VM exit that we handled. So here we go. We handled an access of this, access of this, access of this, and an access of this. And then we faulted trying to access this for execution, the B72. Is that the actual uh, location we should be executing? B72, it, it is. Um, okay, so we're having issues. Okay, so let's try to check the virtual address of this. Uh, PFN of this. Oh, that page isn't present, is it? Oops. Is that page not present? No, I've, I've definitely executed bytes out of that page, I think. There's a chance that this is paged out.
Um, we're trying to execute that. Oh, it's it's marked presence. What's the page fault then? That would be. Is that permissions? Um, we have a page fault of a present page. We're doing a user access. And we're trying to execute as a user. Oh, um, map. No, I mean, that's just a straight page fault. I get an e EPT violation if it was trying to execute that. So this is a real guest page fault. And this is what it's trying to access, this. Oop, DB, DPSP. Yep, this is a page table entry. And then we try to access this. Um, I forget how we do this. Okay, here we have a page table entry. Um, okay, it's doing the page table lock. Um, DPS, if this, that is executable. I'm not filling in that page correctly. It's not seeing, um, no, I mean, I am because it's doing that walk. I have no idea how that works. So this is the physical page. If we print this, this is the physical page. Uh, and we have to do zero, zero backtick. This is the physical page containing this code. So if we go to B72, this should be, there's the CC. And we're getting a page fault on a present page. How? <gasps> Wait. No, that's the address that it's accessing. And that address is fine. The fuck is that? Like, we filled in the pages, I'm pretty sure. So we're like, we're flying right now. And for some reason, son of a bitch, son of a bitch. How, how does that, how does that? I'm trying to execute this page and I'm getting a page fault. And I'm getting a page fault. So I was about to finish indexing my code base. 100,000 errors. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've never seen a tool like that not just be full of errors. That page is present. It's, mar it's marked 25, means it's marked for user access. It's marked user access. It's marked present. It's not writable. So how is this happening? We get an exception due to a page fault. But why? Fuck. 
What dumbass thing am I doing today? Get page. Is it weird like it's getting an old virtual address, not the one from the fault? I don't think so, because that's... I get it in that way. It, it's, it's likely something like that. It's likely something very silly that we're doing here. I got the page from the master. The master will get it from memory. That will return it here. We should never hit a net mem that we're doing a translate on. I mean, we might. I can actually do a self get page in this case. Right? I'm pretty sure that's valid. We're not hitting that panic, so it doesn't matter. Page fault. Is it my VPID? Is it using an old TLB entry? I don't think so, because I don't have that feature enabled. Get the page from ourself. That's going to go up to here. If the page is not mapped, then it's going to get it from network mem. Okay, good. This will map everything in. We... Write, read, exec, user exec, if write was requested. If it exists, then we promote it. If it exists, then we map it. We create a copy of it, read, write, exec, user exec. In this case, read, write, uh, read exec, user exec, this is an alias to the original memory. That should work. I'm gonna try and clean up some of these things. Num pages. Yeah, I guess I don't care about that. What else we got here? Unused size of. I'm just trying to clean up all the warnings and errors because sometimes Rust will tell me when I'm doing something real stupid. FX save and register state, don't use right now. Technically not using vert address. On the test fuzzer. Um, netmem, six, ooh, 629. If we have netmem, Um, 54, that's inject. 240, unnecessary, unsafe. Yeah, that's where we reset. So, currently we don't reset memory. That's going to be a problem, but that doesn't matter yet. Okay. No warnings, no errors. VPID. Cache translations of linear addresses are associated with a virtual processor identifier. Um, when that is zero. The only thing I could think of, I mean, it says that it's present. And that would only happen if there's an access violation. That either means executable is not doable or user mode is not doable. We are in user land, but the page is marked user. Okay, what about all levels of it? So the root level of the table, executable, user read write, user read write, user write. Oh, that's the last level. Top level, non-executable.
2.94A7F8. That's true. It's not executable. Huh. So we're having an, a violation due to execution because the top level of the table doesn't let us execute that memory. Um, so this is likely the kernel CR3 then for that process and not the user CR3. A, B. Um, oops. What is this? DPSP. Let's go to physical directly afterwards and directly before. Okay, that's actual contents of memory. So that's a kernel of CR3. So... I think that's what's happening. Is that that we can just turn off NX? Um, EFR. Load I thirty two EFR. Okay. All this should be zero. How am I not do how am I doing this without setting the EFR? How did this ever work? Oh, that saves and restores it. Nope. E F E R. We don't want save and load. Okay. That means I'm using mine, which has NX set. All right, so we want to set those. Oh, yeah, because I didn't have syscall enabled. Oh, interesting. But that has LME. Hmm. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll grab the, we'll set the guest EFR. Um, debug control, uh, guest IA32 EFR register, guest IA32 EFR is equal to OX2806. Then we're going to set the guest EFR. Mm, debug control. So the guest EFER to zero, and this should this should fail to enter the VM. Well, this is not going to yet because we have to set the loading and saving of that. Load EFER control. So we have to set that control. It's fine. We want it anyways. There we go. 20 and 21. And this is for what? Exit controls? Exit on. One shift 20 or one shift 21. 20 and 21. Save load EFER. Save load EFER on exit. And then uh, 
This value is loaded into that as part of the entry. Okay. Load EFER on VM entry. So entry on. We want to load the EFER. And we'll do this via one shift 15. And we'll get rid of it here. Okay, so that'll load the EFER, and this will maybe fail because we don't have long mode set. We hidn't. We hit a breakpoint. On the host? What? Obj dump m intel d target release. Tar uh, build kernel target x86 release kernel.exe bin dash 77ff vm resume. Oh, we hit this in three. I see. And we hit that int three because we failed the launch. And we failed the launch because the EFER that we give it is fucked. And that's fine. Okay, that is well within the re uh, realms of what I was okay with. So we'll set the EFER um, one shift 10 or one shift eight. This is uh, long mode enable and active. That should fix that. And then we're not going to do an X. Um, it, does, it doesn't need an X, does it? Maybe this requires an X. I'm not sure. Reserved. Hmm. And that was on a what? A VM resume? It was on VM launch. So the first launch failed and fell through. So shell stuck on the last <laughs> CPP files? Oh man, dude. The MSR is loaded on VM entry. Okay. Load EFER. On exit, I want to save it, and then I want to load it. Twenty and twenty one. Twenty and twenty one. Since this specifies that LMA is always set to the logical and of PG and LME, PG is always set to one, LMA is always equal to LME and root operation. There's not a there's not a host one I have to set, is there? Oh, there's a host EFER. Ah. Okay, this is host EFER register. Oops. Um put this host Post. This makes sense. Two CO two. Um, long mode active. Enable. This is um. Uh, NX enable. NX enable. 
LM those. Okay, and then this, this is for the guest, EFER, and then we fixed it. So we'll set the host EFER, and we'll set the guest EFER, and then we have an exception in accessing something else. Um, you know, why aren't we only seeing one level there? Executes not set. The address is this. This address is the, okay. I think NX is an and of all the bits. We might actually not have to turn off NX. It's saying that the page is present. What would be the causes of that? It's not marked user? The whole level is user. I am executing user mode. Well, here, I'll go kernel mode. So now it's a kernel mode application. Um, I know we break one of those. One of these we have to set as well. EPT. CR3. Oh, it's because I don't have it's because I don't have VPID set, I think. Bam. I don't have the VPID stuff, I think. Nope. Uh, fuck. These access rights, what are the um, oh yeah, these are ring, we need to make these ring zero access rights for these. Kernel source, where would I have those? I think this is nine, nine three. Yeah, I think those are nines. Should do the trick. Now this will fail, nice. And then these we can set to 0, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0. And now we're running user line of code as kernel. Don't do this at home, kids. Um, and we're still getting a fault. OK. And we're no longer user. Lava cubes is marked as sensitive content. I didn't get a, I didn't get a pop up for that. That's kind of weird, though. Shit. Dude, I was not expecting to get stuck on this for an hour. It is present. We're not writing to it. We're not executing it. Why would that cause an exception? Oh, we can't have the NX set. If... If we have NX enabled, if we don't have NX enabled, then that top bit is reserved. Yeah, because now it's doing the full page table lock. And then this is failing because of that. Okay. Back to user land. We're getting there. We're getting there, y'all. Um. I think it's still an NX issue. Uh, I don't turn on SMAP, so that shouldn't be a thing. Write protect. With NX is one. Instructions may be fetched from any supervisor mode address with the translation for which the XD 
is zero in every paging structure entry controlling the translation. Instructions may not be fetched from any supervisor mode address for which the XD is one. So yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting NX. And then that NX bit is reserved. I think I need to find a different page table then. I think I'm getting, this is probably not the actual CR3 that's used. This is a kernel CR3, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't allow execution of user land. So somewhere out there, there's another CR3. And that would totally make sense with what I've seen before. So let me see if I can find a different CR3. Um, fake app.exe. This is the directory base, 2894A. And that's what I set, I think, as my CR3. 2894A. Oh, let's get rid of this just to try that. Because maybe it is VPID. Maybe it is VPID. I don't think it is, though. I think it's because one of them is NX. Shit. Um, DTE process of this. I bet there is a user page table. Um, there's the peb. There's gotta be a user page table somewhere. Where's the page table? Oh, VM. E process. VM. VM. Oh, more prints. Just add more prints. Instance. Mm. Shared. There's the shadow mapping. Device map, peb. Where do I get the page table address? It's gotta be in here, right? Oh, it's this K pro. Oh, let's K process this. K process this. Uh, here's the K process. Here's the directory table base. Oh, user directory table base. Alert, alert. Paste. Easy, easy. Now we got a break point. Hell yeah, I'll be right back. I'm gonna hit that. <laughs>
<laughs> Does anyone understand what just happened? Some progress has been achieved. Yeah, we just got um, we just got arbitrary execution inside of a guest. <laughs> so we were able to run code inside of there. Now there's a CC there, right? There's a breakpoint there because that's what we have execute. But let's skip over that. And then we'll talk about what happened in a second. Are you going to have direct KDNet support to your VM? Yes, I will. And that won't require actually setting the debug flags. So it'll be it'll be like a true debugger because the it won't require code to execute in the guest because I won't be I won't be talking to the kernel debugger. I will be faking out all the structures. I can actually do that pretty easily. Throughout a day of work. All right. So I'm going to change a number to a number plus one. And now we skip over the breakpoint. Now we're going to fault because we like don't set the register state, but... Uh, yeah, here we get a page fault accessing zero. And I'm going to print the PC. Uh, print PC is at... Oh, that's very Android. Um, VM exit uh, worker.vm.guestregs.rep. So this is going to tell me where I fault. And I can guarantee I'm going to fault the second I hit the fucking rat. Because I, I don't give a RSP. So PC is here. If we look at six... Uh, you rip 6p75, yeah, that's on the ret. But we executed two and in, uh, one instruction, we xword eax. <laughs> All right, let's get the register state loaded in there. Yeah. We're zeroing EAX. Hell yeah, guys. That's good. And gals. Um. Never has that instruction look more exciting. I mean, that was, what, four hours? Four hours of work, and we got uh, arbitrary execution inside of a VM that we copied over from a snapshotted Windows guest. Let's make this shit syscall, though. Let's get this back into the kernel. We're going to do the real shit. If y'all are ready for this. Da, 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 da. All right. Let's take a look at the context structure. This is the context of the CPU. It doesn't have everything, but it has a lot of it. It doesn't have some of the system specifics. But we can use this to populate the registers, at least the GPRs and the floating point registers, with uh, with whatever we need. Um, in fact, they use an X save here, so we can actually <clears throat> we can X save depending on the X save state. But I think we're just gonna ignore that. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna ship this over to here, and then oops. And then we're going to write a parser in our mini dump stuff to grab the register states. And we're going to do this. We know that this is a pdump header 64 structure. So this, oops, um, yoink paste. So this is the,
Um, I mean, I guess I don't care where I get that from. There we go. It's an NT has it. Okay. So for a mini dump, we have the context record here. So this is um, get the context from the mini dump. This will be let context is equal to buff that get three forty eight hex to 348 hex plus 3,000. Done. Woo. That was, that was thrilling right there. <laughs> we parsed a structure. We're going to rep a structure now. Uh, we're going to do pub struct uh, context record 64. And then we just do some really, really, really fun stuff here. <laughs> P1 home. P1 home. U64. P2 home. P3. P4 home. P5 home. P6 home. Context flags. MXCSR. Uh, CS, DS, FS, GS, SS, oops, uh, CS, DS, ES, FS, GS, SS, E flags, DR0, DR1, DR2, DR3, DR6, DR7. Are you guys thrilled by this? Racks, RCX, RDX, RBX, RSP, RBP, R RBP, RSI, RDI, R8, R9, R10, R11. R12, R13, R14, R15, rip. And then we have the floating save. I'm just gonna say FX save. And this is OX 300. Well, that's Beck Bregs. Yeah, we're just going to say 4C8 minus OX. I think it's just 100 hex. Um, so 968. Okay. Then I'm going to assert core mem size of context. 64 is equal to size of context ox4d0 whoa context size mismatch all right so now we can just see for hitting that assertion um oh context record yeah we'll just call it context 64 Thrilling, riveting research here. Hey, we fucked something up. Or we did padding wrong. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, 6. Context flags, U4, a U4 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 U4s. CS, DS, ES, FS, GS, SS, E flags as a 4 byte. That's 4, that's 4, that's 4, that's 4. Um... Four and four, that's eight. That's eight. This is aligned again. DR zero, one, two, three, six, and seven. Racks, RCX, RDX, RBX, RSP, RBP, RDI, RSI, RDI, 
8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and rip. Okay. Okay. There should be no gaps. Nine sixty-eight. What did I do wrong, y'all? Four C eight should be the size of the whole. Con oh, no, forty O. Wait, why did I do four C eight? Ah, oh, I'm such a dum dum today. Seven six. LTN Bob, thank you so much for the raid. How was your stream? Are you up to some fun stuff? Done. Done. Easy shit. Okay. Huzzah. Oh my god. All right, how do I do multi-line? How do I do multi-line cursor and vim? Where's my vim chat at? Oh, I can do block select, right? If I do visual block, then it's capital I, and then capital A for end, Or do I hit escape here? I thought I hit escape. Because I can't hit an, a cap A. I'm going to hit escape. Okay, it worked. <laughs> we, we did it. Cap I. Wow. Wow. Context flags? All right. We are Vim Power users now here. This is the Vim channel. Welcome to the Vim channel. Um, here we use Vim very, very, very effectively. Bam! Oh, that's so good. All right, this is the 64-bit um, AMD 64 context structure. Um, context structure uh, from Windows. Now we can cast that. Um, we got that, and then context is equal to unsafe core pointer read unaligned buff as pointer as const context 64. We did it. And then we'll uh, drive debug for this. It's not gonna like that because of this. Oh, I got a port here. Oh, it's delicious. I never really have ports sent home, but I'm very happy that I do. This is a... There's not really a good trick around here, is there? I guess we're just not debug printing it. Bucket. Bucket. We'll do it live. So read on the line, buff pointer as a context 64. And then I should be able to print the like rip. Um, Context.rip. Uh, rip. That should work. Correct? Um. Oh, this is not buff. This is context. Okay, this is the rip. That's correct. All right, so I'm guessing we parsed out the register state. So at this stage, we can return uh, pub regs context, or we'll say context, with a context 64. And this is the 64 bit context for the mini dump. And then we'll just 
Um. Context. And now that's a, now that's a field I have access to. Now, <laughs> all this shit in Snapshot app when we start a new fuzz session. You have let context followed by let unsafe. Let's see. Let's check out what I did here. Um. Oh, in this case, yes. So sometimes I do this instead of having a mutable context where I overwrite it like this. I just shadow over the old one in Rust. I don't think there's any ramifications to doing that. Maybe it like bloats the stack. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's just a common thing that I do when I kind of no longer want this old one. So in this case, this is a, a slice of the original bytes. And here I basically cast it into something else. And by reassigning over it, I make sure that uh, this is no longer accessible. So it kind of overwrites that old uh, let binding. So yeah, that's a that's kind of a common thing that I that I do. I'm hoping the compiler's smart enough to reason about that, and I think it is. Yeah, it just looks weird. Yeah, it's definitely strange. I start I try and do that in C now, and I it really sucks when I don't have aliasing in C. Okay, now we want to set the registers for our stuff. A lot of places where shadowing is useful. Yeah, it's a really neat construct. Okay, so now I want to set all the registers. So I parse that, and then I'm going to do regs is equal to this. So this is uh, create a new register state. Regs dot... I guess we just go down the list of my regs. Right? So we just start assigning these. Racks is equal to mini dump dot context dot racks. Let's just make sure that's working. We're gonna need to pull that in private field. Okay, we gotta make some privates um, or publics. We're gonna go context sixty four register states. It's not pulled in. That is in VTX. We can grab exception from the same line. Beautiful. Then we're in our mini dumper. It's also great because you don't need to come up with an intermediate variable names. Yeah, exactly. You have fewer variable names. You don't have to worry about binding something to um, an old type, which uh, doesn't match. So you can rebind. Like in that case, I, I used a new binding on top of it. Oops. And I don't want to do lower I. Capital I. Pub space escape. Oh my god. I'm a Vim wizard. Thank you, chat. You're the, the you're the real Vim wizard. <laughs> okay. Um, Rax is equal to this. So we're then going to load up all the things that we can from the all of the register states that we have: RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP, RBP, RSI, RDI, R8, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, rip, riffle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, rip, riffle. And I don't have a GS base, so that's going to be a problem. RBX, RCX, RDX, RSP, RBP, RSI, RDI, R8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, rip and riffle. Then the FX save. I don't know how big that is. I'm not a Vim wizard. <laughs> hey, that's fine. I'm not either. <laughs> Brian Mulinar is the real Vim wizard. He's the one that wrote it. Yeah. Uh, and copy the mini dump state into it. And we made a master. Then here we'll do master, mute master dot guest regs is equal to regs. 897. Master dot vm dot guest regs. 
So that will reassign all those registers. Um, E flags as U64. That'll be the R flags. You're a Vim wizard, Harry. I gotta rewatch Harry Potter, man. Okay. We ended up hitting a timeout. And that's probably because we're printing stuff. So let me go and see what I sent my timeout to. Let's just send my timeout to... Let's just not set a timeout. No timeout for you. Now there's no timeout. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we're crashing because we're hitting this. And we're, we have an exception at 60. I know what this is. This is GS. It's accessing GS 100%. It's GS colon 60. Yes, there it is. We're in get module handle. <laughs> we're executing stuff. Oh, I got to do the FX save stuff first. I got to make sure I do this. Um... Rep seal line 16. So what we're going to do... Uh, do y'all listen to music when I'm hanging out here? I'm always blasting music. Dude, I, f I fucking love music. It's so good. So fucking good. Um, rip is equal to this. We can get rid of all these old ones. FX save, haha, <laughs> that's actually right what we're about to do. Bam. Got the memory. We then parse out that FX save, and this is convert the FX save. Um, convert the FX save. And here we're going to do a mini dump context dot fx save from um, 512, 512 bytes as pointer. So that'll make sure that it's 512 bytes. Otherwise, that will panic. And then we convert that to a pointer, and then we read online and set that. So this is convert the uh, mini dump fx save. And now we have the floating point stuff. We get that from here. Okay, read online, context, and then we assign that as the guest regs, and that's everything except for GS base. We don't set GS base. Now, GS base, we can get from. Where's my debugger? Um, uh, process, ooh, RGS base. Shit, how do I get GS base? What's your favorite music? Uh, mainly like punk rock. Like pop punk, punk rock. The fact that uh, browser tabs don't have volume sliders is strange. Is there like volume control? There's probably like a plugin that does that. But yeah, that would actually be really slick. I feel like that's something a browser would have. It's just like hidden somewhere. Um, so I can't get GS base directly there, but I can get GS base through... Um, it's actually uh, often a hard problem. We're gonna look at um, test.exe, which I think is the name of our process, or um, let's just look at process. This is the current process. Here's the teb for the current process, and that's our GS base. So what we're gonna do is we are going to have to manually specify that for now. We overwrite the rip, and we'll overwrite the GS base with this. And that is now the GS base that we're going to use. And this stuff we don't need. So we set rip, we advance rip past the breakpoint, and now this is going to be able to execute past there. And we do, we have an exception of a page fault at this location, and that's a page fault on rip, and I would suspect that is a page which is not mapped in. Um. And we haven't syscalled, um, but we're now executing. <laughs> we're now legitimately execute. This is exactly nine nine nine, nine nine eight. <laughs> um, we are now executing 
this user space application. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that everything is paged in on the system. Um, basically, that this has been memory mapped in this uh, this program, and we end up jumping to location that is not currently present. Um, we're in user mode, we're executing, and this is not present. And if we look, this is in the application range. And this effectively means that the, um, the page that we're accessing is currently paged out. So... Oh yeah, and I never explained uh, that um, CR3 stuff. Someone, someone was talking about that, that it was like voodoo magic. So what happened there? So when we're looking at the um, process structure, so if I take a look at process for my own process, I can then use this. This is like the kernel has a concept of what a process is. And what I can do is I can dump that out by dumping this K process structure. And this will tell me information that the kernel knows about this, uh, this process. In this case, there was um, there is the a directory table base, and this is the kernel's page table directory. And as we saw, it had everything mapped out for userland. Basically, the um, or had everything start set as not executable, and that means that we can't execute userland code while in the kernel, uh, which makes sense. You don't want to end up accidentally. That's a common exploit technique, so it's a common mitigation to not have that uh, mapped. So this directory is actually going to have the process mapped in as well as the kernel mapped in. Um, and that allows the kernel to access both the kernel and the process so it can read and write memory into and out of the, the, um, the program. But this is not what the base will be used for inside of an application. In an application, it'll use this user directory table base. This will not have the kernel mapped in. And this is a relatively new feature as of Meltdown. Um, Meltdown is effectively what caused there to be a different table base. And that's why it's so late in this structure. But effectively, the problem was I was using the kernel uh, CR3 when trying to execute user mode code. So anyways, we skip over the breakpoint. And I think what we're going to do here is we're just I think we're just going to take a different snapshot. Um, paging can be a major issue here. So I'm going to turn off paging. Now, things can still need to be paged in that have never been accessed yet. Um, performance. There we go. So if I go here, can I... Is that something I can't change because I haven't activated Windows? Oh, I need to be admin. Um, P. Ugh. Is there a good way to run this as admin? Um, make a admin PowerShell. Oh, I have no password. Okay, and then we do. Um, I forget how to open the. I forget how to open the fucking control panel. It's not just CPL. Um, Users.cpl. Fuck. What is the fucking play? Okay. Um, users. Let's just set my... Dude, they have like broken the start menu so fucking bad. Now that there are settings everywhere, it's so fucking annoying. Um... <sighs> Solution? Login is built in admin. Run as, yeah. Oh, control.exe. Oh, shit. I never use run as. Machine name admin. Can you omit the machine name if it's the local machine? Disagree. Okay. Um, users. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. 
So at this point, I want to um, performance. <laughs> paging file, no paging file. Okay, so that'll turn off paging. So that'll prevent things from getting paged out, but it won't prevent things from not getting paged in if they're never read. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of like, gonna kind of warm up those systems because we can't touch devices, right? We can't page things in because um, we don't have devices mapped in. How much harder do you think it is to get into low-level programming stuff now than it was, say, 15 or 20 years ago? Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, I would say it is probably easier to get into in terms of the quality of the resources, but harder to get into in terms of the um, the frequency of the materials, if that makes sense. So like fewer people are doing it now than before, so it's harder to find the information, but when you find the information, it's likely much better. Because honestly, if we've just learned how to do technical writing better. Like if you read a blog from about 10 years ago, you'll find that they, they typically just aren't written in the same way that we communicate ideas anymore. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting there. Okay, so we have our test application, and we, what we want to do is we're gonna, we have to make a new snapshot. Um, we should be able to break into that. I think that's on seven, four. It's on four. Um, and... Oh, this is not the VM I wanted to use. I used the wrong VM, like an idiot. I'm gonna shut down that VM so I don't screw up again. There we go. Not just fewer people, but don't you think the minimum required knowledge to get more or less modern um, Minimum required knowledge has gotten far higher. I, I don't necessarily think so. Do you play CTF? I do not. Um, okay, so we'll set the performance on this one. Yeah, best perf. does make VMs a little bit more usable. And then set the paging file. No paging file. Okay. And that won't take effect until I reboot, so I'll reboot. Similar to how there's a skill set uh, to reading data sheets. That <laughs> shit belongs on a resume. Oh, yeah, dude. Being able to read data sheets is more important than, like, knowing a lot of the stuff in the data sheet. Being able to quickly adapt, fucking nuts. Okay. So what I wanna do is I wanna make sure everything is paged in, in an application when I take a snapshot. And what's gonna be the best way of doing that? Um. I disabled the paging, so, um, yep. No page file, perfect, none. Okay, great. So we have no page file set. Now, that means that our test application that we wrote, our super high quality test application, is this not 64-bit? No, this is 64-bit, yeah, it is. Um, fake app. Fake app dot C. So there's my debug break. And the problem is, since that code is not really exercised, we don't actually see all the code. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do fake app dot exe. That's gonna hit the breakpoint. And what I should be able to do is I should be able to print uh where was it? Whatever address we were faulting at. 
here. Um, but that's not the same absolute address. Oops. Um, minus, I don't remember what the base of that was. I'm going to guess it's just this. So I'm just going to say that this is test app plus this. Oh, not test app. This is um, fake app. Oh, reload user. Fake app. Okay, so we got a bunch of jumps there, so it's not that. Let me see if I can find it in the history, and I hopefully will be able to. Somewhere I'll, dis I'll try to disassemble that, right? Yeah, right here. This is where we were failing before. And if we take a look, it is not mapped in. But if we put a breakpoint there, we will hit it. And there we go. We just hit it, and it did get mapped in because it does exist. It's a completely valid execution path. Um, so we're going to let this run, and then we'll try it again. This time, this is on the second run, we're going to see if this exists. And it doesn't. Okay, then we're going to need to handle that page fault, and we're going to need to inject that page fault um, to cause the page fault handler to get triggered. Uh, super, super fun stuff. We actually created that file during this execution. So now what we're going to do is the page fault, um, we're actually going to ignore that page fault. So when we set up our exceptions somewhere, we set our exception mask. Uh, here's the exception bitmap. I'm going to do not 0 and not 1 shift 14. That'll allow page faults to execute inside of the guest. And let's see what we get. This is going to probably fail because I don't have an IDT set up. General protection faults. Yeah, so I need to figure out the IDT. And the GDT. So, I set, um, let's see, can I, first of all, can I set these all to zero? And I think I should be able to. So we're going to set, we're going to set the guest, all of these registers to zero. Okay. And that's still fine. So now we need to set the IDTR and the GDTR. And we can get those through the mini dump. Well, not directly in here. We don't have those in our context. So we're going to hard code those very temporarily while we try to figure out how this shit works. So we'll sh send this to five. And then we'll do, um, we don't need this. And then we can do a DT of. Uh, process. Okay, here's our, that's our thread. We'll do dt of this, oops, dt k process of this. And we want to get the gdt base and the idt base. In fact, that might just be for our core itself. Where would that be? Um... KD debugger data block. So this tells us a lot of information about the debugger and things on the machine. So we have GGT for ring zero code and data and ring three code and data. That's pretty cool. The TSS that we should be using. Um, so we have that information. And we should be able to find in here, I would expect that there would be a GDT and IDT base, and maybe I scrolled past them. And they would be pointers. There's an LDT. We don't use an LDT. Loader block. Um. Physical memory block. Okay, a processor block. Because 
Because, I, yeah, I don't know where that IDT is. Actually, I think it... GDTR and IDTR. So here's the IDT. That's the IDT base. And this is the GDT base. I don't know where this gets it from. I have no idea. I, I, I don't know. The IDT length is FFF. Um, FFF. And the GDT limit is 57. Let's try this. See what happens. Invalid TSS. Nice. Nice. TR. We'll set the TR to 40. We'll set these selectors to what they currently are. Um, we've got a, a, an ES, 2B, a CS, 33, 2B for everything. FS is a 53, GS is a 2B. And then TR is a 40, correct? TR is a 40. All right, let's see if this works. Invalid TSS. Um, TR limit. TR limit. What do I set that to? Um, what are your go-to places for learning low-level dev when you started? I just kind of just wrote code. I just had a lot of projects. I didn't really have any resources. I had a mentor that taught me a lot. Um, but other than that, I just kind of read a lot of man pages and manuals and documents and data sheets. Um, I know that's not very glamorous, uh, but it's kind of how it is. That's, that's how I learn. I don't really learn from material too well. Um, IDTR limit, GDTR. If I have this at zero, we get a general protection fault, I think. Correct. So we are using the IDT. It's trying to find where to jump to during an interrupt. So we just had an exception occur, and it's trying to figure out where it's supposed to jump when this exception happens. Now, we're trying to get all the information that we need, which is relatively difficult. Um, 20 FB, that's working fine. F3, those are working fine for data accesses. LDTR we're not using, so that's not set. And then the TR, TR access rights. Let me take a look at kernel source interrupts. TR, LTR. So I load that, I load the GDT. The TR that I have, I use 89, 8B, that's valid and fine. And basically, invalid TSS. That means it doesn't know the, the TR base. So this is the IDT re uh, GDT register. So we can actually figure out the base, uh, bang GDT. Hmm, let me see if there's a way to do this. Windbag dump GDT. R GDT R, that shows the base. GDT L is the limit. Um, DG, DG at TR. Here we go. That's the TR base. And if I do DG at GS, does that give me GS base? Oh, D, um, sorry, uh, DG. It does not. So this is not necessarily the base of the TR, but we're gonna try it. I don't think that's a physical address. Yeah, that's definitely not the task register. And then that's a 67 hex is the TR limit. So we'll just set that. Double fault. 
Okay, so this will give us invalid TSS. If we have TR limit to zero, we just need to find the correct TR base. That's exactly what we need to do. We need to find the base of the TR. And flags 8B. And that's what I said. Um, so we have to uh, see windbag find TSS base. Is it possible to write a Windows, Windows driver in Rust? Absolutely. I mean, it's not like super supported, but you totally can. TSS dot TSS. Fuck. Add us to the TSS. Add us to the TSS can be found by examining the PCR. <gasps> no. 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 Are you kidding me? Oh. It just make everything null? God damn it. How do I know where that TCS is? The TSS is. Um next thread, PCRB. DTK processor. Um, isn't it K processor? XNT K processor. Um, processor data. Uh, Uh, structure, kernel. Is it just the KPCR? TSS base. IDT base, Urkel. Um. DTK PCR on this, and those are all null and zero. TSS base, right here. That's actually the TSS. Okay. Well, we found it. Um, we're gonna do like, I'm just going to make a comment. DT this. PCR. Uh, and this gives, gives GDT, TSS, IDT bases. And we got EB. We got DFB for the... Uh, DFB, GDT base. TSS. And the IDT base. That's basically everything I care about. All right, here we go. This should be able to do... We got a GP in the kernel. We're in the kernel now. We're in the kernel. We executed stuff. And we, do, we have a fuck stack. We have a GP because the uh, GDT is fucked. Um, thanks for the follows, everyone. I always miss the follows. Sorry about that. Um, so that is, we got a general protection fault, and that basically means that our GDT is probably getting fucked. And that would happen when that's our GDT. EDFB, zero, 
It's, it's like it's loading a, a bad stack. This is the stack that it'll actually end up using. Those are the ISTs. It's not using that. IOMAP base, 68. We're not using an IOMAP. So it's just 67. But yeah, we are in. We have made it to KI page faults, which is the entry point of page faults in the kernel. Um, so we need to continue execution. This means our uh, uh, stack segment is fucked. Because we can't execute the push. Or it means we can't execute the code. Uh, I'm guessing it's because the push is failing. NT is Windows internal stuff. The NT syscalls are for drivers. No, that's also what userland does. I mean, you use ZW in userland typically, but they're it's basically the same thing. The NT and ZW are, are very, very close to the same. They're not identical, but they're very close. So the IDT base is valid because we made it to a KI page fault. And we're getting a GPF. And a general protection fault, uh, basically, that passes an error code, so let's parse the error code. On VTX, um, here we have a error code. This is the error code pushed onto the stack. And this will be the, um, we'll just say zero, and then we'll fill that in down here. Won't well, we make that, and then, uh, here we go. If let exception general protection fault. Um, and this is the, this is the, the info. And what we'll do is if this is equal to exception, so you parse the exception, if this is equal to the exception, then we will set info is equal to the error that was pushed onto the stack. So this is info. Okay, so now we will have a little bit more information. It's just going to be the segment descriptor. It's going to be like 20 hex or something. 11 hex. Um, okay, that's really weird then. Okay, I like that because that's really bad. Um, we're in VTX and... We end up having a problem because 11B, and 11B would happen. 11B, or, or just 11 hex, sorry, not 11B. Um, 11 hex, so general protection faults are great. They're basically everything gets bucketed into one fucking exception, so you have no idea what actually happened. But if we take a look, sources of exceptions. Um, Exception reference, and GP is a uh, 13, and exceeding the segment limit when accessing these segments. Exceeding the segment limit when referencing a descriptor table. Um, transferring execution to a segment that is not executable. Um, loading the SS register with a segment selector for a read-only segment. And so these are all the things that can cause a general protection. The error code is an operand of the instruction. Um, that's not it. A selector from a gate, which is the operand of the instruction, that's not it. A selector for the TSS involved in a task switch, it's not that. And the IDT vector number. Um, if it's 
detected when loading a segment descriptor, the error code contains the segment selector uh, to or IDT vector number for the descriptor. So it's trying to load that descriptor. What the fuck? Um, IDT. Oh, I set that in here, don't I? What the fuck is that code? It's in here. Um, oh, capital. Um, IDT base, GDTR, TR is this. I don't think it's le these limits. Because otherwise we'd see that in just general execution, but we'll set all the limits to Fs. See what this does. I don't think this is the case. Yeah, that's just not even valid. Let's set SS to all Fs. This is not valid for 64-bit mode, so this shouldn't work. Okay. This is one my user mode knowledge is trash. Um, segment selector t 11. Is it the, um, are these selectors not good? That's what we use. We use all these, right? 2B, 2B, 3, 3F, or 5, 3, 2B for that, 40 for the TR. LDTR is not used. Um, so I need to figure out here Guess here, three. Unless that's supposed to GP. Unless I'm supposed to ignore that GP, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's intended. Or is it? How does, how does the switch to the kernel CR3 on an interrupt. Well, I have a trampoline, right? Let's check out the IDTR. Um, so these are the top bits, and then these are the low bits, I think, of the handler. So if we go to um, 14 times um, 14, which is actually a D, general protection, times 10, L2, DB this. This is the general protection fault handler. No, not quite. Uh, IDT. Oh, here we go. Here are all the IDT entry points. Oh, the shadows. So we do go into a shadow. So we actually go to KI page fault shadow, or we should. Are we hitting that? Are we hitting that? Let me uh, print that. Maybe I have the IDT for the wrong context and I need a user mode IDT. Yeah, there's probably a user mode IDT that I need to use. Same issue that we had before. Once again, all Spectre Meltdown related uh, mitigations. But I'm guessing I'm going to care page fault and I need to be going to care page fault shadow because I'm not in the right state. I, I don't have the right CR3, everything's fucked. Um, Let's see what I can find here. Um, let's go into single step. We'll set single step to one. 
we we're always gonna single step and then print VM exit at this and this is only on a single step. So if it is a single step, which is here, VM exit at this. I'm gonna disable the preemption timer for now while debugging all this shit. VM exit at 016x. And this is self.vm.guest regs rip. So this is going to tell me what's being executed. And we'll see if we go into KF page fault shadow. We do not. Oh, ooh. We execute 805. Oh, we do go into KF page fault shadow. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. So this is where we have our exception, because this is not mapped. I agree with that. This jumps to that location. I agree with that. This is the... We actually... Um... We go into K at page fault shadow. And... My stack should be fine. Okay, then it's something I'm not setting up state-wise. What purpose do these shadow IDT entries serve? These are used for um, uh, meltdown mitigation. It basically uh, makes sure that the user land CR3 is swapped out. So what we'll hopefully see is we should see bit test of that. Oh, and then we GP. Is that not paged in? This bit test here on GS? Is my GS base not good? Let me check my GS base. GS base, GS base. I set that here. DB this plus um, it's doing a bit test on 7018. That's not present. Maybe it's supposed to get the GP then. Wow, this has gotten really complex. Um... Ever since they added the, um, wow, Spectre and Meltdown stuff. Uh, we're going to allow GPs to happen. We might need to. I think this is going to triple fault. Or double fault. Here we go. Colonel double fault. Okay, yeah, so something's fucked. Then French Toast, thanks for the sub. Hell yeah. Looks cool. What are you working on? We're working on a, a full system hypervisor uh, for fuzzing. And currently we're taking a Windows snapshot from a mini dump and loading it up into a hypervisor and resuming execution. Um, swap GS. <gasps> I don't have a kernel GS. I don't have a kernel GS. Kernel GS base. Where's Kernel GS base? Holy shit. The swap GS is killing me. Oh my god, guys. It's so obvious. Um, Kernel GS base should be one of these fields. Maybe I have to manually set it and save it myself. I think this is something that I do have to manage, which sucks. I sent my host stuff. Okay. GS base, GS base, GS base, GS base. Um. Oh, am I gonna clobber my own GS base when it does this? No, I don't think so. Post GS base, I save it. Okay. Whew. 
Whew, sweating. Um, so we need to set the um, kernel GS base. And I don't think that is saved for us. Yep, we're going to have to manually do that one. Ugh. It's so frustrating that that's not saved. That's not part of the uh, VTX stuff. I have to manually save and restore that field myself. Um, holds the base of the GS segment used by the kernel. Soft GS is blah, blah, blah. IA32 mode hosts. Oh, is this 31? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hosts would choose, uh, may need to save and restore these MSR registers on VM exit and entry using the guidelines. Okay, so we need GS base, kernel GS base. And we'll get this from. Yep, that's basically saying, fuck you, handle it yourself. Thanks, Intel. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad that I have to do that myself. <sighs> Assholes. Um, so we're going to have tr kernel GS base. We're going to swap those in and out. So when we exit the VM, we do set that. And then kernel GS base will come from the kernel GS base. And uh, this is the kernel GS base. Const uh, u32 is i32. Uh, oops. Omxc123102 kernel gs base uh, msr. Assholes. Um, uh, VM resume. Okay. And then before we enter, we will do. Uh, CPU, write MSR, kernel GS base with the self.guestregs.kernel GS base. And then we'll read MSR from the kernel GS base. So basically, we handle this MSR manually, but this is 100% the issue. Okay, and this should build. It's not going to work, but it should build. The GS base is handled for us, but the kernel GS base we swap in. We don't use the kernel GS base in our kernel. So write the kernel GS base there, and then load the kernel GS base here. Beautiful. So this will, now this will still fail because we don't set up a valid uh, GS base and we get our GP. Um, so now what I need to do is I need to set the, I need to find my kernel GS base. Um, and I don't quite know how to do that. And this VM I think is dead. <sighs> oh, did that go to sleep? I bet that one's to sleep. Yeah, I guess SSH doesn't prevent the system from going to sleep. Great. Um, I forget what I called it. Test. Yeah. Um, KDZ full dump. Okay, so now I need to figure out my kernel GS base. And given kpcr, kpcr, hopefully this has it. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Shit. kpcr, that's self, yep. pcrb. Kernel directory, that's the kernel uh, page table directory. ISR stack. Wow, there's a lot of shit in here. There's a lot of shit in here. Um, MXCSR, current thread. 
Uh, GS. Just base. Hmm. Uh, read MSR? Oh, I can't read an MSR in this. Um, kernel, GS base, Windows. Where can I find the kernel GS base? It's gotta it's gotta be fucking somewhere. Um Okay, PCR, TSS. RSP base directory. Um, CPU info, K thread. Check out the K thread. K process. K thread probably has its own GS base. X save. Tab. That's the user land tab. Okay, K okay, process. Thread list head. I think that's a K thread. Shit. I don't know. Morning. Uh, where we got to then? Uh, we're we're running Windows inside of our VM from a full system dump that we took from Windows and debugger. Right now we're trying to figure out kernel GS base. There are a couple things we have to extract out that aren't readily easily accessible in the um, uh, things that aren't directly readily available in the mini dump file. So we're trying to figure out those. Um, okay. Kernel base. Bug checked. PFN. That's the PCR. Size of PCR, offset for the self. I, yeah. Fuck, where would that be stored? DG, DGGS, that's not gonna be it. That's not going to tell the base of GS. Um, and that would also be the active GS. That wouldn't be the kernel GS. <sighs> Surely I have that. Offset K thread tab. Thread. Base. That is of what? Is this the K 
Okay, thread. Um, I think so. Oh, it's just K thread, isn't it? Is it? What's the offset that we're faulting at? Um, let's just disassemble this. Yeah, we're looking for the kernel GS base. You, here we go. Um, and it was faulting. We had a K of page fault when accessing this. And GS in this case is probably this. I'm guessing it points to the thread. DB this plus 7018. Is that valid? That's a pointer. Hmm, bit test with one. No, I don't think that's right. The GDTR, I mean, this will have the GDT, but the GS base isn't stored in the GDT. Uh, the kernel GS base is in an MSR. Okay, let's check this out. Plus. 7018. I think that, is that it? Is that a coincidence? The fuck is this? Let's see a 6 FFC. No. Now that's weird. We do have a base here. But I, d I don't know what this is actually displaying. I don't know. We've got a stack, current. I'm guessing this is the base of the stack. Yeah, that's the base of the stack. And that's the limit of the stack. Okay. Um, fuck. Where would that be stored? Let me see if I have that. Um... Yeah, I never have to actually parse that out of the kernel. All right. Um. At the start of GS base, but I have I already know that in this stage. Fuck. Um. It would be on the K thread, I'm guessing. Shit. I'm just going to I'm just going to grab the source code. I'll be I'll be right back. Uh story. Um Okay, we've got a processor state which is Um 
Uh, PCR. DTK PCR on this. That's the PCR. I want to get the special registers. Okay. That comes from there. That is this. Oh, that's the juicy stuff. That's what I want. Oh, I want this structure so bad. Oh, this is all the good shit. All right, I gotta find this. Um. On self, what the fuck is that? Okay, uh, okay, um. <laughs> oh, that's on the GS. Shit. Uh, that's my NT Tib. Shit, I don't know how to find this. Oh, that's hypervisor stuff. Um, Okay. Ah. I think I might have found the trick. Um, not quite there. Okay. That is current user tab. Set that. Mm. Okay. I'm reading as fast as I can. Uh, shit. Put it up on the screen well. I'm trying. I'm trying my best. That comes from there. Okay, um current thread. And the PCR. this okay this will have a pointer deref this this points to a current thread Base limits, those are kernel stacks. Thread flags. K process. Okay, so do I just add, is this the one? Does this have a self? If this doesn't have a self field, then it definitely isn't. 
db this plus 7,000. Yeah, that's not mapped. So it's not that. Trying to find a GS base? I'm trying to find the kernel GS base, which is an MSR. Fuck. Where the fuck is that? I just don't know what that is supposed to be. I don't know if that... <sighs> Stock limit, dispatcher header, trap frame. This is the userland tab. I feel like there's no way it doesn't store it in a structure, but it, it's it's actually possible it doesn't. Isn't that storage uh, related or in the tab? Yeah, we've been looking. I'm just trying to find where it is. Like it ha it has to be stored somewhere. I just have no idea where. So I'm I'm trying to find the structure field where it's stored. But I'm just trying to find what structure field that would possibly be. I I have found I need to find I need to find these K special registers. This is what I need. It's in the TDB or the TEB. We're at. What's the field name? I I have the GS base. I just don't have the kernel GS base, which is like a separate separate thing that's like shadowed. I need to find where I can get K special registers and it's there cuz I have the GS base. That one that one I got. Fuck, K special re registers. How the fuck do I get this? Who has this? I need to figure out who owns this, who has this field. This is this is like the nuts. This has everything I need to make a hypervisor work. So if I can find this structure, we're like, we're not only solving this problem, which is just testing, this will like, th this is just gonna be insane. Here we go, I found it. Uh, PRCB, we're gonna do this. PCRB. This address, 
processor states special registers. Fuck. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's PRCB. Fuck. God damn it. I always type it. Um, let's first get that working. DTPRCB. DTPCRB? What am I doing? What am I doing wrong here? What is the type of that? Oh, K. Ah, it's this K P R C B. Then we're gonna go into the processor state special registers. There it is, and it's empty. We've got C R three, C R four, kernel D R S, G G T R S, T R S. And then we have the GS swap, which is empty. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Uh, uh, I got fucking juked. But this is good stuff in here. This has some good shit. Alright. Um, TR. It's just, uh... X crows in here. This has like so much good stuff. It, it has the C stars, the M stars, and all that. Not M stars, but but yeah, this has everything that I'll need to make a hypervisor work. This is all the control registers, all the MSRs that are used in Windows. Um, but I need to find P R C B. Current next idle. So this is KPRCB. I've got the context, the X save area. Oh, this is all the good shit. Processor state. Parent node? I don't think that's it. So what's in processor state? Context frame. I don't know when these are flushed. Probably on the last context switch. Vector control, Devo control. Well, that's just a context. It's kernel GS, kernel SS. Yeah, I think this is saved on context switches. Gotta be fucking kidding me, really? I want the address of that. Special registers. Oops. R four. So I have the base. E F B. That's correct. E B for the I D T R. And the TR base, do I have that in here? I don't have the TR base, but I can get the TR base from the um, GDT. However, I get that. Need to define the gates in the GDT. Contains the bases. Yeah, that's a little bit out of date. Modern, they use a swap GS instruction where they grab it from an MSR. And this MSR, it's this MSR GS swap, is what I want. And it's just not fucking filled in. I can't believe it, man. I can't believe it.
Are you kidding me? Yeah, the GDT stuff won't be used. The only thing they use out of the GD um, or out of the TSS is the um, the TSS still contains the uh, kernel stack that they switch to, but that's it for AMD sixty four. They don't use anything else. I think the rest is like reserved to zero. Good morning, Milhente. How's it going? Fuck. Fuck. I'm going to see when this is written to. Hypervisor. Save the GS swap. Nope. I don't see anything that really writes to this. This is on... Hibernate. Fuck. I don't know how I would get that. I could heuristically scan for it and try to find it, which is like the big ass cannon. What is the, okay, what does the kernel GS point to? I think I, I think I know what that is. I should know. There we go. Let's check this out. Kernel page table. Checked out that. The kernel GS base is the PCRB. Is that true? Checked out X. Kernel page table. Um. Thread offset. From the KPCR to the E thread. If I take the kernel GS and I add that, I would suspect that that's the KPCR then. I think this is the kernel GS base then. But then the 3000 wasn't mapped. Um, or 7000, sorry. This is mapped. Oh my god, it's this. It's this. Um, Kernel GS base is PCR. So then we'll set that. So we can get that relatively easily as well. We're just trying to figure out what we need to get this to work. And then once we have this working, then uh, worker.vm.guestregs.kernel GS base is equal to this. So this is the kernel GS base. And now we should not get the general protection faults. And we should enter the kernel and execute shit. Unhandled VM exit code 28. Fuck yeah. I like that. That's probably easy. 28, 28, 28. Control register access. All right. We're executing kernel code now. We, we transition, we page fault, run the page fault handler, and then we end up executing whatever the fuck this is. And we're doing a move CR3. So we're uh, changing our CR3. And since we're changing CR3, 
Um, they indicate a VM exit should occur. And let's see. I can just probably turn that off. I don't know if I enable that. Um, on. <laughs> Move CR3 RSP, what? Yeah, there's some weird shit going on here. Um, so that means that that's kind of a minimum requirement. Control register access. We might have to handle that. I know with VTX, there are certain things that we have to uh, handle. So let's take a look if we can turn that off. And I'm guessing we can't. OK. CR3 load exiting. CR3 store exiting. On the first, the first processors to support the virtual machine extensions only supported the one setting of this control. So that basically means that a lot of processors um, don't allow turning that off. But let's see if we can. This is in the processor base control. We do not want off um, CR3 store exiting and CR3 load exiting. Um, the first one here is a CR3 load exiting, CR3 store exiting. We're going to say that I don't want those features. There's a chance that I need those. There's a chance that the processor does not let me ignore those. Uh, yep. Uh, that basically means I, I have to handle that. Fucking stupid, man. I hate how they're like default required things. Really fucking stupid. Okay, so on these... Uh, so we have a 28. And we'll 28 under the hood. This is a um, uh, control register access. The wonders of VMX. Yeah, you don't have these problems on AMD. And... VM execution controls field. Yep. Move to CR8 when using TPR shadow. So we just need to handle some of these. Um, so I need to figure out what gets saved here. So this is on a VM exit. So we'll take a look at VM exits. And recording information, exit reason. And then the qualification. Um, task switch, control register. OK, control register number. Zero for CLTS and LMSW. Bit three is always zero on processors that don't support. And then move to CR, move from CR. OK, so why would this not be an issue on AMD? AMD um, kind of handles these things for you. So on AMD, you don't. You aren't forced to handle some of these writes to CR3. It just internally lets those things happen. Um, so on Intel, you have to, by default, you have to handle like CPU ID, reads and writes of MSRs, and reads and writes of CR registers. Whereas AMD just does it to these like shadow VM registers and continues executing it. Doesn't require that you kind of manually hook these. Um, it's just the way that Intel kind of decided to go. Okay. CR num is equal to exit qual and bits three to zero. So that's uh, an F. Then we have a type is equal to exit qual shift four and three. Um, LMSW operand type, we don't care about that. So we're just going to say match type zero. This is a move to a control register. 
one, this is a move from a control register. The rest we won't handle right now because I don't think we're going to hit CLTS. I don't think Windows uses those. Um, panic, unexpected, read, write to control register. So when we move to control register, we'll match the CR number, and then we'll say, um, if it's zero, we'll write to VM, uh, we'll unsafe this whole thing. VM write, VMCS, guest CR, guest CR, yeah, guest CR zero from the general purpose register. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> Fuck you, Intel. <laughs> you assholes. <laughs> you fucking assholes. <laughs> AMD SVM is so weird and wonderful to me. Yeah, it's so nice. Uh, do you have the chat logs available? I do not. I do not. Uh, okay, so... Now we just got to do this. Um, fuck. Let's GPR is equal to God damn it, Intel. Oh, I should be able to do this. Um, match. Let GPR is equal to the exit qualification shift by eight and F. Match the GPR. This will be a mutable reference to self dot guest regs dot racks let me make sure that's correct i think it is fuck fuck off come on uh semicolon this one we'll just write a, f a five i just want to make sure that this is okay before i break everything and it looks fine um I think I can handle these, right? No, I have no way of doing re-entry in this function, do I? Correct. That runs still a single exit. I kind of want to handle this internally to here. But... I guess I won't. So this will be... VM exit. This is a uh, right CR, and then um, move CR, right CR. <sighs> yeah, I think I'll do a move two from the CR. So I'll probably split these of a right CR, and then we'll have a. A GPR, which will be a U8, and a, a CR. This is the um, control register index and the uh, GPR index for those. And we'll have a read and a write. And then we have to enlighten these, which sucks, but uh, we can make it work. So match this. We'll get the GPR from that. It's just the raw number. On this, oh, I have no way of setting CRs. Um, so 
So I need to, I guess I need to save and restore all the CRs every time I enter. Yeah, I guess I'm gonna add those to my context. We'll do this. CR034. Technically there's a two. Um, and there's an eight. I don't know if I'll see the same exception for a CR8, right? But whatever. CR, okay. So I'll have a right CR and then this is on a, all right, here we go. So now we have to convert this into a VM exit code. So we'll say move to a control register from a GPR. So this is uh, VM exit, write CR, the CR number, and the GPR. I think I just call it CR, GPR. This is move from, so this is read CR. Yep, CR and GPR. Okay, so this is the CR number the type, and then that one we don't handle, so this should now work. No semis. That'll return those codes. CR and GPR as U8. GPR as U8. Okay, uh, read CR. Unexpected token, 533, comma. Okay, so now we will get a VM exit read CR, a write CR. Oh, FX save. Oh, um, yes. Thank you, assert. Thank you so much, assert. Um, I added four registers to here. FX save. I added five registers. B C eight D O. Why would I get a GP? What did I change? Proc to activate secondary. What did what did I change? Um, is it that offset? Oh, because I set it there, but then I didn't change it here. Like an idiot. Whew. It's like, what did I possibly break? There we go. So we're entering, and then we'll hit a write CR. Yep, we're writing a CR from GPR4. If we look at GPR number four, GPR number four should be RSP. Okay, so I think we're decoding that. Just fine, because that's what we're hitting. All right. So the guest CRs and CR8, I guess I'm not using CR8 and CR2. So all the things that are DO, DO becomes CO in this case.
Okay, this will work just fine. And now, um, CR3. Uh, guest CR3. I'm going to write these. Every VM entry and exit. Okay. So every entry and exit will do... Uh, self.guestregs.cr0 3 cr4 we're going to set the cr3 ourselves to this magic number um in our fuzzer worker.vm.guestregs.cr3 is equal to this that means we'll use that cr3 and cr4 we use from the host CR0 and CR4 we use from the host. So we'll temporarily set those up. Uh, 0, 3, 4. This is CPU read CR pro. Um, this is CPU read CR4. I'm just using the host CRs. Technically, we'll get those from the VM at some point. <laughs> We're just kind of accumulating all the things that we need to extract out of the VM. Now that we have those CRs, we also have to restore them. So when we exit a VM, we have to restore these to the original state. Self.guestregs.cro is equal to VM read VMCS guest CR0. Just in case they changed, even though we technically have to hook them right now, on some processors we might not have to. So I just want to make sure that I'm restoring all those. CR0, CR3, CR4. Now I can handle the VM exit. VM exit write CR, CR, GPR. And what I can do here is um match CR CR is equal to this and if it's CR0 mute self.vm.guestregs.crow 3 and 4 panic invalid CR register for write CR for now we might hit that so this is uh, get access to the CR to modify, and let's make sure we're good on lifetimes. We should be, we should build. Okay, let GPR is equal to match GPR zero, mute self.vm.guestregs racks. Now we just gotta do all these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. RCX, RDX, RBX, SP, BP, SI, DI. I might make like a get, um, get register from index or something like that if I do this frequently. But so far, I don't think it's going to be too bad. So we've got a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Fucking lifetimes. Oh, yeah, sweet. Um, panic invalid GPR for write CR. Thank God. And now I can do CR is equal to GPR. Uh, continue. Um, VM loop. So I'll re enter. Yep. Boop. Read CR to read for read CR GPR is equal to CR. Those actually need to be mute. These don't need to be mute. Oh, can I not delete in block mode? For read CR. 
Can I not block delete things? Capital I, delete, 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 delete. Oh, maybe I can't use the delete key, or do I have to use a um, insert D? Can I not delete? Control V. Holy shit, this is some advanced stuff. Control V, comma. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, select it. Okay. Don't go into insert mode. Thank you so much. Holy shit. <laughs> Alright, um, wait, is this just gonna work? Uh-oh, SpaghettiO. We fuck up a CR. CR3. Okay. Read CR. Uh, print writing to CR this with this. CR GPR. I forget that comma is also a Vim command. I, I, I'm so used to the visual mode in Windows. I know how to do that one, but not this. Okay. Whoa! I can't use that. I cannot, that is unacceptable. That bit is the, um, now I can probably just mask it off. Let's see what CR3 is. CR3, CR3, paging, CR3. I forget what they changed that bit to mean. It's some new feature. Sixty-four bit paging is probably something. Share <laughs> three. Oh, that's PAE. Okay, let's go to paging. We'll just use the manual correctly. Four level paging. CR three. PC ID is zero, and in this case, if PC ID is one, uh, reserve must be zero. Uh, there's a protection key. This is probably some like bleeding edge feature, and I don't know what it is. I don't know what that top bit is. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what that top bit is, so we'll just do this. And OX, uh, where's my page table? This, <laughs> the magic number. I don't have PC IDE set. There's probably some like feature that I can't use in that state. So let's see what this does. Come on, come on, come on. We got stuck. Uh, do I keep hitting that? If I keep hitting that, then I probably get uh, instruction count and I have to jump over instructions. Yep. So I need to jump over the move CR. Okay, does Intel tell me the length of that instruction? I swear to God, if it doesn't, I'm gonna be pissed. VM exits. Oh, saving MSRs. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Control register access. What is, 
Why do I just feel like it's talking about Apex and then it... Um... Instructions displacement field. Oh, that's for LTR. I think it does store. Somewhere I think it stores the size of the instruction. Um, I think, hey Desu, how's it going? Good time of the day. <laughs> Good time of the day to you too. Oh my God, we're so close everyone. We're so fucking close. Come on. God, I forgot how much Intel hypervisors suck. I think somewhere it stores the length of the instruction. And that would be a read-only field. Guess physical address. It's not that. VM exit instruction length. There we go. That's what I want. That's what I want. Um, so I have the length of the instruction that executed. Now, this is not always valid, but I think in this case it is. Um, let me just search here. Instruction length. Um, for injection of events, it's type as a software interrupt, software exception, privileged software exception, determine the value of rip that is pushed into the stack. That's for what? VM entry? Oh, so they overload it. I see. They just overload something. Okay. For VM exits resulting from instruction execution, this re resulting from instruction execution, this has the length of the instructions whose execution led to the VM exit. Um, okay. This is used in these things. Read, write, CR, read, write, CR. Please, 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 please. Fault-like things, move CR. Move CR. Fuck yeah. We do have a VM instruction length. Okay. So let's add that. This is the VM exit instruction length. 440C. Length of the instruction which caused the VM exit. And then read CR. This is the inst length of the instruction insulin okay write cr let instruction len insulin uh replace that with inst len okay instruction length is equal to unsafe vm read vm cs vm exit instruction length we did it inslan inslan sweet 338 inslan here and inslan here and then here we'll just do self dot vm.guestregs.rip equals self.vm.guestregs.rip.wrapping add instlen 
problem solved. Um, uh, capital L on the length. How about CR8? In this case, I'm not too worried about it yet. I'm just going to let it panic. I do fail closed if it tries to access those. So I don't think that's something I'm going to hit right now. But that is something I might eventually need to handle. Oh, we panic here. Exit 31. Okay. And read MSR. Who would have thunk? So now I need to handle a read MSR. That is getting... That's the kernel GS base. Okay, well we can do that. Um, we just we just gotta keep chugging. We just gotta keep chugging. Um, read MSR, read MSR. Okay. So then we will go to. You just gotta add all these things. Read MSR, and then I I'm guessing I'll be enlightened here a little bit. MSR. Okay, what is for task switch, control register access, move DR, IO, those accesses, EPT violations. And the stars we might have to handle separately. Okay. Loading MSRs. That's basically how to save and restore all MSRs. Saving those. On a... Oh, I know what the fields are on our read MSR. It's, it's fixed. And read MSR is also a fixed size instruction. So we'll have the insulin, which is the length of the instruction on our read MSR. And that's a 31. And then the rest I actually know. By nature of the read MSR, I know the inputs and outputs. So this is uh, read and MSR, and this is just a get the instruction length. I could maybe throw that outside if I keep reusing it. VM exit, read MSR, inst len. And then the rest is implied by the fact that it's reading an MSR. OK, so then down here, we should hit read MSR. And we'll just start writing that code right away. VM exit read MSR instlen. And depending on how much stuff I want to handle, we'll probably start adding more and more things here. But this is the MSRs in self VM guest regs RCX. Match MSR. If it's uh, C0000. Zero two. Is that what it's reading? Yeah, we got to read MSR. Uh, 102, which is what it's reading. This is a, um, in this case, let val is equal to this. And this will be self.vm.guestregs.kernel.gsbase. Panic unexpected MSR read. And I'll print the MSR ID here, because that actually will be useful. We'll do 08x there. Um, so this is gets the MSR ID we're reading. This is gets the MSR value. Then we have to uh, self.vm.guestregs.racks. This will get the low part. And then the high part will go into RDX, which will be val shift. 32 as you, okay. Um, set the low and high parts of the uh, results. That, my friend, 
is how you handle read MSR. Put a little semicolon here. And val in this case is the MSR. So you get the kernel DS base and then get the low part of the value and get the high part of the value. And we'll just do this just for clarity. I like doing that. As U32, so truncate and then sign or Xerox and back to U64 and write those out to racks and RDX. So those should handle that. And here we go. I think we're going to continue on for a little bit further. Oh, we're in the kernel right now. We're doing kernel stuff. We're doing kernel stuff. And we hit an invalid opcode. OK. Um, this would make sense if there's something I don't support. X saves. Yeah, so what I need to do is we need to take a new snapshot in a new machine, and we're going we're gonna to change the CPU ID to be a little bit weaker than what we emulate. Basically, the processor in that snapshot has already identified features of the CPU. Um, and there are certain features that I don't want it to use. Uh, so we're going to restrict that in QMU. So we'll ship this over. We'll just kill this. And um, where did I launch QMU from? Here. Um, CPU. OK. So what I want to do is I want to make this CPU as weak as possible. I want to do the minimum. Um, we'll go to like an ancient processor. And what can I do? I can't, I shouldn't be able to do a 46 for 64 bit, can I? The first, what was the first 64 bit? That wasn't a 46. I mean, I guess QMU will maybe emulate that. I think the first one was a Pentium 4, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I just want to pick the oldest CPU here. Core Duo. Here we go. A T2600. This looks nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, 600. Wow, look at those megahertz on the front side bus. Mobile processor, two co two cores, two threads? Oh, man. PAE, 32 bits. Oh, this doesn't have 64 bit. Okay, so the core two should have it. This will definitely have it. Oh, maybe not. I think I had a core two that couldn't do it. No, core two should be able to do it. I think core two was my first. Yes. Turbo boost, no. Hyperthreading, no. VTX. It has VTX? Very early VTX. Speed step. Other features. This shouldn't have. Well, that's a, that's a good one. It's got execute disable. Wow, fancy. I don't even know if Windows boots with a core 2. Windows 10. Um, let's try it. Core 2 Duo. Let's go. <laughs> this is the nice thing about QMU for taking snapshots is we can just change it. Then we don't have to worry about actually supporting the same feature set. Let's see if this boots. This might not. Um, it's trying to connect to the debugger. So let's get that debugger going. Ports. Okay. Um, it was on four. Hey, we booted. We booted. Nice. Fuck yeah. Oh yeah. Core 2 Duo T7700, baby! <laughs> Booking it there. What a what a processor. Alright. So I'm gonna build the fake app. 
X64, CD this. Um, CL ODZIZO fake app dot exe. Yep, fake app dot C. Fake app dot exe. We hit our breakpoint, and then I want to resume. I want to do this twice just so that's fresh. That whole path will be in cache for sure. Now we just gotta make a new dump. So, um, uh, dump f core to duo dot dump. So the core to duo, this won't have AVX at, or X save at all. Here's a nice list of all the configurations. Thank you so much. And the launch years for the QMU CPUs. All right. Bookmarked before even reading it. Core two. Oh, that's Penryn. Um, okay, I see. Well, I'm hoping that that's not going to use any of the crazy features. I would assume it won't. I don't know if using KVM, I'm guessing with KVM it'll correctly do that, but let's check out the core two. What are you doing? A Q something, 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 something. Um, hey, if it boots Windows, it's, it's modern. T7700. Intel, oops. Um, I want the wiki chip on this. Oh, not that one. I would suspect it wouldn't have X save. Um, SSE 4.1 is only for the 45. Oh yeah, it, it definitely doesn't have X save on this. Core 2, and then what's the code name for this chip? Code name is Muram. Yeah, this is like first fucking gen. Oh, yeah. AVX, SSE, doesn't mention. Um... Find the wiki chip on this. Hopefully, we can find more information. Unveiled. Oh, that's old, man. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is talking about all the stuff. Oh, wow. Wow. S oh, wow. Oh, one load port and one store port. Wow. <laughs> I had one of those. I'm just gonna delete that. I don't know what that link is. I would not click on that. <laughs> I've never seen that person around here, so I'm just deleting that link. Don't click on that, by the way. You have no idea what that is. <laughs> I wouldn't click a random exe. Yeah. Maybe if it were someone I, I trusted from chat who shows up a lot, but... Not in this case. Oh, I'm gonna throw that in the Ida. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's bring it up. Let's bring it up. I deleted the link, so I don't have it. <laughs> I mean, may maybe they're actually trying to share like a cool a cool thing that they made. Sorry, I'm new here. I'm I'm just uh, yeah. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. 
I mean, but please don't post links. I'm going to delete it again. <laughs> Just If anyone wants the link, they can ask for it. But uh, let's, let's not post links to Eggsies in chat, guys. <laughs> that's like, that's like, that's a pretty, a pretty basic rule. FYI, it's a virus. <laughs> no problem, Proxy. Could be a sick binge of Ode and a debate to get me to open it. <laughs> Mini Python game written in .NET. Oh, very interesting. Did you open it in IDA? It's in .NET. Can we get a Can we get a confirmation that this is a .NET program? Let's 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 see this shit. Um. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at this. Um, very interesting XE and, and DOS. Uh, very interesting XE for Python, but you know, we'll see. Um, XXD. Let's see what kind of springs we have. Strings we have. Oh yeah, .NET. Interesting. Also packed. Wow, that's a really cool binary, man. Wow. Wow. That's that's typically how I write my Python code. Really cool game you got here. FileZilla, decrypt user. Oh, is that just some path? This is a this is a pretty big Python program. Definitely not malware. It's CryptoLocker. Got a lot of fun strings in here. That's really interesting. Selecting from selecting from stuff to find antivirus stuff. Antivirus displaying it. That's very strange. I typically do that with my uh, I typically do that with my programs. <laughs> Definitely wrong stream to spread such a thing. Yeah, I have, uh, this is good. Pipe through strings. I don't want to run it through strings. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to run arbitrary shit through strings. I really don't want to run strings on it. Strings is not a security boundary. That's, just, that's not something I feel safe with. <laughs> I've fuzzed strings before. I know that it's not, I know that that's a shit heap. <laughs> It's so tempting, but I'm not going to. Well, it's weird that a person's not really chatting too much. Uh, what was that? What was the dude's name? I, I've cleared my chat. I need to ban him and report him. We'll get your IP, dude. We're coming after you. We got you. The real proxy programmer. All right. Thank you. Ban, ban, eat a dick is the message. There we go. And, <laughs> uh, we got him. We got him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> of all the streams, he comes here with that shit. Uh, that's okay. You know what? 
you all gotta you, you gotta start somewhere when you're an absolute fucking idiot, right? Like when you're a little skitty and you and you got your you got your little first malware and you gotta get really excited. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get in here. Let me get my sub seven going. <laughs> Let me nmap scan you. I got your IP. <laughs> We're in. <laughs> <laughs> we all start somewhere. I was a skit at one point. I just happened to be 12 when I was about that level of uh, level of skill. So, a uh, real proxy programmer. Hope you're uh, uh, 13 and below. Otherwise, it's pretty sad. <laughs> Yo, check out that sick IP. <laughs> Channel links to his PayPal. It has a full name. Yeah, I mean, there's a chance that, like... I don't know. Don't dox the dude. Like, there's a there's a chance that someone's account that got compromised, stolen. Uh, maybe they just have no idea what they're doing. Like, I don't know. It's I don't know. I'll just ban them. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Definitely in the wrong stream to drop your malware. Have <laughs> start tearing that shit apart. <laughs> so watch again when you post the first link. See how many people drop from the stream. <laughs> I would hope people here wouldn't, like, I, I think I was pretty quick in telling people not to click on the link. And I del deleted the link relatively quickly as well. I should use that visual basic to execute. Oh, my God. Twitch profile says 17. Yeah, you got to get your hacking skills up, kid. Come on, dude. Is this your first time hacking? <laughs> All right, we're going to... We're gonna scoop out the this new snapshot. What's my IP? Um, Ethernet three. No one DOS me with my IP. I know that it's. I know that I revealed it here, but please, please don't steal my IP. <laughs> Making pen testing tools is fine. Okay, um, server files, scoop from here, wow, I'm struggling, um, test, core to, core to duo dot dump, all right, My internet's lagging. Oh, we're getting do we're getting DDoS. <laughs> he uses Cali. Better watch out. Back in the day, I used Backtrack. Actually, I use. I don't think I really used Backtrack. I just like installed the tools that I needed. But I did use Backtrack at one point. Black Arch. What's that? That's that sounds like the elite hacking shit right there. Ba -da -da -ba -ba -da -ba. I prefer yellow Debian. I haven't heard of that. Oh, you're just me. Yeah, just you got me. <laughs> You've debated me. <laughs> you fucking chat assholes. <laughs> oh, typical fucking Twitch chat trying to debate. I'm just here trying to write some code, trying to be cool, trying to be chill. Writing some cool shit, trying to entertain y'all with some good, fancy code. <laughs> that was a pretty good debate. <laughs> Cheers to you, Harm. <laughs> was that an AT command? You sent me AT commands, jump out? Trying to make me dial 911? You think I can't, you think I can't see right through your AT command?
Is that done yet? Oh my god. SSH, man. Why are you so slow? Eighty percent complete. You know, I should have I should have brought up a game when I knew we were gonna be doing the snappage. I remember making file transfer software in class in QBasic to work across modems with friends. <sighs> Sounds like piracy there. <laughs> I hope you DRM those bits to make sure that no one stole any content when you're sharing files between friends. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you contacted Sony. <laughs> Remember Mandrake? Oh my god. That was the star, wasn't it? That was the star Linux, right? The yellow star, green star? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever ran it. I ran Foresight Linux for a while, which was like... I don't even know why I fucking ran it. There was really no reason to, to be honest. Okay, so we're going to switch over to this new snapshot. <laughs> and, and, oh my god. Uh, we just got to change the name here. Woo. Uh, core 2 Duo. You would be lucky to eight, get 18 kilobytes per second? Kilobits per second? I mean, was that your QBasic code slowing you down? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I don't think I ever actually ran a modem. I feel like I had DSL by the time I connected to the internet the first time. Like, I, I never got the experience of that modem. Ba -do, ba -do, do -do. Um. <laughs> okay. All right, let's, let's, let's open up this little snip, snip, snap, snapshot. So we're going to go into, and we're going to, we got to, we got to update all these things, right? Because we don't extract these yet. Well, rip is easy. Rip, we can plus equals one. Because we know it's at a breakpoint. So that one's easy. GS base, kernel GS base. And let me make notes. Kernel GS. K PCR. There we go. That's the, this is the most important comment in the code base. The whole code base doesn't matter except for that comment. KDZ core to duo. This is our dump. Uh, we're going to get the crow. Uh, we'll just use the user one. We'll do a, we'll get the CR3 from the, oh, PCR. So the PCR is the kernel GS base. Done. The GS base is the tab, which I think is just in here. Um, thread, tab. That should be the GS base. And then the CR3, we have to get from the thread, DTK thread. Uh, and we need the K process, I think. There it is. Oh, and there's no zero bit set. Sweet. So it's definitely not using VPIT or anything. Okay, so FX save is actually correct. I think we are saving and restoring basically the full state now. Uh, we got some double faults. Okay, okay. I respect that. Um, oh, you know what? We should probably set the IDTR, the GDTR, you know, uh, PCR, DT, KPCR. All this shit will get automated. Don't worry, guys. This isn't what you'll have to do. I'll make this nice and polished. This is the TR base. 
All the good shit right in here. IDT base, we'll grab this. Turns out when you page fault, it's a little bit of a problem. If you don't have your page, your table set up, then the limits are GDTL. Yup. TRL, uh, that's 67 anyways. IDTRL, IDTL, yeah. Okay, so I think that's all the stuff we hard code. And this should now work. Oh, we're executing. We're in the kernel right now. We're hanging out in the kernel, just chilling, having fun, having a good time. Uh, let's see if we make it back to user land. Um, come on. We're paging stuff in, hitting page faults. We're back in user land. <laughs> Easy. Oh, hell yeah. And we're back in the kernel. Page fault again. I really want a way to like warm up the process. Maybe if I did a read process memory on the whole thing. Because I want to make sure everything's paged in. Because we're losing a lot of CPU time by doing this. That being said, let's see what we hit. I bet we'll hit a halt. Thoughts? Think we're going to hit a halt? Do you think we're going to run until the CPU has nothing to do? Get rid of the print VM exit. Set. Get rid of the single step. All right. So this is just going to run for eternity. In that process, it's we don't inject interrupts or emulate devices. Here we go. Oh, it just immediately we hit a 10. Oh, I think that's a halt. I think that's a halt for sure. Right? I'm just guessing. Halt, 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 halt. CPU ID. Ooh, CPU ID. We can do that. We can, we can, we can do a CPU ID. Um, actually, that's really hard. Where are we hitting a CPU ID at? Um, and then we'll print the at X. Uh, self dot guest regs dot rip, but we're executing stuff. We do have to handle CPID, so I think we're gonna probably rip out that CPID table. Here's where we are. We're in the kernel. We are currently in help CPID. Inline and help uh, get X2 APIC policy. Oh, it wants to do APIC stuff. Yeah, I think the next thing is we're going to get a fault accessing the APIC. It's probably sending an IPI to another thread. Um, well, let's turn on... We report coverage, don't we? We should be reporting coverage right now. If I set single step, if I always set single step, and I restart my server, I should get the coverage in the order of what I hit. There we go, 962 coverage. Now I can see all the things that I executed in order. So we can see we're executing kernel stuff. This is not a trace. This is only unique things that we've observed. So we hit this stage. We then run get module handle, that hits page fault, that goes into page fault handler, and then we end up, this is the last thing we execute is, yep, a CPU ID. And we get there through this function. So this is the caller of the CPID. Help sock request configuration. Okay, and that's coming from a this function. So it calls that. APIC setup register access. Mm. Okay. Is Xbox Nanovisor present? Oh, that's the security cookie. APIC setup register access. I'm going to look at what this is supposed to do.
Okay. Yeah, it wants to communicate with the APIC, and I'm not sure why yet. So let's take a look. Oh, we bug checked. We panicked. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So we, we blue screened. And we blue screened. Um, okay, so... Look at that, we're already finding bugs in my own stuff. <laughs> 86 EO. This is what caused the bug check. I think this is probably a call to bug check. Okay, bug check X. So that page fault, it's just not happy about that page fault. 2360. 2360. This is what calls bug check. Bug check dispatch. Come on. Um, 4180. Here's the color of that. Okay, a page faults. So that page is not handled. That fault is not handled on that page. Um. Okay. Okay. Uh, Page full happened at an IQ level that is greater than the APC level. Okay, and the IQ level, I think this is because we're not setting the, um, um, page full occurred with interrupts disabled, oh, E flags, oh! <gasps> It's because I have interrupts disabled. See, that was so easy to debug, guys. It was so easy. <laughs> just, just simply look at it. exactly what this uh, this path in KF page fold is and read the comments of the code, and it tells me exactly what the problem is. I have interrupts in it, uh, disabled. Duh. Make sure interrupts are always enabled. Oh shit, do I always enable it? Not before I enter? Um. Am I not setting our flags? Um, okay, let's see how we got there. 524 is where we currently are. O524? Where is my debugger? O524. B3D, yep. So I don't, am I getting a page fault in the kernel? Because the path to here is pretty short. I wouldn't necessarily know.
I get a page fault. So we hop into KA page fault shadow. And then that's going to cause us to switch into KA page fault. And then we're in KA page fault. And we're chugging along. Um, and we get pretty deep before we hit bug check, which is this MM access fault. And then that returns basically that that page is not present. It's not my um, segments, is it? Access rights, those are reasonable. To be five three. Okay, so I'm I'm trying to figure out if somehow I am I don't know if if I'm hitting another page fault. I hit the page fault and my interrupt should be enabled. Right? Or maybe it's the fact that I always enable interrupts. Maybe I just want to keep the R flags around. Maybe that's going to fix the problem. We'll take a look. I don't think this will. Oh. Oh, I don't have the server on it. Holy shit. About to say... 10, same location. Um, make sure the reserve bit is set in R flags. No problem. Set the R flags. Then we restore the R flags from the guest. And then we want to set R flags. Um, riffle is equal to, I don't know, that looks pretty good, 202. That's bit 10, right? That's interrupts enabled. Eight, nine. Interrupts is nine then? Yes, sir. So we're going to set our flags to literally what it's supposed to be, and then we don't modify it except for we set the reserve bit. And same problem. Son of a bitch. What could cause that? Interrupts are enabled when we hit that exception. We then... CR3 is good. We're executing user. We execute user land stuff. And then we get a page fault. And then it's really unhappy. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop. Don't do this to me. And it does that. Um, L1. How do I get the name of this? Can I examine this? Hmm. How do I get just the, the address of this? That's going to print that. There's got to be a way that I can just resolve the address of this, and I've, I've never really done that. Um, uh, okay, well, here's, here's what we can do. We can just do this. Percent %s, percent %s, replace a caret with a u space this percent s replace a dollar sign with an l1 g and then we just 
yank all these lines, and then we just paste them here. And then we have a trace of everything that happened. See? See how easy that is? It's just a little bit, a little bit debugging. And we'll have to write this to a, a log file, I guess. Log open trace dot text this log close <laughs> big brain oh yeah we got the biggest brain stuff going on here okay and then we'll scoop that down log log trace dot text You know what? I'm going to add these quick. Log open trace dot text. Okay. Log close. That'll flush it. Then we'll scoop that down. It's so easy, everyone. Okay, so now you can see what's happening. So, we try to execute this, and it fails. We jump to that stub. So, we're running through here. We call fake app 6.3, which is where we end up. And then we jump, and then we're at the location of the jump. And then we move this, and we do this. And then we have an access violation here. And then we go to page fault shadow. We swap to yes. And then we switch into okay, page fault. And I'm guessing saving frame stuff. So we end up bug checking. Well, we go to access fault. And then access fault, we do memset. Get the page table entry address. So I think this is trying to figure out if it can page that in. And then this is raised RQL faults. And then do we repage faults? And then access vault. Oh, here, here we go. And we return back into KI page vault. All right, let me see where we're at. So this is where it goes awry. Um. So this is where we, yeah, we try to resolve the page fault and then we return back and then we jump if it's below that. If it's less than that, it wasn't successful. So less than uh, 458, if we jump to 458, then we didn't handle the page fault. So that's, what ha that's what's happening. If we did handle it, then um, that goes up to there. Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. mm okay. Okay. It's less. It did not handle it. Um, okay. Okay. And then that. Returns out. Okay. 
So if some for some reason that that page fault is not being handled. But why would that bug check? Something's really fucky. Something's really fucky. So we end up returning from that. Um, I think it has to do with my IRQ level. I think that's what it is. I think somewhere in here, it's probably getting CR8. Yes. This is getting the current IRQ level. And the IRQ level is not what it should be. I don't know where I get the IRQ level. Um, oh, that nice, cool. That works in this context. Okay. Um, bang IRQ. All thank you. Win NT Dev. Uh, debugger save for processor three low level. What are the different IRQ levels? They go up. Like dispatch level is like two or some shit, right? So that's the problem, is I don't set CR8. And I have no hook on CR8. Uh, CR8 must be managed for us? How the fuck is that not a CR8 exit? Well, that's, that's the problem. Basically, we're getting a page fault in user land, and we're saying, hey, we're kernel right now, or, or like, we are dispatch level critical, <laughs> the IRQL less than not equal. Oh, that's for processor three. But isn't zero valid? So we get that. We test one, compare it with one. If it's above one, then we go to E1. And we do. So it's above one, which then means it's a raised IRQL. So I think we need to set it to low, which means we need to set CR8 to zero, which means we need to somehow hook CR8. And let's figure that out. This is easy. This is easy. Um, those are exit codes. We're, we're so close, everyone. We're figuring this out. I swear. This is actually really difficult, what we're doing, because we're transplanting a VM, a, a mini dump, into a different VM. Um, I have historically done this by booting directly under my hypervisor so I can save the entire VMCS data. I can just save the whole page. And I don't have to worry about like all these things that are kind of handled on the outside. Um, so we're going to take a look at the execution. And we want CR8 load store exits. We need those. We need those. Um, okay, so we're almost there. Um, how many levels deep of the VM can be fuzzed? Oh, we're going to go as deep as we possibly can. TPR shadow. Yeah, I don't want to do that. So we're going to set on... This is proc-based controls? Correct. Activate secondary controls or... Sierra, um... And we want CR3 load exiting as well. I mean, I don't actually want those. If they're not required, I technically don't want them. So then we'll add CR8 load exiting. Actually, do I just have CR8? No. So it's just it's just literally using my CR8 on my host. And CR8 is just the TPR, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right now, I think that's only the TPR. 
I don't think there are any other fields in there. Well, at least on this ancient fucking processor. Task priority register. Clear to zero on reset. So... I guess I can just... I guess I just don't want to hook it. I don't need to. So I will just... I don't use... I don't use TPR at all. In my OS. So I should be able to do... Um, CR4. Pub CR8. And let's make sure this... Uh, I don't have to fix up these offsets. I probably will. I do not have to fix up those offsets. Oh, the server's not running. Beautiful. Okay, so then we're going to set CR8 to 0. And then when we enter and exit the VM, uh, same place we do, I guess, some of the registers. What do we have to manage? Kernel... GS base, we'll do CPU write CR8, self.guestregs.cr8. Oops. So I'll set the CR8, and then at the end, we will do self.guestregs.cr8 is equal to this, read CR8, and then we'll just let the host directly access CR8, or the VM directly access CR8, because I don't use it in my OS, so it doesn't matter. The fewer things we hook, the better perf we get. Bam. Paste. SCR4, CR8G. Okay, so now I will set the CR8 to when we enter the VM, and then I will restore the CR8 when I'm done. Okay, and now that means that in test fuzzer, I should set CR8 to 0. That's low, low level. I'm guessing that's fine. Come on, come on, come on, come on. <gasps> Invalid opcode! Noise, noise. It's new. We changed it. We're back in user land. We had a syscall! Woo! I'm going to hit that. I'll be right back. Oh, that was good. That was a good little uh, excitement. Um, all right, okay. So to get this working, we need to set up the... Um, uh, honestly, I think we want that, that beautiful structure. Okay, PCR. Um, okay, PCR. Uh, PCR. There we go. Uh, DT, okay, PCR. Then I want the PCRB. Then from there, I want the processor state. So this is the one that I want. So this is the PCRB. And we want this. And we want the processor state. You bitch. PRCB. Why do I always get that wrong? It's 
Special registers. Okay. CR2, oh nice, that's the Fulting address. Um, CR0, CR4, DRs. Ah, where are my C stars and L stars? R flags is easy. Fuck, I need to know where my syscall entry points are. And then I have to enable syscalls, so we'll enable syscalls in, um... So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go, uh, syscall... Syscall enable is... that's in the EFER. The guest EFER. And... Long mode active enable, uh... NX enable. And we also want syscall enable, which I think is... Uh, fuck, let's open another one of these. Syscall enable bit zero. Fuck yeah. Okay, so now we'll enable syscalls. So now we can attempt syscalls. But it's going to fail because we're going to get like a null DRAF double fault. Yeah, because we don't set up the... Um, we don't set up the uh, the L star, the sys enter stuff, EIP, ESP. I think that's what I want to use. So let's go look at uh, syscall x86. So we set these. We set CR8. These we need to set. So these are like the only things that we don't set anymore. So these are like the four things we have to find. Um, syscall table uh, windbag. Is it pro possible the processor doesn't support those MSRs? It definitely does. I just don't have the values filled in. I think syscall has been supported on all AMD64 processors. Um... Yeah, let me find where it sets L star. Wow. Wow. That is not a unique string. Holy shit. Um. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. MSR L star. I'm trying to see if there's any references to this. Um. Not really. Not really, honestly. When it goes to sleep, it sets those. And that's saving it. Um, okay, well, I found the MSR name. So now I'll find where it gets set. What the fuck? That's only used in one spot. Um, <laughs> thanks for your streaming. Your energy is electrifying and during this pandemic, very much something I need. Thank you so much. I'm assuming you're heading off, so have fun wherever you're going. Get some good sleep. See you around. Love seeing you back here. Thank you so much, and I see your tweets and appreciate them. Cheers. Um, L Star, fuck my booty. Um, I gotta figure out. Good night, get some good sleeps. Thank you so much. 
Okay, uh, I think I found the L star. Not where it's stored, but I found where it's the name of what it uses to access it. Um. Okay. Where does it store the? Ah, I found where it sets. I found. I found where it sets it. I think. Cannot read MSRs with KD. Not when it's uh, a snapshot. When it's a, a mini dump. This is L star. This is where L star points. And this is where C star points. <laughs> so make notes of these things. Um, this is, uh, yeah, I definitely got a document where I found all these fucking things at. But um, uh, C star is this, L star is this. And these are public symbols, so, like, I'll be able to get these easily. Ooh, unless they're shadowing. I see. It's possible that it might be C star is equal to this, or L star is equal to this. Okay. And then the mask. The mask is. Um, so this is. So this is uh, this. And this is this. I'm just trying to make sure I get all these perfect because I can't fuck this up. This is called mask is equal to, which is this, and that is set to, um, this is set to this or, which is if. That's masking interrupt flag. This is masking the direction flag. This is masking the trap flag. And this is masking the nested fla task flag. But that is what Windows will be setting for all of those. What else do I need? Um, this is called XCD6. Instruction. I'm not running this live. This is an old snapshot. Um, okay, uh, syscall. Let's see. What do we do here? So we load zip from L star. Uh, right now, it's not sure it's canon. R flags, and that shit gets saved. F mask. The flag mask, which is this. 84. Um, I think that's it. F mask. Oh, loads the CS and SS selectors with the values derived from those bits of the star. So, what all do we have here? Um, do we control these? Um, I thought I had these. Oh, sysenter. What is this? These are these are only for sys enters, so I don't care about these, right? Correct. Um 
And I'm gonna note that this is the IRQL. <laughs> if not set, we might be a SOD in user land. Just a note of what happens if we do that. Um, however, the CS and SS are not loaded from that referenced by these selectors. Instead, the descriptor caches are loaded with fixed values. Okay, does anyone actually set this? I'm gonna try and see if this gets set. Ah, yes. It's fixed. It's fixed. Um, and then the star. So what, this is what the star gets unconditionally. Um, this gets a uh, hex ten, shift thirty two. Ord with a hex twenty, ord with three, so twenty three, shift forty eight. That's what it like. These are these are not magic numbers from my snapshot. These are like hard coded things that will always be the case. So then I need to figure out if shadowing is being used. Yes, it is being used. So this is, if this is not equal to zero, then this. Else, one, two, one, two. Okay, so that's what we have to set up here. Worker.vm.guestregs.c star is equal to um, this address the L star is equal to this. Dude, this is dope. I think uh, we're gonna we're actually gonna be able to run from this image, and I, I I didn't think we were necessarily going to be able to. Um, worker .vm .guest regs mask um, sc mask s mask syscall mask. What do they actually call it? F mask. So what they actually call it. C star, L star, and then F mask is this value. Um, Python hex. Don't you said it now? Fuck. So this is just masking off these. So when a syscall happens, it automatically disables the interrupts and does all these things. Four seven. So that's fixed on at least this version of Windows. And I highly doubt, like, these are things that are very unlikely to ever change. Obviously, these addresses are going to change every time. But this is equal to hex 10, shift 32, or hex 23, shift 48. And these are the segments, segment selectors that will be used. Okay, so now we have to add these. Um, reg register state... Pub C star, pub L star, so this is like 32 bit syscall entry, 64 bit syscall rip, right? Uh, pub F mask, this is the, um, uh, this is the R flags syscall mask. Can you do a symbol lookup from the mini dump? You need external info for that, but I can, these are relatively easy to find. I actually might have this in KD debugger data block. So I do have this. I do know where this is. 
And this tells me a lot of information. And this is a fixed structure. This doesn't change. This is meant. This debugger block is given to the debugger, and it's also saved inside of the um, the dump. This tells me like where the kernel is based at. It tells me where a bunch of critical structures are. Um, and I don't know if this actually has an address specifically to those locations. Um, but if anything, it'll get me close enough that I can find a function. I can like heuristically detect it. I've been I've been heuristically detecting stuff like this for a long time. So um, this is, gives me enough information to kind of get a route into where things are in the kernel, and then from there I can kind of scan and and find you know through references and stuff. And actually, this ten, this GDTRO code is actually this ten, and this. Um, this 20 is this right here. That's where the, those two values came from. So, just so you know, I'm not making shit up. <laughs> okay. Then we have the star. And this is the, um, this is like the, uh, uh, syscall i32 star Lose the CS and SS selectors um selectors Okay, so now we have those. They're not being used. So now we need to set those. Um Hey, is kernel programming good to learn, uh, whether for Windows or Linux? Thinking about doing so, moving from C-sharp and Golang. Um, how hard is the transfer between some higher level programming to low level? When I look at low level programming, I'm like, shit, that's going to take quite a few years to learn. I would say it'll take, it'll take a few years to learn, but no one, you know, you're not going to be a rock star out of the gates. And there's, there's no problem with that, right? I didn't know this shit. At many points in my life, I did not know this shit. In fact, quite frankly, I don't even know what I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of like reading manuals and putting shit together. This is like the stack overflow equivalent of using the Intel menu to randomly try stuff. Um, what is the most efficient way to use a Dynamo Rio? I don't know. I've never used it before. <laughs> I can't help you there. Sorry, mate. Um... So I don't know if writing these MSRs is going to cause a crash, but let's see. I32, else, uh, C star, self, self, guest, guest, regs, C star, L star, F mask, star c star l star f mask star okay now we just need to make those um const i32 star and i save all those down oh i don't say what star is well luckily it's easy it is this um, this is the star, this is the L stars at 82, at 83 is the C star, and then the F mask is at 84. Oh, look at that, they put them all right next to each other. So this is the, um, 32 bit, or this is the, uh, Selectors for use during a syscall. This is the um, uh, syscall 32-bit uh, entry point. No, L star is the 64, L for long. Syscall 32-bit entry point. And this is the syscall R flags mask. Oh shit! 
Now, those are probably going to GP when we try and write those. 81, 82, 83, 84. 81, 82, 83, 84. Okay. And then the EFER is handled for us. Those are some of the main ones that we care about. Now, I need to room sir. Reading and writing these MSRs is really expensive, so I should only read and write them. Well, I don't really know if they've changed during VM execution. Um, self guest regs c star is equal to this. L star f mask star c star l star f mask star c star l star f mask. So then we read them out in case they changed, which they which they probably won't, because well I don't know if I'm hooking the MSR reads and writes. C star, L star, F mask, star. This should now. Yes. We added four new registers. OXC zero. Um, I don't know, maybe F zero. We'll try it. This is gonna this is gonna crash, right? But I'm just seeing if we pass the assertion. Nope, it's not F zero, so it's E zero. <laughs> cool. That's gonna that's gonna crash. Holy shit. I'm gonna stop that. Cause that's going. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. Um holy fuck. No way. No way. No fucking way. Um um Uh huh. We're gonna reset it. This should get stuck. I want it to fail, and then I'll bring up the server. That's been built. Okay. We're gonna run the server. Here we go. We are running. Look at the coverage. Look at how much shit we're executing. <sighs> it stopped. EPT violation. Oh. That's sending an, an ippy F0, 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 F0 on the, um, that's going to the APIC. I think it's, I think it's done. I think that project is, uh, the program is long gone. Yeah, we did like syscalls and stuff. Okay, let's do the trace thing again. Holy shit. Holy shit. Coverage. Why 50,000? Hopefully that fits in my clipboard. Log open trace.txt. Lines. Okay. Um, let me see, um, get symbol when debug. I wonder if there's a way to just print symbol, uh, at address when debug. I just want to print ln, list near symbol, rip. Um, okay. I'm just going to reload all symbols. I just want to make sure everything's loaded. Okay. So now, if I do an ln at, let's see, this. <sighs> okay, that's not 100% what I want. Getting source code file at address like this. Open dash A. Um this some function that's not what i want i just want to get like the adjust the message i don't want to i typically do that by disassembling one instruction which is what we're probably going to do log close log open trace yank this whole thing 100,000 that's 
everything. This is going to take a while, I think. Once we get out of Fake App, it will hopefully speed up. Oh, God. I feel like it, like, bursted before. I could write that to a script file. Um... Is that just slow because of how many symbols I have? No. I could symbolize it myself. I think it's just not pasting super fast. Okay, we'll stop that. I don't think that's gonna stop. I think we borked it. Um, okay, vim. I should have vim. Vim commands. Now see how quickly I can paste. Uh, if I yoink all these. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I think the issue is the paste. It's not the actual running of the command. Which is fine. So we'll just kill that. Um, vim commands.txt is this. Scoop commands to here. Test? Eh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we'll put it to test. Okay, it was SSH. And now we'll be able to run these commands quickly. Um, KD Z core to duo. And then how do you load a script file? It's like uh, carrots, dollar sign, some shit. Yup. And I forget which one I gotta use. Run script file. Token, allow files that contain semi-control. Okay. I'm just gonna try this. Yes! So we should be able to probably cancel this script. I don't know. We'll just have to let that churn, and then we'll log open, and then we'll be able to see all the lines. We'll be able to parse this shit out. So I ran the virus sh shared before on the stream in a VM. Okay, what did we get? Oh, you turned off all your protection. Oh, this is dope, man. Okay, you're rebooting. Dude, this is sick. Oh, detected us in a VM and did nothing. Huh. But it wasn't a it wasn't a great Python game? <laughs> it wasn't an amazing Python game? I think he got scammed. <laughs> log open, log.txt. Run the command. Hell yeah. Detected as a rat? Huh. Yeah, maybe it's not ransomware. Maybe it's just uh, remote. Okay, log close, that's everything. Now we can scoop that down. It's not trace, we called it log.txt because I name every file log.txt. All right, 
Here we go. This is it. Percent %s. Remove lines not ending in a colon. All right, go to lines that don't end in a colon and delete them. Come on, Vim. You got this. It's only like 100,000 lines, Vim. Come on. There we go. So these are all the things that we hit during execution. And we eventually, so here's what happened. We're running our fake app. Uh, we page fault because something's not mapped in. The page fault gets handled. That page fault eventually returns execution back to our application. Test app. Fake app. OK. Returns back execution, back to the user. We're running our process. We then get something from GS Base. Uh, here we go, and we uh, we have an exception again. Here we have an, another exception. Okay. Let's see. I wonder if we're hitting free pool. Maybe that's the return. Create information process. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I don't think the syscall would be directly in here, but let's see if this is a syscall. We were hitting syscalls. That's a ret. Oh, I think that's like the finale. That's like the ret all the way from the... This is the end of the application, I think. Chaos system service exit. Oh, we ret and then... Oh, okay. So we're back in NTDLL. Set information process. Create a virtual memory. I'm trying to see if we hit exit. I think we looped, didn't we? Um, I mean, we're definitely able to do syscalls. We were, a we were able to page things in. I think it's safe to say this, this fucking works. Did he copy enough? I did. This, this should be everything. Um... So I'm guessing this is probably, this is the last thing that executes in the fake app. And that's a ret, I don't know what that is. Um, I probably should grab symbols. I love how I have full symbols for everything except the, my own thing I fucking built. But I would suspect that this is probably set last error. I would suspect that this is probably exiting the process. We're doing some shit. Get FLS. Uh, kernel base. Checking for API sets. Is debug port present? Yeah, here it does. Uh, here it does a syscall right here. It goes into ZW query virtual memory. That's going to syscall right here. That's going to be a syscall. And we syscall and we end up in the kernel. And we do that. We're running kernel stuff. Running kernel stuff. We're querying some stuff. And then eventually we come back because we finish it. And then we return back to virtual query. Like, we did a syscall. We did a full fucking syscall. <laughs> I think that's pretty fucking sweet. <laughs> All right, so we need to reset this VM. 
Yeah, like there, that's definitive proof that we're hitting syscalls. Now, we're eventually hitting HPET query counter. I'm guessing we're probably going to sleep. I suspect that my process is exiting and I'm probably context switching into something else. Yeah, I'm in like ready boost. Oh yeah, 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 switch, switch kernel. Switch kernel stack. NTFS, we're doing some NTFS shit. And when did this all start? So maybe we hit something that needed to get page in from disk or we, our process exited. Report fault. Loaded DLL. I mean, we did a syscall. I'm happy with that. That's pretty good for just uh, taking a, a kernel dump and transplanting it. That's pretty fucking sweet. So let's see if we can get... Um, now we want to get this fuzzing, because currently it's not fuzzing. It just panics when it exits, if I'm not mistaken. So let's get this going. We'll reboot it in hardware. And then eventually this gets to the end. We have an unhandled event. So it takes a long time to get started because we're probably paging in a lot of stuff over the network. Then we get an EPT violation and we'll just continue here. Now this is gonna fail. Thank you so much, Napalm, for the biddies. Fuck yeah. So this is going to probably crash in like a catastrophic way because we don't reset memory <laughs> at all. So we're just gonna go back and we're gonna like re-execute garbage. Yeah, yeah, unhandled VM exit code 10 because we just, we fuck the VM. Okay, so now we need to reset that memory. Um, and that's really it. So in snapshot at app, this is where we, we reset the original registers, so that should work. But we don't reset the memory. Um, is this dead? This looks dead. Something's... Something's not rendering here. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what's not rendering there, but there's some window that's just dead. That's vert manager is frozen. Okay. Not a big deal. Okay, so we have... Um, we're exiting there, so I need to restore memory. And to restore memory, I have to go through each dirty page. And... I think we're going to try out um, a technology that Intel added uh, called page modification logging. Um, and page modification logging will allow us to log all the pages that were dirtied. That being said, I think we still have to reset the dirty bits. And if we have to reset the dirty bits, then we're really not getting a huge speed up. In fact, It'd be slower to clear those as dirtied. So access and dirty bits, we can do that if we set that, uh, which we do, right? Yes, with access and dirty bit tracking. So I think we might just have to write that page table walking stuff. So this. When access and dirty flags are enabled, software can track writes to guest physical addresses using page modification logging. Um, processor, the processor adds entries to the log as described below. The page modification log is a four kilobyte region of memory located at the physical address and the PML address in the VM control field. So that means 512 64-bit entries. Before allowing a guest physical ad access, Processor may determine that it needs to set the access or dirty bit in the EPT. When that happens, it examines the PML index. If the PML index is not in this range, then a log full events occurs. Otherwise, um, it proceeds to update the access and dirty flags as described below, setting those bits, and then it will write it to the page modification log. And then the PML index is decremented by one. Because the processor decrements the PML with this, may transition to all Fs. No further logging will occur. Um, 
So if that's setting those bits, I still have to clear them in the table, which is the expensive part. So I guess we're not benefiting from this, so we don't have to use PML. Um, so let's take a look at... Um, uh, fuck. SP shared page table source. And I think I'm going to do the tracked thing that I do here. We'll just say track. Tracks which tables and pages can be written to. Yeah, I think I might get rid of the concept of tracking in the page table because we're not going to track. We're not going to do dirty bit resets on this. So we're going to migrate this into. I've read a bit of the Rust book on the official side of theirs. It refers to Rust programs as stations. I think that's really stupid. What do you think? I think it's goofy and silly. I don't really care too much. Kernel source. Um, I actually think it's a, a, a good goofiness. You need a name for the people, you know? Tracking. Okay, so we're going to transplant basically all the things. New tracking is going to make one of these things. So all EPTs are tracking. We're getting rid of it from this page table stuff because we don't really need it. We'll put this in free. Oh yeah, and tracking is not an option anymore. EPT is always going to be tracked, which means free is never going to work right now. So we'll just delete free. That's okay. We don't need to. We don't need free memory where we're going. Um, I guess I call this, let me set this unimplemented. Unimplemented. Okay, tracking. Then down here, tracking, track. Only allow 4K pages, so on map raw. Um, even though we technically have the logic that allows us to do that, this is at one depth. So here, right here. Then we set the tracking bits. here and we set these tracking things on a traversal outside of the scope and then before we do the final translate here we set tracking and then we have for each dirty page Okay. This doesn't need box anymore. Bootloader builds, good. So it's just shit in here now. All right, box. We got a pull in box. Oops. Use alloc boxed box. All right, so we're going to get VM resets working here in a second. Pretty close, I think. Uh, tracking, 43, virtual address. Is that true? Yes. OK, just a few things left. Just a few things left. Just a couple. 477. If I guess I don't have the concept of presency here. So where do I do? 
It's just all these bits, isn't it? Um. So basically, if it's not both axis and present, we'll just say if it's not accessed. Right? Skip the entry if it's not accessed. Skip the entry if it's not dirty and present on the final level. And this is EPT accessed. This is EPT dirty. And then Dirty and present we'll get rid of as well. 510. Clear the access and dirty bits. Oh, we can do a A D. We just can't do the presence. The the presence has changed in EPT. So we're going to clear access and dirtied. 240. Snapshot app, no page table. EPT 57. This is just the vert address. It's not a sum. One line, one line. Fuck. Um, 397. Uh, TTBL. Let TT. Um, I do want to scope this. Let TTBL is equal to self dot tracking. And I'll just scope that for cleanliness. 427. Let ctbl is equal to self dot tracking. Okay, 433. Tracking is equal to this. Yeah, it's just vert adder. Okay, 455. Um, let TTBL is self tracking. 240. That's in snapshot of app. 47. This is tracking. Okay. So. We're going to say if the PTE and EPT present is zero, continue. Skip non present pages. So if none of the bits are set, then we skip it. If it's not dirty, then we skip it on the last level, and all other levels, we skip it if it's not accessed. And then, if it's accessed or dirty, we'll clear the access and dirty bits. We then get the address of the next page, and we continue our traversal. OK. So now, in snapshot at app 240, this is EPT for each dirty page. Then what we're going to do is that's going to take physical memory. It doesn't need to anymore. So EPT for each dirty page. This doesn't take in a P, just an F. OK. OK, and then. Fizz mem get access to physical memory. So I'm going to translate those, and the address that I'm going to pass is going to be a guest physical.
Yeah. Um, closure arguments are guest physical, host physical. Okay, 543. This is a fizz adder. Beautiful. Tracking. Sign to never use 364. What was that doing before? Shit. It's equal to tracking. I see. Um. TTBL is tracking. Let Vatter is Fizz Adder. Yeah, we'll change that. Thanks for that. Tracking. Tracking. Self tracking. Once, here. We only use it in two spots. Perfect. Much better. Much better. Thank you, Russ, for saving my ass. Free. Yep. Turns out none of these args are really used. Single step. Overwritten. Yes. Yes, it is overwritten. Comment that out. And that's building. Um, so we got to fix this. Guest physical address. And then the page table entry. Then what we're going to do is to reset, we're going to get the page. And get page resolves the physical address into a virtual address. Which is how we can access that memory. Get mutable access to underlying page. Copy the page. Let's fucking go. Servers. Servers running. Oh, fuck. Stuck. Stuck. We oh um oh shit. Um Is it not finding that server? Uh we need this preemption timer to give us an ability to like sometimes be outside the VM. Otherwise I can't do my soft reboot. I think we're stuck inside the VM right now. Okay. We'll see what's happening here. Otherwise, we're getting stuck maybe doing this for each dirty page. Unlikely, possible, but unlikely. Come on. Come on, server. Just boot. I guess that's the only thing we changed. There's a chance that this stuff is just fucked. I'm going to comment it out just to make sure we didn't break something. Oh, yeah, we broke the bootloader. We broke the bootloader because we changed the page table code. Okay. That's fine. This should run. Right? Um, so this is running, this is hitting stuff, 
We're running, we're running, we're running, and then we we crash on that, and then we we double fault. And then we get a fucked VM exit. Okay, so now we can put this in, and we can see. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Please, 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 please. Uh, oh, it's resetting to the original state, which is here, but it's resetting. It's clearly resetting. Um, okay. Why is that master VM not being permanent? Fucking let me copy and paste that. Fuck it. We'll just paste it here and then we'll disassemble this. Oh. Ooh, what are we doing there? What are we doing there? I'm just going to put a sleep between these. We're probably not resetting something correctly. Not a big deal. Um... Which is kind of unlikely, I think, but whatever. Really? All right, we'll just do this. Time, sleep. Sleep for a second. This just decreases the amount of spew, so we can analyze what we get a little bit more. Then I'm getting stuck with double faults. Okay. Um, and then I get stuck doing breakpoints. Um, These should be permanent. These should be permanent. So that's what we should be restoring to. Uh, let ridge regs is none. If ridge regs is none, ridge regs is sum self.vm.guest regs. Because we know the first batch is fine. So we're going to latch the first batch and we're going to assert ridge regs is equal to sum this. So we're going to make sure that our registers match. Uh, worker. We're going to make sure that the original registers are always what we're running. And I guess we don't have a way to compare those. Um, partial EQ, EQ, partial EQ, EQ, fuck yeah, so now we can compare those. Oh, sweet. So that means we might be restoring memory correctly. Um, wow. I was like very not expecting that to work. <laughs> I, uh, okay. Uh, Guest regs is the master's registers on a fork. Okay. Reset. Get access to the master. These are the master registers. What is different about them?
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not restored yet. They're not restored yet. That would make sense. They don't get restored until fuzz case. But I do get the Master VM guest regs, which I do in both cases. I don't think this is the problem. So it's clearly a memory restoration issue. Oh, God. And this is really fucking hard to debug. Get the page from the master. Slice that. The page. Then the adder, get from the master. We copy from the original page into there. CC is the default fill. Yeah, I, I, something's, something's fucked about the restore, I think. It's just causing everything to uh, get thrown off here. Um... With Rust being a memory safer language than C, would you still recommend people to learn and build stuff with C? Not unless you have to. I recognize there are circumstances where you may have to, but I think if you don't have to, if you're on a new project, highly recommend you do not. Okay, first let me make sure that these registers are sane. self.vm.guestregs Okay, so now I can see if these are the same. RIP is B73 B73 and the first case, it's B73. Yeah, we're restoring to the same thing every time. So that should not be the problem. And all the stars and everything looks fine here. So it's definitely a restoration issue. So it could be a lot of different things. It could be these tracking. Okay, tracks the virtual which tables can be written to starts out as zero. Yep, page table's empty. Every time that we map in a new table here, we will, at the tracking table, we'll get the bit and the index, and then we'll set that there's a table at this index. In the TTBL, set one shift bit at index. Then we create a new bit index table. Um, we divide that and we set at that location indices i, i minus one. We set the u size as next. Then we traverse the tracking table, regardless of if we create a new one, new one. So in this case, tracking is equal to next. In this case, we grab next from indices. Okay, that looks good. Then, in the situation that we write in a new entry, we're going to set that bit. Set that there's a, a table at this index. Depth minus one, correct. That's the final level. And then here, tracking. All right, so let's start with the dumb stuff. Are we restoring anything? Print restoring guest physical address this from host physical address this. We'll have address and uh, original page. Uh, host virtual address, and then dot zero on both of these. See what we got. And I guess I don't want that print. It's just gonna cover up. It's gonna make it hard to scroll around. But we are. Okay, here we go.
Okay, so the question is, are we resetting things incorrectly? If we're resetting things incorrectly, then... Yeah, but... And then it stops having anything to restore. Um, do I need to invul EPT? Maybe I need to invalidate those um, TLBs when I clear the dirty bit. Maybe it's maybe the processor is not setting the dirty bit again. In EPT. If an EPTP, EPTP switching VM funk establishes this, that enables the access and dirty flags by setting this, subsequent memory access may fail if those flags, um, if there's been no appropriate execution of that since the last use of an EPTP value, that doesn't enable that. Because bit six, six is clear. Okay. Um, may fail to f set those flags as specified if there's been no execution of that since the last use of an EPTP value that does not enable the access and dirty bits for the EPT. Well, we don't have that condition. Invalidates the guest physical mappings and combined mappings. Invalidations are based on instruction operands called inv and this. If inv ebt is one, the logical processor invalidates all guest physical mappings and combined mappings of that. If it's two, it invalidates guest physical mappings and that. We only do single context. Let's try it. In the TLBs and paging structure caches. EPT derived entries. EPTP. So you give it a pointer to the EPTP. If it's one, the logical processor invalidates all, oh. The inv types are reported by this. There are two types. Um. There are two types currently defined, these two. Invalidates mapping associated with all EPTPs. If an unsupported one, the instruction fails. How does it fail? Library that can resolve addresses to symbols. Yeah, I've used. Uh, I haven't used that specific library, but I do have libraries like that. I will have to try that out. That might be super nice. Um. Yeah, that actually looks super fucking nice. And it's written in Rust.
and validates all mappings for the indicated EPTPs regardless of the VPID and PCID. When did they add this? Operations that invalidate cached mappings. Operations that are... Um, Invalpig and PCID invalidate linear mappings and combined mappings. They're required to do so only for the current VPID. Linear mappings for the current VPID are invalidating, invalidated. An EPT violation invalidates any guess physical mappings that would be used to translate it. If the enable VPID control is zero, VM entries and exits invalidate linear mappings and combined mappings associated with VPID zero for all PCIDs. That's what I think I'm doing. Combined mappings for VPID zero are invalidated for e, uh, EP4TAs. If this is zero, entries and exits invalidate linear mappings and combined mappings associated with VPID zero for all PCIDs. Combined mappings for B VPID zero are invalidating for all EP40As. Okay, so let's make sure we don't have uh, VPID enabled then. I think VPID might be required. Oh, maybe not. It's way up here. Cache translations of linear addresses are associated with a virtual processor. Okay, so I don't think that's it. Fuck. Fuck, 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 fuck. Unless there's some other state that's getting set that's kind of changing the behavior inside the VM. Which is possible. Um, shit, shit, what am I breaking, man? Am I not traversing all the things that are affected? What if I don't skip these? What if I restore everything? Is this gonna crash? Because we're gonna write to... Yeah, I think this will crash because we're not guaranteed that that memory is exclusive. This is just gonna like catastrophically fail, I think. PCO that that. Huh. So that seems to be behaving the same way each time. TM. But I don't think it's what I want.
I'm hitting a double fault here. Yeah, I can't page faults. Oh. Okay, let's put this back in because I think this works. Um, I'm pretty sure the problem is um, I have a lot of registers that, that previously I didn't have to restore, and now I do have to restore it. Um, so previously I only did one time, this like one time initialization. And that's where I set up all my controls and then also all these VMCS things. So these controls I don't have to change. But the EPT pointer... Host selectors, those aren't changing. These guest ones do change. All of these things change. So we'll f whack these into here. Okay, that should fix that problem. So anywhere that I have a VMCS guest is at this point and beyond. Correct. Um... And that means this will be in the exact same state, given that we don't fuck up the memory. All the host stuff is fine. Host, 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 that stuff doesn't change. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Are those VM entries that much slower now? Oh, it. F hmm. Is that just that much slower? Why is that not getting anywhere? Okay, let's print the Vim exits. Oh, I wonder if this starts the if this starts the timer. Maybe I need to set up the timer like right at the end here. Or mm. Oh, I only want to do that on a reset. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Okay, this is back to what it was. So this will work the first go. Yeah, we were like resetting it every time we re-entered. So every, everything that we set when we re-enter it are things that we persist. So those are things that we save and restore every time we enter. Now what I need to do is I just... What do I do if init is false? Can I just set init to false? Is there anything in here like allocating a page table or doing anything permanent that matters too much? Not really. We're just going to get this working and then we'll optimize it. So init colon make that pub temporarily and then on a reset, we'll do uh, self.vm.init is false. Okay, here we go. This is the one. Nice. Come on. Fuck. Um. It's not the same.
Why is that not the same? 60 EC7. I mean, I do think it's, so that's waiting for an ICR. This doesn't have access to the pick. No, it doesn't. There's some state that I'm not restoring. And the VMCS. I want to restore the entire VMCS. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I'm just going to make a copy of the entire VMCS, I think. There, there's some other field in the VMCS that I'm not saving and restoring. Or initializing. That then's getting set to a, a different state. And if I change the VMCS... I don't know if I can do that. Can I can I copy the VMCS? I don't know if I can just rewrite the VMCS. But this is the original VMCS. Origin VMCS. We'll fly down here and then this is option it's just a page um and this is how we make it okay one time initialization when we're done with the one time initialization we will set this is um uh copy and then we'll do self dot Ridge VMCS is some VMCS copy, and we'll do VMCS copy copy from slice self dot VMCS. At that point, everything's set to the same state. I don't know if I can copy this VMCS in and out without invalidating entries or uh, VM pointer loading. So we're like we're working in very undefined behavior right now. Um, But we're gonna see if this fixes the problem because it, it just it just might. Ref D ref. Um. D ref that one. Nice. Okay, then we'll have a reset. PubFN reset, mute self, uh, reset the VMCS to the original VMCS states. If let sum orridge, uh, orridge is equal to self.oridgeVMCS, ref, then self.vmcs.copy from slice ref deref of orridge. Do ref that twice. Okay. Now, if there is something there, and there will be once we do that, so now I can do a self.vm.reset resets the VMCS state. And I think I might have to pointer clear and put that back. I don't think I can just copy over the VMCS like that during random fucking execution. Because I think the processor caches some of those fields. Yeah, I think it does. Um, um, v 
VMCS. Yes. It's active. Do I make it inactive? VM clear. Um, launch. VM clear. Then we'd have to pointer load and launch again. Hmm. I don't know. Um. Can I just Can I just save all the fields? What if I do that? Um store VMCS modify VMCS VMCS Okay, let's see. VMCS. Um Sorry you were. You should write it. Load fails if it doesn't match. Clear and set that. Um, it's implementation specific. To ensure proper behavior, software should maintain the VMCS region and related structures in write back cacheable memory. Future might support something else. Okay. I need to figure out how to migrate this. Um, yeah, it's probably setting it into some different state. Fuck, what would that be? And it might have some access access to host state, but shouldn't be too bad. Is there anything that we should stop it from doing right now? Input output to hardware. Oh, right now I think it can input output to hardware. Unconditional IO exiting. This is in um, proc on uh, proc. Oh, proc on in here. Uh, yeah, we're going to do, we're going to just add some bits in here. Secondary controls. Um, halt exiting. Um, Invil pig's fine. M weight's fine. RDPMC exiting. So um, halt exiting. RDPMC exiting. Um, Uh, CR3 load exiting. Uh, CR3 store exiting. CR8 we're actually okay with. TPR shadow. Um, uh, TPR shadow. Make sure that that is off. Uh, move DR exiting. Uh, unconditional 
IO exiting. Determines whether execution of IO instructions cause VM exits. Technically, the VM has access to hardware right now. <laughs> Not a big deal. Controls whether MSR bit maps. If this is zero, it doesn't mean use M do not. Zero means do not use MSR bitmaps. If MSR bitmaps are not used, all executions of those cause VM exits. So we're going to make sure that this um, use MSR bitmaps is off. All right, so we did 14. What the fuck is 14? 24. 31, 7, halt exiting, 11, RDPMC exiting, 15, CR3 load and store exiting, 23, CR8 we're fine with, we make sure we don't do TPR, NMI window we don't care about, move DR exiting, we want that to happen, unconditional IO exiting, we do not want to use IO bitmaps, um... If IO bitmaps are used, that is ignored. So one shift 25 use IO bitmaps. So we don't want to use that. Monitor trap, that's fine. Use MSR bitmaps off. Monitor exiting, pause exiting, don't care. Secondary controls. Um, loading descriptor tables. That's fine. That doesn't really matter. RDTSC, VPID, write back and validate. Restricted guess, not set. That should, that should get us a lot more. We might be hitting IO. Nope, not hitting IO. Page modification logging. X saves, X restores. Yep. TSC sc scaling. Okay. Fuck. Um, okay, so let's see migration then. Otherwise, is there a way for me to enumerate all these fields? Isn't there a programmatic way of doing this? Misc. Yep. Fixed bits. Okay, VMCS enumeration. Provides information to software to assist enumerating fields in the VMCS. As noted, each field in the VMCS is associated with a 32-bit encoding, which is the structure as follows. Reserved. The field's width. Reserved. Field's type. And then the index. And then zero is the access type, so read or write. Oh, access type. That's something else. VMCS enumerate indicates the software the highest index value using the encoding for any field supported by the processor. Um, highest index used for any VMCS encoding. So I think I want to get that, and then I want to save and restore all these. How fast are VM reads and VM writes? Uh, reset. So the concept of a, a ridge VMCS goes away. I guess I can just re-zero the VMCS. Well, I can't. I can't zero it. Okay. So these are all, this is the VMCS. So 
So there are three different widths. Yup. Reserve to zero. Provides the information to, for enumerating these. So this will give me all of the, the access type. What is the access type? Don't they all end in zero? Nine through one is an index. Okay. Index, and then the encoding. I see. The only ones that will have the low ones set, the access type, I think, is for accessing high. Correct. So these are two type. Yep. So we can dump all of these relatively easily then. I think that's what we want to do then. How many things is that? What's the largest index? At 17. This one goes up to, uh, that's up in the 30s. Uh, uh, 49. Yes, yeah, so that's 49, right? Yeah. So I think I have to save and restore all those. I think that's going to be the only way. Otherwise, I'm going to have to unload the VM pointer. Let's check out those transitions again. Uh, VMCS structures. Okay. VM launch. If I load a different one, what if I load myself? Does that reset? Does that flush it? If we go back to this, when we do a reset, I'm going to do a VM pointer load. Just by force. We're just going to do that. Um, of course, that's unsafe. So we're just going to reset that, and we're going to reload that VM pointer. Let's see what this does. Nope. That's still fucked. But if we execute some of these, maybe I just write zeros to everything? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this original VMCS can go away. I just want to get this working. I don't. Self dot init is false. Is Windows source code the same? Share the same uh, standards and style guide as Windows drivers? Yeah. The Windows source code is pretty uniform in its style. It's pretty nice actually in that regard. User land, it gets really fucking messy, but kernel land, it's actually pretty well organized and consistent. Okay, so then these ones are like close to working, but not exact. So what I'm going to do is on a reset, I'm just going to go for this for ii for index in 0 to... 64. I don't think we saw any index indices over 64, did we? Oh, fuck it. We'll read the MSR, man. Um, it's the correct thing to do.
VMC has enumeration. Uh, we're gonna panic. The result of CPU read MSR of 48A. This is the enumeration MSR. And this just tells me what? Nine to one is the highest index. 46. Hey, that's pretty, pretty much correct. Um, bit zero in that. So 46. If I go real deep into some of these, huh. But that's the index. Does that mean the index is always a power of two? Nine to one contain the highest index value. Do I want to shift that over? Well, let's try and find a counterpoint. I don't know if I'm supposed to shift that. Um, if I divided that down, 46, that would divide by two. That would be um, 23. So if any of these go over 23, that's basically 16. This one's pretty high up there. Um, uh, oh, I don't care about hex. 22. Okay. Preemption timer value. Maybe I do divide it. Oh, non hex, once again. 23. Is that what I saw? Yeah. I think that checks out. That's 25. Oh, we don't have a TSC multiplier. Only on processors that support that. I'm guessing we don't have that. So the way I'm going to interpret this documentation, and it's kind of weird, but I'm going to interpret this, that that bottom bit is not actually used. Um, what the fuck was that? Here we go. So that means that the... Um, Let's max, and do we set anything in the VMCS? No. Max VMC, uh, max index is equal to this, shift one, and OX, bits nine through one. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's one FF. Okay, for index and max index, then we'll go through for each, the access type we don't care about, the fields type, the fields type, F type, type in zero to four, four, with in zero to four. Let's see where I'm going with this. VMCS, VM, uh, this is like the, um, yeah, we'll just call it VMCS. Maybe that's confusing. VM, uh, what do I call it? Yeah, I call it VMCS. Uh, VMCS value, what do they fucking call them? Encoding. We'll just call it encoding. Is equal to the width, shift 13, or the type, shift 10, or the index, shift 1.
VMWrite. Um... And VM right. Okay. This, this. Write that shit directly to encoding, which is a U64. And then we're going to write a value, in this case, a zero. Uh, we'll put a 0 U64, just to guarantee, because I think it's going to default to U32. Okay. So that loads the register with 0, and then this is going to 0 it out. I have no idea how slow this is. This could take f fucking millions of cycles, for all I know. But I just want to see, and we don't get the same results every time. Do we have MSR exits? So it doesn't have access to MSRs. MSRs are exits. IO is exits. So what is it possibly setting in state that is not saved in the VMCS? I mean, this, this data is probably acceptable. Right, it's probably still running. Probably still largely running the right thing. But why is it slightly different? Why is it slightly different? That means that this stuff was not needed. It means that this didn't work. Just comment that shit out. Like, are these things actually doing stuff? And I think they are. I mean, it's always failing. It's always exiting in the same way. But does that mean I maybe just have a blind spot in the way that I restore memory every time? I'm not using v VPID, correct? I make sure I don't use VPID. Oh, I don't. Let me uh, add that. Proc two, off, one shift five, enable VPID. Definitely not hitting that. But I'm curious if we're hitting like real coverage here. It doesn't have access to the APIC, so I don't know. I don't know why it wouldn't do the exact same thing every time. FED. It's like it's using a different APIC base. It's like the APIC base is changing, but that's not possible. And this should forcibly zero everything out. Okay, so let's go to EPT. And let's see if it's one of these things. So we won't skip anything. We'll just... We'll just walk the entire page table. Every single time, we'll walk the whole page table. Nope. So either we're not restoring something, or there's some other state on the system that's affecting execution. And I... I just don't know what that would be. I don't know what that would be. Well, let's just see what we're getting for perf. I'm just curious. Is 
So that's running. Sixty a second. Oh, I mean those fuzz cases. These are massive fuzz cases. Yeah, these are massive fuzz cases. Sixty seconds, honestly, pretty good. EPT. Um. I don't know, that seems relatively slow, actually. I know that the first time that I did EPT, I accidentally had caching disabled. So maybe I fucked that up. Maybe I need to... I think, like, by default, the page table entries maybe had caching disabled. Let me see. Uh, address translation. VPIDs. Maybe I'm getting a lot of EMAG exits. I need to have like uh, stuff tracking that as well. PML for E. Ignore Pat. Must be one. Execute access, shadow stack. Okay, let's look at the. And I'm not single stepping every time, right? FFF. Let's go to. Yeah, I shouldn't be single stepping. Uh, snapshot that. I wonder how many instructions I'm executing. Let's set that preemption timer a bit higher. But I don't think that's really it. So the first fuzz case takes a while. It's a lot of coverage. And then that starts going. Oh, that... That was a pretty decent perf improvement. Um, I think I think the VM's just doing a lot. TLDR, I think the VM is just doing a lot. Um, but I feel like the first time I did this, I fucked up and... Ignore Pat. Subpage permissions. Ignore Pat. EBT and typing. Um, guess physical addresses. Page is zero. This comes from the I32 PAT MSR. Right, and I don't think this has, this doesn't have a way of setting the pat, right? <sighs> oh, we, yeah, we don't want load IA32 pat. We don't want saving and loading that. Bits five through three, zero is uncached. Well, yeah, okay.
Pat determines this. EPT memory type is bits 5 through 3 in the last EPT paging structure entry. 6 is right back. Bits 5 through 3 in the last EPT. Where the fuck is that mentioned in those diagrams? Did I just glance over it? But yeah, I think we're running this fully uncached. <laughs> um... That means every instruction fetch is, is like hundreds of cycles. Let's go, let's go. Uh, EPT. So at the last level. EPT memory type. Oh, it's right there. Five to three. Okay. Um, map. Um, map raw. So we'll do uh, pub const EPT um, right back. Thank you, Desi. Do, 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 do. Is that three, three? Right? We want six, three. This is write back memory. Uh, write back memory type for um, EPT pages. Six, shift, three. Correct. Write back. All right. This will probably get us a, s a small speed up. Turning on, having caches disabled globally is a little bit of a slowdown. <laughs> just a, s a small... So do we use map? We just use map raw, don't we? No, we might do map. Map. Where the fuck that code is? Here. We do map raw. And here we'll do EPT right back. We'll do um, EPT mem type right back. EPT mem type right back. Is that it? Copying the bytes. Is there, are those the only spots? For each dirty page, translate, translate dirty, map raw. And type right back. Okay. Um, okay. So this will be mem type right back. And then when we do a map, a normal map, we will just, by default, internally, this does this. By default, everything's going to be uh, map raw is the only place we can actually do stuff. And here we call it, and we have the entry set right back. Okay. This should be a big speed up. Use crates, EPT, EPT, mem type, right back. You know, I remember doing that before, and I, I remember trying to figure out why my perf was so ass, and this is likely why, so let's reboot this, and we'll see what we get for perf. There we go. That's better. 689, 690 plus cases a second. Um, and yeah, I think this is just doing a lot of stuff. So let's see what our best case scenario is. So we will have it, um, you know what? I will just not set PC to plus one. 
I'll just leave rip as what it is in the snapshot, and then we will see. This will basically, it won't really touch any memory. This will just int three in a loop. 560, okay. So this is like our baseline performance, single core. And then on a quad core, this is our baseline performance. Uh, yeah, so we can reset the VM 3.2 million times a second. So basically anything beyond that is related to the number of things that the, that the process is actually doing, right? So this is our like overhead cost. We, we can't go any faster than this. Um, we probably can if we change some things and change the way that we do initialization and, and don't write as many things in the VM, but this is like probably the, roughly the baseline. Okay, so if we put it back, this is now fuzzing again. I did air quotes and you didn't see it, but I did air quotes. We'll turn the server off, turn that on, and then reset. Now we'll see the coverage. So the first case will take a while, and then eventually the cases start coming in. The coverage is high. And, okay, um, 1,600. Coverage is going up, which means that we're still sampling new things. But yeah, I might want to do a trace of the first run, single step the first run, and then see where they differ. I think that's going to be the easiest trick. Let's do that. Let's try and figure out this non-determinism thing, because I want the VMs to exit in the same way every single case. So, um, this is going to spew. First fuzz case will take a, a while, and then it spews. Yep, there we go. There's the spew. I feel like it is doing something, those subsequent cases. So, how am I going to track this? Um, well, I have a reset call. Oh, oh, I do. Um, and it is false, and then we'll go reinitialize all these things. And yeah, the question is, are we not restoring memory correctly? Are we clobbering something we shouldn't be? Um, fuck. Fuck. How am I going to trace this? Um, I guess we'll do it in snapshot of the app. Single step. Single step is one. So we're always we're going to single step every time we possibly can. Then, in our single step handler, we'll have a... We'll just temporarily put something in the worker. I don't know. I don't, I don't really care right now. Um... Static mute uh, trace is a vec of u64s, vec new. Okay. Um. Unsafe trace push. Self VM guest regs rip. Okay, so that will accumulate a trace. And then what we can do is. Uh, let's make that an option. Yeah. Let me trace is trace uh, is vec new. Okay, so we have that trace. Trace. And then if let sum old trace is equal to trace. Else trace is equal to sum trace. 
Assert old trace is equal to trace. That should fail. 230. None. Got some unsafe, but this is fine for debugging. Use of immutable static. Yep, unsafe. This whole thing is unsafe. It's, it's running single threaded in this test, so it's not a big deal. If this were multi threaded, it'd be fucked. And let's double check. Yeah, I do have threads off. 476. Uh, I guess we want to ref that. Compare. Compare these two things. Okay. Let's see. The traces should not match. Pretty fucking blatantly. Okay, now running again. Perfect. Trace doesn't match. Okay. Uh, four. Four. Old, new. Oops. For old, new. In old trace dot iter. Oops. Dot iter dot zip. Trace dot iter. Asserts old is new. Prints. Old is 016, 018x, new, 018x, old, new. Fuck yeah. Uh, Alright, so this is going to be spewy, but this will then panic on the first one, and then we'll see where they differ. Oh, it's right away. Oh, it's very right away. Okay. Well, I can probably make that happen. So one of them, the old one, goes to KI page fault shadow. The new one goes K page fault shadow 2E. Well, what the fuck? How? Is something getting masked? Is some flag getting masked that is causing me to... Um... I don't like that divergence right away. It's... Clearly going into KF page fault shadow. Which is good. But. Let's try it again. What would cause that? Like, I feel like some mask is changing. But it doesn't have access to MSRs. It doesn't have access to uh, control registers. Um, okay, so there's one option that I can do is I can enumerate all of the VM codes, and then I can see how it differs from the first time, and I could see which VMCS fields get modified by the processor while running, and then that would maybe give me a list of what has changed. So either host things are changing or guest things are changing. I doubt host things are changing because I've pretty heavily restricted the environment this can run in. Now, maybe it's going to an interrupt state that I need to clear, in which state maybe... Interrupts are masked in some weird way. I don't think that's directly jumping there. Um, and then we'll say, uh, let me bat is equal to zero. And then here we'll do, if old is not equal to new, 
bad equals 100. All right, we'll just do bad is not zero, and then we'll do bad minus equals one. If bad is zero, panic. That's gonna give me like, I'll get to see a little bit afterwards. <laughs> this is all that's doing. Just lets me see a little bit afterwards. <laughs> okay, I botched it. Oh, I fucked that up. If bad is not... If old is not equal to new, bad is 100. If bad is zero, panic. Okay. Try this. Am I being stupid? Why wouldn't that logic work? If they differ, set bad to 100. If bad is zero, then panic. Decrement bad and loot. That's my interpretation. But I should just print 100, right? 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 Am I fucking crazy? This should just panic immediately on the first difference. Right? Right? Yes. If bad is one, bad minus equals one. Why does this not work? I reset at each loop? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm doing something stupid, so it could be. Oh, I see, I see, I see. If bad is greater than this number, then bad is one, 100. Ah, nice. Fixed. High quality. High quality code. <laughs> God damn it, really? What? I thought I had it. Am I fucking crazy? If it's... <laughs> what? If it's greater than that, so the first time, then set it. It's true for all traces, yeah. But this should prevent it from being set. Fine, we'll do rust. If bad is none, bad is some 100. If bad is equal to some zero, bad is equal to bad dot map. Bad uh, x minus one. Now we're doing rust. So if they don't match and bad is none, then we set it to sum and then it never gets set back to none. I don't know what's wrong with the old logic. Well, we did rust. Okay, so. Okay. Yep, and that's the next instruction. So the question is, why do I skip over all that? It's doing the same thing. This trace is just delayed. Right? 60. I guess... 
Oh, it kind of makes sense. So the first run, I do more VM exits. That first run, I do more VM exits, which then causes me to potentially relaunch, which will then cause me to set some new state. Okay, so I think that's the issue. Is the second... So in... We basically don't get that single step until we have our first exit. And in the first case, we're having EPT violations all over the place, which is causing us to rearm. Um, I think I just want this to just, just re-enter very quickly. Loop is what I want to do. If VM exit is this, this is like the fast path, right? Uh, if let this is equal to VM exit, continue. And then this is let VM exit is equal to this. Um, in all other situations, we hit this, break VM exit. So now. This is the only thing that may change. The write CRs, the read CRs, the exceptions, preemption timer. Oh, let's turn off the preemption timer. So now the preemption timer is not part of this. I guess there's external interrupts too. Okay, did these differ right away again? No, they didn't differ right away. So they differed this time. Where do they desync? I probably should have an indicator. This is good, this is good. Here, wow, they desync hard. One goes to MM access fault. So these are both the same location. One goes, takes the branch. The other one does the fall through. Okay, okay, now we're on to some shit. Now we got apples to apples. Um, okay, so now that we have those, Oh, the VOD you put on YouTube shorter than the originals? I cut off, like, the starting stream part, but that's it. Um, compare RDI with R12. R12 is constant, so it's not that. RDI... RDI... Where the fuck does that come from? Where's the assignment of RDI? RDI. Um, I'm just gonna look at this line here so I can see what the fuck this is. Um, and then F 
default packet. I feel like that might mean we're not resetting memory correctly. Let's see if that's where they diverge again, if we run it again. But I mean, it's taking a whole different branch. It's safe to say that we are, we are completely off. And there's our panic and divergence happens here. Yep. So the new one takes the branch. CR2. CR2 doesn't get changed. And that will get written on a page fault. CR0, the CRs will get cause faults, right? Let's check what we're hooking on. Um, okay, so those CRs are handled for us. Let's check out what state we have. Um, GPRs. Yeah, we, we save all those. Our flags. We do that. Masks. K registers. Bounds we don't care about. CET. Segment registers. These. We should restore table registers. These we restore control registers. CR0 is stored in the VM. CR1, CR2. CR2 we don't save restore. If I, if I, holy shit, if I get a page fault in my host OS, the CR2 is not saved or stored, so then the CR2 that this checks becomes stale. And then the CR2 from the host is what's used there. The first run is incorrect. The subsequent runs are correct. I think that's what's happening. I think we I think we made progress. Pub CR2. We have to save and restore CR2. I bet this does it. All right, taking bets, taking bets. If this does it, if this does the trick, CR3, CR4, CR5, everything else, TPR is saved. X crow we're not using. Um, we don't even give it access to X crow. Uh, so CR two. Read CR eight. Save the CR two. One on one bet is not the entire story. Fuck. Fuck. <laughs> Write CR two. CR two. And then in master, set the CR2 to zero. That's it for the CRs. <sighs> Thoughts? Thoughts? Will it get past that point? Will this fix this specific bug? I think it will. Uh, E0, that's fine. F0. I should just pad out this structure and call it a fucking day so I don't have to keep doing this. Yeah, um. Yeah, let's just do this. Um. Align FX save to. 512. OK. 
Okay, and this should now say E0. This is no longer E0, this is now at 200. This should pass. It is gonna fail if it get. Okay, sweet. I know how alignment works. Okay, uh, 200. Now we don't have to fuck around with this when we add registers. We just like pad that shit out and we're fine. We're fine, we're at parity forever, I think. That's it, it was CR2, holy shit. That makes sense, because my host CR2 would get set when I have a page fault in my own kernel, which then means the guest would see my kernel's page fault, and then it would get very fucking confused when it has no idea what the hell that value is. But these are at parity. I would say that these are deterministic and operating the same. <laughs> so now we can do the full assert instead of the prince asserts. Um, so here we're just going to say asserts old trace is equal to new, uh, is equal to trace. It's going to be expensive, right, because we're logging this, but we're just going to do this every run. We're going to make sure that we're doing exactly the same thing. I don't know. One of these needs a ref, do ref. Uh, probably this one just needs a ref. Okay. So, now we're just going to compare. We're going to compare that they have the same PCs. Please. 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 Yes. 100% deterministic. 100% deterministic. Holy shit. How did it differ? Um, that happened due to an external interrupt. I can guarantee you that. It happened due to an external interrupt, which then changed things. But these, yeah, it's an external interrupt. 100, 100 fucking percent. 100%. So we're going to move anything that's like random into, into a snapshot of the app. So any of these VM exits that are random, in quotes, 